This is Audible. Audible Inc. presents The Sweetness of Forgetting, written by Kristen Harmel, narrated by Kim McKean. Chapter 1 The street outside the bakery window is silent and still, and in the half hour just before sunrise, as dawn's narrow fingers are just reaching over the horizon, I can almost believe I'm the only person on earth. It's September, a week and a half after Labor Day, which in the little towns up and down Cape Cod means that the tourists have gone home, the Bostonians have boarded up their summer houses for the season, and the streets have taken on the deserted air of a restless dream. The leaves outside had begun to change, and in a few weeks, I know they'll mirror the muted hues of sunset, although most people don't think to look here for fall foliage. The leaf peepers will head to Vermont, to New Hampshire, or to the Berkshires in the western part of our state, where the oaks and maples will paint the world in fiery red and burnt orange. But in the stillness of the off-season on the Cape, the swaying beach grass will turn golden as the days grow shorter. The birds migrating south from Canada will come to rest in great flocks. The marshes will fade into watercolor brush strokes. And I will watch, as I always watch, from the window of the North Star Bakery. I can't remember a time when this place, my family's business, didn't feel more like home to me than the little yellow cottage by the bay that I was raised in, the home I've now had to move back into after the finalization of my divorce. Divorce. The word rings in my ears over and over, making me feel like a failure once again as I try to conduct the balancing act of simultaneously opening the oven door with one foot, juggling two industrial-sized trays of miniature cinnamon pies, and keeping an eye on the front of the bakery. It occurs to me yet again as I slide the pies in, pull out a tray of croissants, and push the door shut with my hip, that trying to have it all means only that your hands are always full. In this case, literally. I'd wanted so much to stay married, for Annie's sake. I didn't want my daughter growing up in a home where she had to feel confused about her parents, like I had when I was a kid. I wanted more for her, but life never works out the way you plan, does it? The front door chimes just as I'm lifting the flaky, buttery croissants from the baking sheet. I glance at the timer on the secondary oven. The vanilla cupcakes need to come out in just under 60 seconds, which will delay me in getting out to the front of the store. Hope? A deep voice calls from up front. You back there? I sigh in relief, a customer I know at least. Not that I don't know almost everyone who remains in town after the tourists have gone home. Be out in a minute, Matt, I shout. I pull on my oven mitts, the bright blue ones with cupcakes embroidered on the edges that Annie bought me for my 35th birthday last year, and pull the vanilla cakes out of the oven. I breathe in deeply, the sugary scent taking me back to my own childhood for a moment. My Mamie, French for Grandma, founded the North Star Bakery 60 years ago, a few years after she moved to Cape Cod with my grandfather. I grew up here, learning to bake at her knee, as she patiently explained how to make dough, why breads rise, and how to turn both traditional and unexpected ingredient combinations into confections that the Boston Globe and the Cape Cod Times rave about every year. I put the cupcakes on the cooling rack, and slide two trays of anise and fennel cookies into the oven in their place. Beneath them, on the bottom rack, I slide in a batch of crescent moons, 
almond paste flavored with orange flower water, sprinkled with cinnamon, enclosed in a pastry shell, and shaped into gently curved slivers. I close the oven door and brush the flour off my hands. Taking a deep breath, I set the digital timer and walk out of the kitchen into the brightly lit front room of the bakery. No matter how overwhelmed I am, it still makes me smile to come through the doors. Annie and I painted the bakery last fall, when business was slow, and she chose Princess Pink with white piping. Sometimes it feels like we're living inside a giant cupcake. Matt Hines is sitting in a chair facing the counter, and when he sees me, he jumps up and smiles. Hey, Hope, he says. I smile back. Matt was my high school boyfriend half a lifetime ago. We broke up before heading off to separate colleges. I came back several years later with a bachelor's degree, the useless half of a law school education, a new husband, and a baby daughter, and Matt and I have been friendly ever since. He's asked me out several times since my divorce, but I've realized, almost with surprise, that we've outgrown each other. He's like a favorite old sweater that no longer fits or flatters. Life changes you, even if you don't realize it while it's happening, and it turns out you can't take back the years that have passed by. Matt doesn't seem to realize that, though. Hey, Matt. I try to sound neutral and friendly. Can I get you a cup of coffee? On the house, since you had to wait. I don't wait for an answer. I'm already pouring. I know exactly how Matt takes it. Two sugars and one cream in a to-go cup, so that he can get to the bank of the Cape, where he's a regional vice president, to get his paperwork started before they open for business. Since he works just two blocks down on Main Street, he stops in once or twice a week. Matt nods and takes the coffee from me with a smile. What else can I get you? I ask, gesturing to the glass bakery case. I've been here since four, and although I'm not quite done with everything, there are already plenty of fresh pastries. I reach for a miniature pie-like confection, which features a phyllo-like shell filled with a lemony almond paste and brushed with rose water and honey. How about an almond rose tart? I ask, holding it out to him. I know they're your favorite. He hesitates for only a second before reaching for it. He takes a bite and closes his eyes. Hope, you were born to do this, he says with his mouth full. And although I know it's a compliment, the words hit me hard, because I never intended to do this at all. It wasn't the life I wanted for myself, and Matt knows it. But my grandmother got sick, my mother died, and I no longer had a choice. I brush the words away and pretend they don't bother me, as Matt says, Hey, listen, I actually came this morning to talk to you about something. Can you sit with me for a sec? His smile looks a little frozen, I realize suddenly. I'm surprised I didn't notice it earlier. Um, I glance back toward the kitchen. The cinnamon pies need to come out soon, but I have a few minutes before the timer goes off. There's no one else here at this early hour. I shrug. Yeah, okay, but just for a minute. I pour myself a cup of coffee, black, my third of the morning, and slide into the chair across from Matt. I lean on the table and brace myself for him to ask me on another date. I'm not sure what to say. Focusing on my husband and daughter for all these years has cost me most of the friendships I once had, and selfishly, I don't want to lose Matt, too. What's up? From the way he pauses before answering, I have the sense that something's wrong. Maybe it's because I've grown accustomed to bad news lately. My mother's cancer, my grandmother's dementia, 
my husband deciding he no longer wanted to be my husband. So I'm surprised when Matt says, "How's Annie?" I look at him closely. My heart suddenly racing as I wonder whether he knows something I don't. Why? What happened? I was just wondering. Matt says quickly, "I'm being nice, making conversation." Oh, I say, relieved that he hasn't come as the bearer of some sort of bad news. I wouldn't have been surprised to hear that my daughter had been caught doing something foolish, like shoplifting, or spray painting her middle school. She's been different since her father and I split up. Edgy, nervous, and angry. More than once, I've guiltily searched her room, thinking I'd find cigarettes or drugs. But so far, the only evidence of the change in my Annie is the massive chip on her shoulder. Sorry, I tell Matt. I keep waiting for something else to go wrong. He averts his eyes. How about dinner tonight? He asks. Me and you. Annie'll be at Rob's again, right? I nod. My ex and I share custody equally. An arrangement I'm not happy about because I think it makes Annie's life less stable. I don't know, Matt. I say. I just think. I search for words that won't hurt. I think maybe it's too soon. You know, the divorce was so recent, and Annie's really struggling. I think it's better if we just. It's just dinner, Hope. Matt interrupts me. I'm not proposing to you. My cheeks are suddenly on fire. Of course not. I mumble. He laughs and reaches for my hands. Relax, Hope. When I hesitate, he smiles slightly and adds, "You have to eat. How about it?" Yeah. Okay. I say. And it's at that moment that the front door of the bakery swings open, and Annie comes in, her backpack slung over her shoulder, her dark sunglasses on, even though the dawn hasn't yet broken. She stops and stares at us for a moment, and I know instantly what she's thinking. I pull my hands away from Matt, but it's too late. Great, she says. She rips her sunglasses off and tosses her long, wavy, dishwater blonde hair over her shoulder, fixing us with a glare that makes her deep gray eyes even stormier than usual. Were you going to like start making out if I didn't get here, Annie? I say, standing up. It's not what it looks like. Whatever, she mutters, her new favorite word. Don't be rude to Matt, I say. Whatever she repeats, rolling her eyes for emphasis this time. I'll be in the back, so you can like go back to doing whatever it is you're doing. I look after her helplessly as she charges through the double doors to the kitchen. I hear her throw her backpack onto the counter, the weight of it rattling the stainless steel bowls I keep stacked there, and I wince. Sorry, I say, turning back to Matt. He's staring in the direction Annie disappeared. She's really something, he says. I force a laugh. Kids. Frankly, I don't know how you put up with it, he says. I smile tightly at him. I'm allowed to feel annoyed with my daughter, but he's not. She's just going through a hard time. I say. I stand up and glance toward the kitchen. The divorce has been tough on her, and you remember seventh grade. It's not exactly the easiest year. Matt stands up too, but the way you let her talk to you. Something in my stomach tightens. Goodbye, Matt. I say through a jaw clenched so tightly it hurts. Before he can reply, I turn away, heading for the kitchen, hoping that he takes the hint to leave. You can't be rude to customers.
I say to Annie as I come through the double doors into the kitchen. Her back is to me, and she's stirring something in a bowl. Batter for red velvet cupcakes, I think. For a moment, I think she's ignoring me, until I realize she has earbuds in. That damned iPod. Hey! I say louder. Still no reply, so I walk up behind her and pull the earbud out of her left ear. She jumps and whirls around, eyes blazing, as if I've slapped her. God, Mom, what's your problem? She demands. I'm taken aback by the anger in her face, and for a moment, I'm frozen, because I can still see the sweet little girl who used to crawl onto my lap and listen to Mamie's fairy tales, the girl who came to me for comfort after every skinned knee, the girl who made me Play-Doh jewelry and insisted I wear it to stop and shop. She's still in there somewhere, but she's hiding behind this icy veneer. When did things change? I want to tell her I love her, and that I wish we didn't have to argue like this, but instead I hear myself coolly say, Didn't I tell you not to wear makeup to school, Annie? She narrows her overly mascaraed eyes at me, and purses her two red lips into a smirk. Dad said it was fine. I mentally curse Rob. He seems to have made it his personal mission to undermine everything I say. Well, I'm telling you it's not, I say firmly. So get in the bathroom and wipe it off. No, Annie says. She puts her hands on her hips defiantly. She glares at me, not yet realizing that she's streaked red velvet batter on her jeans. I'm sure that it'll be my fault, too, when she figures it out. This isn't up for debate, Annie, I say. Do it now, or you're grounded. I hear the coldness in my voice, and it reminds me of my mother. For a minute, I hate myself, but I stare Annie down, unblinking. She looks away first. Whatever! She rips her apron off and throws it on the floor. I shouldn't even be working here, she yells, throwing her hands in the air. It's against child labor laws. I roll my eyes. We've had this discussion 10,000 times. She's not technically working for a paycheck. This is our family business, and I expect her to help out, just like I helped my mom when I was a kid, just like my mom helped my grandmother. I'm not explaining this to you again, Annie, I say tightly. Would you rather mow the lawn and do all the chores around the house? She stalks out, presumably heading for the bathroom on the other side of the double doors. I hate you! She yells back at me as she disappears. The words hit me like a dagger to the heart, even though I remember screaming them at my own mother when I was Annie's age. Yeah, I mutter, picking up the bowl of batter and the wooden spoon she left on the counter. What else is new? By 7.30, when Annie is about to leave to walk the four blocks to Seabreeze Junior High, all of the pastries are out and the shop is full of regulars. In the oven is a fresh batch of our roses strudel, filled with apples, almonds, raisins, candied orange peel, and cinnamon, and the scent is wafting comfortingly through the bakery. Kay Sullivan and Barbara Kuntz, the two eighty-something widows who live across the street, are gazing out the window, deep in conversation, while they sip coffee at the table closest to the door. Gavin Keyes, whom I hired to help me make my mother's house livable again over the summer, is at the table beside them, sipping coffee, eating an eclair, and reading a copy of the Cape Cod Times. Derek Walls, a widowed dad who lives on the beach, is here with his twin four-year-olds, Jay and Mary, each of whom is licking the icing off a vanilla cupcake, even though it's only breakfast time. 
and Emma Thomas, the fifty-something hospice nurse who'd tendered to my mom while she was dying, is standing at the counter, trying to choose a pastry to have with her tea. I'm just about to pack up a to-go blueberry muffin for Emma when Annie strides past me, her coat on and her backpack slung over one shoulder. I reach out and grab her arm before she can get by. Let me see your face, I say. No, she mumbles, looking down. Annie, whatever, she mutters. She looks up, and I see that she's put on a fresh coat of mascara and reapplied the hideous lipstick. She also appears to have added a layer of fuchsia blush that comes nowhere near the apples of her cheeks. Wipe it off, Annie. I say now and leave the makeup here. You can't take it from me, she retorts. I bought it with my own money. I glance around and realize that the shop has fallen silent, except for Jay and Mary chattering in the corner. Gavin's looking at me with concern, and the old ladies near the door are just staring. I feel suddenly embarrassed. I know I already seem like the town failure for letting my marriage to Rob end. Everyone thinks he's perfect, and I was lucky to marry him in the first place. Now I appear to be a failure at parenting too. Annie, I say through gritted teeth, do it now, and this time you are grounded for disobeying me. I'm staying with Dad for the next few days. She shoots back, smirking at me. You can't ground me. Remember, you don't live there anymore. I swallow hard. I won't let her know that her words have hurt me. Fantastic! I say brightly. You're grounded from the moment you step into my house. She curses under her breath, glances around, and seems to realize that everyone's looking at her. Whatever. She mutters as she heads for the bathroom. I exhale and turn back to Emma. I'm sorry, I say. I realize my hands are shaking as I reach for her pastry again. Honey, I raise three girls. She says, "Don't worry, it gets better." She pays and leaves. Then I watch as Mrs. Kuntz and Mrs. Sullivan, who have been coming here since the bakery opened sixty years ago, get up and hobble out the door. Each of them using a cane. Derek and the twins are getting ready to go too, so I come out from behind the counter to pick up their plates. I help button Mary's jacket while Derek zips Jay's. Mary thanks me for the cupcake, and I wave as they leave. Annie emerges from the bathroom a minute later, her face blissfully makeup-free. She slams a mascara tube, a lipstick, and a pot of blush down on one of the tables and glowers at me. There, happy? She asks. Overjoyed, I say dryly. She stands there for a moment. Looking like she wants to say something, I'm stealing myself for some sort of sarcastic insult. So I'm surprised when all she says is, "Who is Leona anyway?" Leona? I search my memory but come up empty. I don't know why. Where'd you hear that name? Mamie, she says. She keeps like calling me that, and it seems to like make her real sad. I'm startled. You've been going to see Mamie. After my mother died two years ago, we've had to move my grandmother into a memory care home. Her dementia had rapidly taken a turn for the worse. Yeah, Annie says. So, I, I just didn't know you were doing that. Someone has to. She spits back. I'm sure the guilt plays across my face because Annie looks triumphant. I'm busy with the bakery, Annie. I say. Yeah, well, I find the time. She says. Maybe if you were spending less time with Matt Hines, you could spend more time with Mamie. 
Nothing is going on with Matt. I'm suddenly acutely conscious of Gavin sitting a few feet away, and I can feel my cheeks turning warm. The last thing I need is the whole town knowing my business, or lack of business, as the case may be. Whatever, Annie says, rolling her eyes. Anyway, at least Mamie loves me. She tells me all the time. She smirks at me, and I know that I'm supposed to say, Honey, I love you too, or Your dad and I love you very much, or something along those lines. Isn't that what a good mother would do? Instead, because I'm a horrible mother, what comes out of my mouth is, Yeah? Well, it sounds to me like she's saying I love you to someone named Leona. Annie's jaw drops and she stares at me for a minute. I want to reach out, pull her into a hug, and say I'm sorry. I didn't mean it. But before I have a chance, she whirls on her heel and strides out of the store. But not before I see the tears glistening at the corners of her eyes. She doesn't look back. My heart aches as I stare in the direction she disappeared. I sink into one of the chairs the twins vacated a few minutes earlier and put my head in my hands. I'm failing at everything, but most of all at connecting with the people I love. I didn't realize Gavin Keyes is standing above me until I feel his hand on my shoulder. I jerk my head, startled, and find myself staring directly at a small hole in the thigh of his faded jeans. For an instant, I have the strangest urge to offer to mend it, but that's ridiculous. I'm no better at using a needle and thread than I am at being a mother or staying married. I shake my head and pull my eyes upward, over his blue plaid flannel shirt to his face, which is marked by a thick shadow of dark stubble across his strong jaw. His thick shock of dark hair looks like it hasn't been combed in days, but instead of making him look unkempt, it makes him look really good in a way that makes me uneasy. His dimples, as he smiles gently at me, remind me just how young he is. Twenty-eight, I think, or maybe twenty-nine. I feel suddenly ancient, although I'm only seven or eight years older. What would it be like to be that young, with no real responsibilities, no preteen daughter who hates you, and no failing business to save? Don't beat yourself up, he says. He pats me on the back and clears his throat. She loves you, Hope. You're a good mom. Yeah, uh, thanks, I say, avoiding his eye. Sure, we'd seen each other nearly every day during the months he was working on my house, and when I returned home from work in the afternoons, I often fixed us lemonade and sat on the porch with him, doing my best to avoid looking at the tanned swell of his biceps. But he doesn't know me. Not really. Certainly not well enough to judge me as a mother. If he knew me that well, he'd know what a failure I am. He pats me awkwardly again. I mean it, he says. Then he too is gone, leaving me all alone in my giant pink cupcake, which suddenly feels very bitter. Chapter 2 I closed the bakery early that day to run a few errands. Although the sun hasn't set yet when I get home at 6.15, it feels dark and depressing inside the cottage I'm trying hard to think of as my own. The silence inside is deafening. Up until last year, when Rob surprised me just before Christmas by announcing he wanted a divorce, I look forward to coming home. I was proud of the life we'd made together in the solid, whitewashed Victorian overlooking Cape Cod Bay, just east of the public beach. I had painted the interior myself, retiled the kitchen and hall, installed hardwood floors upstairs and in the living room, 
and planted a garden dominated by blue hydrangeas and pink salt spray roses that looked crisp and beautiful against the sail white clapboard. And then, just as I was finally done with everything, finally ready to relax in the dream home, Rob sat me down and announced in a soft voice, without meeting my eyes, that he too was done. Done with our marriage, done with me. In the space of three months, while still reeling from my mother's death from breast cancer and the decision to put Mamie in a memory care home, I found myself moving back to my mother's place, which I hadn't been able to sell anyhow. A few months later, exhausted and discouraged, I'd signed all the divorce papers, eager only to have it all over and done with. The truth was, I felt numb, and for the first time, I understood something I'd wondered about my entire life, how my mother had always been able to stay so cold about the men in her life. I'd never known my father. She never even told me his name. As she once crisply explained to me, He left a long time ago, never knew you existed. He made his choice. And when I was growing up, she always had boyfriends whom she would spend all her time with, but she never let them get close. Not really. That way, when they'd ultimately leave her, she would just shrug and say, We're better off without him, Hope. You know that. I always used to think she was heartless, even though I admit now that I looked forward to those brief periods of time between boyfriends when I'd have my mom to myself for a few weeks. Now I wish I'd understood sooner, in time to discuss it with her. I finally get it, Mom. If you don't let them in, if you don't really love them in the first place, they can't hurt you when they leave. But like so many other things in my life, it's too late for that. By the time I shower, washing the flour and sugar out of my hair and off my skin, it's a few minutes before seven. I know I should probably call Annie at Rob's and apologize for the way we left things earlier, but I can't bring myself to do it. Besides, she's probably doing something fun with him, and my call would only ruin it for her. Regardless of how I feel about Rob, I have to admit that he's good with Annie most of the time. He seems to get through to her in a way I haven't been able to in a long time. I hate that watching them laughing conspiratorially with each other sometimes makes me jealous first, happy for Annie second. It's like they're forming a new family portrait, and it no longer includes me. After throwing on a gray cable-knit sweater and slim black jeans, I stare at myself in the mirror as I brush out my shoulder-length dark brown waves, which, blissfully, haven't started to turn gray yet, although they will if Annie keeps up this behavior. I search my own face for Annie's features, but as usual, I come up empty. Oddly, she doesn't look a thing like Rob or me, which led him to ask me once, when she was three, Are you absolutely sure she's mine, Hope? His words had cut me to the core. Of course, I'd whispered, tears in my eyes, and he'd left it at that. Unless you counted her skin, which tanned evenly and beautifully, just like Rob's, there was virtually nothing of her tall, brown-haired, blue-eyed father in her. I examine my features as I put on a coat of nude lipstick and swipe some mascara onto my pale lashes. While Annie's eyes are an uneven gray, just like Mamie's, Mine are an unusual sea green flecked with gold. When I was younger, Mamie used to tell me that her looks, everything but the eyes, had skipped a generation and settled on me. While my mother's dark brown straight hair and brown eyes made her resemble my grandfather, 
I look like a near carbon copy of some of the old photos I've seen of Mamie. Her eyes, I used to think, were always sad in old photos, and now that mine carry in them the weight of living, we look more alike than ever. My sharply bowed lips, like an angel's harp, as Mammy used to say, are just like hers were in her younger days, and somehow I'm fortunate enough to have inherited her milky complexion, although in the last year I've developed an unfamiliar vertical line between my eyebrows that makes me look eternally concerned. Then again, these days I am eternally concerned. The doorbell rings, startling me, and I run my brush through my hair once more. Then, on second thought, I run a hand through it to mess it up again. I don't want to look like I've made an effort tonight. I don't want Matt to think this is going anywhere. A moment later, I open the front door, and when Matt leans in to kiss me, I turn slightly so that his lips land on my right cheek. I can smell the cologne on his neck, musky and dark. He's dressed in crisp khakis, a pale blue button-down with an expensive-looking insignia I don't recognize, and slick brown loafers. I can go change, I say. I feel suddenly dowdy, plain. He looks me up and down and shrugs. You look pretty in that sweater, he says. You're fine as you are. He takes me to Fratinelli's, an upscale Italian place on the marsh. I try to ignore it when the maitre d' gives my outfit a not-so-subtle once-over before leading us to a candlelit table by the window. This is too nice, Matt, I say once we're alone. I glance out the window into the darkness, and as I do, I catch our reflection in the glass. We look like a couple, a nice one, and that thought makes me look quickly away. I know you like this place, Matt says. Remember, it's where we went before senior prom. I laugh and shake my head. I'd forgotten. I've forgotten lots of things, actually. I've tried for a long time to outrun the past, but what does it say about me that nearly twenty years later... I'm sitting in the same dining room with the same guy. Apparently, one's history can only vanish for so long. I shake the thought off and look at Matt. You said you wanted to talk to me about something? He looks down at his menu. Let's order first. We choose our meals in silence. Matt picks the lobster, and I choose the spaghetti bolognese, the least expensive item on the menu. Later, I'll offer to pay for my own dinner, and if Matt refuses, I don't want to cost him a fortune. I don't want to feel obligated to him. After we've ordered, Matt takes a deep breath and looks at me. He's about to speak, but I cut him off before he can embarrass himself. Matt, you know I think the world of you, I begin. Hope. He cuts me off, but I hold up a hand. Let me finish, I blurt out, gaining speed as I go. I know we have so much in common, and of course we have all this history together, which means a lot to me, but what I was trying to tell you this afternoon was that I don't think I'm ready to date anyone right now. I don't think I will be until Annie goes off to college, and that's a really long time from now. Hope. I ignore him, because I need to get the words out. Matt, it's not you, I swear. But for now, if we could just be friends, that would be so much better, I think. I don't know what will happen down the line, but right now, Annie needs me focused on her and... Hope, this isn't about me and you, Matt interrupts. This is about the bakery and your loan. Would you let me talk? I stare at him as the waiter brings us a basket of bread and a little plate of olive oil. Red wine is poured for each of us, an expensive cabernet Matt selected without consulting me, and then the waiter disappears and Matt and I are alone again. What about my bakery? I ask slowly. 
I have some bad news, he says. He avoids my gaze, swirls a piece of bread in the olive oil, and takes a bite. Okay, I prompt. It feels as if all the air is vanishing from the room. You're alone, he says with his mouth full. The bank is calling it in. My heart stops. What? I stare at him. Since when? Matt looks down. Since yesterday. Hope, you've been late on several payments, and with the market as it is, the bank has been forced to call in a number of loans with irregular payment records. I'm afraid yours was one of them. I take a deep breath. This can't be happening. But I've made every payment this year so far. Yeah, I had some rough months a few years ago when the economy collapsed, but we're a tourist town. I know. Who didn't have problems then? A lot of people did, Matt agrees. Unfortunately, you were among them, and with your credit score. I close my eyes for a moment. I don't even want to think about my credit score. It wasn't exactly helped by my divorce, taking over my mother's mortgage payments after her death, or juggling a large revolving balance between several credit cards just to keep the bakery stocked. What can I do to fix this? I finally ask. Not a lot, I'm afraid, Matt says. You can try other lenders, of course, but the market's tough right now. I can guarantee that you won't get anywhere with another bank. And with your payment history and the fact that a Bingham's just opened down the street. Bingham's, I mutter. Of course. They've been the bane of my existence for the past year. A small New England donut chain based in Rhode Island, they've been steadily expanding across the region in an attempt to go head-to-head -head with Dunkin' Donuts. They opened their 16th regional location a half mile from my bakery nine months ago, just when I was climbing out of the financial hole I'd found myself in after the recession. It was a storm I could have weathered if not for the financial impact of the divorce. But now I'm hanging on for dear life, and Matt knows it. All my loans are with his bank. Listen, there's one option I can think of for you. Matt says. He takes a sip of his wine and leans forward. There are a few investors I work with in New York. They're always looking for small businesses to help out. I can call in a favor. Okay, I say slowly. I'm not sure I like the idea of having strangers invest in what has always been a family business. Nor do I like the thought of Matt calling in favors on my behalf. But I'm also aware that the alternative may be losing the bakery altogether. How would that work exactly? They'd basically buy you out, he says. So they'd assume the loan with the bank. You'd get a cash payout, enough to pay off some of the bills you're facing right now, and you'd stay on to manage the bakery and run the day-to-day -day operations, if they go for it. I stare at him. You're telling me that my only option is to entirely sell my family's bakery to some stranger? Matt shrugs. I know it's not ideal, but it would solve your financial problems in the short term, and with some luck, I could persuade them to let you stay on as the bakery's manager. But it's my family's bakery, I say in a small voice, aware that I'm repeating myself. Matt looks away. Hope, I don't know what else to tell you. This is pretty much your last option unless you have half a million dollars lying around. And with the debt you're in, it's not like you can just pick up and start over in another location. I can't formulate words. After a moment, Matt jumps back in and adds, Look, these are good people. I've known them for a while. They'll do right by you. At least you won't wind up closed. I feel like Matt has just dropped a grenade in my lap, pulled the pin, and then offered to clean up the carnage, all with a smile on his face. 
I need to think about this, I say dully. Hope, Matt says. He pushes his wine glass aside and reaches across the table. He folds his hands around my much smaller ones in a gesture I know is supposed to tell me I'm safe. We'll figure it out, okay? I'll help you. I don't need your help, I mumble. He looks wounded and I feel terrible, so I don't pull my hands away. I know he's just trying to be a nice guy. The thing is, it feels like charity, and I don't need charity. I may sink or I may swim, but I'd at least like to do it on my own. Before either of us can say anything, I hear my phone ringing from inside my purse. Embarrassed, I pull my hands away and grab for it. I hadn't meant to leave the ringer on. I can see the maitre d' glaring at me from across the restaurant as I answer. Mom? It's Annie, and she sounds upset. What's wrong, sweetie? I ask, already half standing up, ready to go to her rescue wherever she is. Where are you? I'm out at dinner, Annie, I say. I avoid mentioning Matt, lest she think it's a date. Where are you? Aren't you at your dad's? Dad had to go meet a client, she mumbles. So he dropped me back at your house, and the dishwasher is, like, totally broken. I close my eyes. I'd filled it with detergent and turned it on a half hour before Matt got there, assuming that the cycle would be nearly over by the time I left. What happened? I didn't do it, Annie says quickly. But there's, like, water all over the floor. I mean, like, lots of inches, like a flood or something. My heart drops. A pipe must have burst. I can't even imagine how much it will cost to fix or how much damage has been done to my old hardwood floors. Okay, I say in an even tone. Thanks for letting me know, honey. I'll be right home. But how can I stop the water? She asks. It's like still totally flowing. The whole house is going to be flooded. I realize I have no idea how to shut off the water to the kitchen. Let me try to figure it out, okay? I'll call you back. I'm on my way home. Whatever, Annie says, and she hangs up on me. I tell Matt what happened, and he sighs and summons the waiter to ask for our meals to be boxed up. I'm sorry, I say as we hurry outside to the car five minutes later. My life is just one disaster after another lately. Matt just shakes his head. Things happen, he says tightly. It's not until we're driving back toward my house that he speaks again. You can't put this business thing off, Hope, he says, or it's all going to go away, everything your family's worked for. I don't reply, both because I know he's right and because I can't deal with it right now. Instead, I ask him whether he knows how to turn off the water supply to the kitchen, but he says he doesn't, so we ride in silence the remainder of the way home. Whose Jeep is that? Matt asks as he pulls up in front of my house. There's no room for me to park in your driveway. Gavin's, I say softly. His familiar dusty blue Wrangler is parked beside my old Corolla. My heart sinks. Gavin Keys? Matt says. The handyman? What's he doing here? Annie must have called him, I say through gritted teeth. My daughter doesn't know that I still haven't paid Gavin in full for the work he did around my house over the summer. Not even close. She doesn't know that one July afternoon on the porch with him, after getting a statement from the bank, I'd broken down in embarrassing tears, and that a month later, when he'd finished his repairs around my house, he insisted on letting me pay him in free pastries and coffee from the bakery for the time being. Annie doesn't know that he's the only person in town, other than Matt, who knows what a mess my life is 
or that because of that, he's the last person in the world I want to see right now. I walk inside with Matt a few steps behind, carrying my meal from Frantinelli's. In the kitchen, I find Annie with a stack of towels and Gavin bent over with his head under my sink. I blink when I realize my eyes have gone directly to the thigh of his jeans to see whether the hole I noticed this morning is still there. It is, of course. Gavin, I say, and he starts, pushes back from the sink, and stands up. His eyes dart back and forth between Matt and me, and he scratches his head as Matt moves past him to put my food in the refrigerator. Hey, Gavin says. He glances at Matt again and then back at me. I came right over when Annie called. I got your water turned off for now. Looks like the pipe that burst is in the wall behind the dishwasher. I'll come over and fix it for you the day after tomorrow, if you don't mind waiting. You don't have to do that, I say softly. I make eye contact with him, hoping that he knows what I'm trying to say, that I still can't pay him. But he just smiles and goes on as if he hasn't heard me. Tomorrow's packed, but the next day I'm wide open, he says. I just have a small job over at the Foley place in the morning— Besides, this shouldn't take too long to fix. It's just a pipe repair, and you should be good as new. His eyes dart to Matt again and then back to me. Listen, I've got a wet vac in the Jeep. Let me go grab it, and I'll help you get some of this water up. We can see if it did any damage once the floors are dry. I glance at Annie, who's still standing there with a huge pile of towels in her hand. We can clean all this up ourselves, I tell Gavin. You don't have to stay, right? I add, looking to Annie and then to Matt. I guess, Annie says with a shrug. Matt looks away. Actually, Hope, I've got an early morning tomorrow. I'm going to have to head home. Gavin snorts and walks outside without saying another word. I ignore him. Oh, I say to Matt, of course, thanks for dinner. By the time I walk Matt to the door, Gavin's re-entering with his wet back. I said you don't have to do that, I mumble. I know what you said, Gavin says, without slowing down to look at me. A moment later, as I watch Matt's shiny Lexus pull away from the curb, I hear Gavin's vacuum turn on in the kitchen. I close my eyes for a minute, and then I turn and begin walking back toward the one mess in my life that can actually be fixed. The next evening, Annie's at Rob's house again, and as I mop up the remainder of the mess in the kitchen after work, I find myself thinking of Mamie, who always used to know how to fix disasters. It's been two weeks since I last visited her, I realize. I should be a better granddaughter, I think, with a swell of guilt. I should be a better person. Yet one more area in which I seem to be eternally falling short. With a lump in my throat, I finish mopping, put some lipstick on in the hall mirror, and grab my keys. Annie's right. I need to go see my grandmother. Visiting Mamie always makes me want to cry, because although the home she's in is cheerful and friendly, it's terrible to see her slipping away. It's like standing on the deck of a boat, watching the waves suck someone under, and knowing that there's no life preserver to throw in. Fifteen minutes later, I'm walking through the doors of Mamie's assisted living facility, a huge home that's painted buttercream yellow and filled with pictures of flowers and woodland creatures. The top floor is the memory care unit, where visitors are required to enter a passcode on a digital pad at the door. I walk down the hallway toward Mamie's room, which sits at the far end of the west wing. The residents' rooms are all private and apartment-style, although they eat all their meals in the dining room 
and staff members all have master keys so that they can check on residents and give them their daily medications. Mamie's on an antidepressant, two heart medications, and an experimental drug for Alzheimer's that doesn't seem to be helping. I meet with the staff doctor once a month to get a status report. He said at our last meeting that her mental faculties have been going sharply downhill in the last few months. The worst part is, he'd said, looking over his glasses at me, she's lucid enough to know it. This is one of the hardest stages to watch. She knows her memory will be all but gone soon, which is very unsettling and sad for patients in this state. I swallow back a lump as I ring the doorbell beside her name, Rose McKenna. I can hear her shuffling around inside, probably getting up from her recliner with some effort, moving toward the door with the cane she'd been using since she fell and broke her hip two years ago. The door opens, and I resist the urge to throw myself into her arms for a hug, the way I used to when I was a little girl. Up until this moment, I thought I'd come here for her, but now I realize it's for me. I need this. I need to see someone who loves me, even if it's an imperfect love. Hello, Mamie says, smiling at me. Her hair looks whiter than the last time I saw her, the lines in her face deeper. But as always, she's wearing her burgundy lipstick, and her eyes are rimmed in coal and mascara. What a surprise, dear. Her words are tinged with the hint of a French accent that's all but disappeared. She's been in the United States since the early 1940s, but the traces of her long-ago past still shroud her words, like one of the feather-light French scarves she almost always has wrapped around her neck. I reach forward to hug her. When I was younger, she was solid and strong. Now, as she leans into the embrace, I can feel the bones of her spine, the sharpness of her shoulders. Hi, Mamie, I say softly, blinking back tears as I pull away. She stares at me through gray eyes that are clouded over. You will have to forgive me, she says. I get a little forgetful sometimes. Which one are you, dear? I know I should remember. I swallow hard. I'm Hope, Mamie, your granddaughter. Of course. She smiles at me, but her gray eyes are foggy. I knew that. I just need a reminder sometimes. Please, come in. I follow her inside her dimly lit apartment, where she leads me to the living room window. I was just watching the sunset, my dear, she says. In a moment, we'll be able to see the evening star. Chapter 3 North Star Vanilla Cupcakes Cupcakes Ingredients 1 cup unsalted butter, room temperature 1 and 1 half cups granulated sugar 4 large eggs 1 teaspoon pure vanilla extract 3 cups flour 3 teaspoons baking powder half teaspoon salt, half cup of milk. Directions. 1. Preheat oven to 350 degrees. Line 24 muffin cups with paper liners. 2. In a large bowl, cream together butter and sugar using electric mixer. Beat until light and fluffy, then beat in eggs one at a time. Beat in vanilla extract and mix well. 3. Sift together flour, baking powder, and salt, and add to the butter mixture, about a cup at a time, alternating with milk. 4. Fill muffin cups about halfway. Bake for 15 to 20 minutes, or just until a knife inserted through the top of a cupcake comes out clean. 
Cool for 10 minutes in a pan, then move to wire rack to cool completely. 5. Wait until they've cooled completely, then frost with pink icing. Pink icing. Ingredients. 1 cup unsalted butter, slightly softened. 4 cups confectioner sugar. Half teaspoon vanilla extract. 1 teaspoon milk. 1 to 3 drops red food coloring. Directions. 1. Beat the butter in a medium bowl with an electric mixer until light and fluffy. 2. Gradually add the sugar and beat until well blended. 3. Add the vanilla and milk and continue to beat until well blended. 4. Add one drop of red food coloring and beat well to incorporate. If you'd like the icing to be a deeper pink, add one or two drops more and beat after each drop to incorporate. Spread on cupcakes as directed previously. Rose Rose gazed out the window, searching, as she always did, for the first star on the horizon. She knew it would appear, as twinkling and brilliant as an eternal flame, just after the setting sun painted the sky in ribbons of fire and light. When she was a girl, they'd called this twilight, l'heure bleue, the blue hour, the time when the earth was neither completely light nor completely dark. Rose had always found comfort in this middle ground. The evening star, which appeared each night during the deep velvet twilight, had always been her favorite, although it wasn't a star at all. It was the planet Venus, the planet named after the goddess of love. She had learned that long ago, but it hadn't changed anything, not really, here on Earth. It was hard to tell what was a star and what wasn't. For years, she had counted all the stars she could see in the night sky. She was always searching for something, but she hadn't found it yet. She didn't deserve to, she knew, and that made her sad. A lot of things made her sad these days. But sometimes, from one day to the next, she couldn't remember what she was crying for. Alzheimer's. She knew she had it. She heard the whispers in the halls. She had watched her neighbors in the home come and go, their memories slipping further with each passing day. She knew that the same thing was happening to her, and it scared her for reasons no one would understand. She dare not speak them aloud. It was too late. Rose knew that the girl with the glistening brown hair, the familiar features, and the beautifully sad eyes had just told her who she was, but she had already forgotten. A familiar panic rose in her throat. She wished she could grab the memories like lifelines and hold on before she went under but she found them slippery, impossible to grasp. So she cleared her throat, forced a smile, and hazarded her best guess. Josephine, dear, look at the star on the horizon, she said. She pointed to the empty space where she knew the evening star would make its appearance, any second now. She hoped she had guessed right. She hadn't seen Josephine in a long time. Or maybe she had. It was impossible to know. The girl with the sad eyes cleared her throat. No, Mamie, I'm Hope, she said. Josephine isn't here. Yes, of course, I know that, Rose said quickly. I must have misspoken. She couldn't let them know, any of them, that she was losing her memory. It was shameful, wasn't it? It was as if she didn't care enough to hold on, and that embarrassed her, because nothing could be further from the truth. Perhaps if she pretended a little longer, the clouds would go away, and her memories would return from wherever they'd been hiding. "'It's okay, Mamie,' said the girl, 
who looked far too old to be Hope, her only granddaughter, who couldn't be more than thirteen or fourteen. Yet Rose could see the lines of worry etched around this girl's eyes, far too many lines for a girl that age. She wondered what was weighing on her. Maybe Hope's mother would know what was wrong. Maybe then Rose would be able to help her. She wanted to help Hope. She just didn't know how. Where is your mother? Rose asked Hope politely. Is she coming, dear? Rose had so many things she wanted to say to Josephine, so many apologies to make, and she feared time was running out. Where would she begin? Would she apologize first for her many failures, for her coldness, for teaching her all the wrong lessons without meaning to? Rose knew she'd had many opportunities to say she was sorry in the past, but the words always caught in her throat. Perhaps it was time to force herself to say them, to make Josephine hear her before it was too late. Mamie. Hope asked tentatively. Rose smiled at her gently. She knew Hope would grow up one day to be a strong, kind person. Josephine was that type of woman too, but her character was cloaked in so many layers of defenses, spawned by Rose's mistakes, that it was hard to tell. Yes, dear. Rose asked, for Hope had stopped speaking. Rose suddenly had an inkling of a feeling that she knew exactly what Hope was about to say. She wished she could stop her before the words did their damage, but it was too late. It was always too late. My mom, Josephine, died. Hope said gently, two years ago, Mamie. Don't you remember? My daughter, Rose asked. Sadness crashing over her like a wave. My Josephine. The truth came rolling in with the tide, and for a moment Rose couldn't catch her breath. She wondered at the tricks of the mind that washed away the unhappy memories, carrying them out to sea. But some memories Rose knew couldn't be erased. Even when one has spent a lifetime trying to pretend they are not there, I'm sorry, Mamie. Hope said, "Did you forget?" No, no, Rose said quickly. Of course not. Hope looked away, and Rose stared at her. The girl reminded her for an instant of something or someone. But before she could grasp the thought, it fluttered away, just out of reach, like a butterfly. How could I forget such a thing? Rose added softly. They sat in silence for a while, staring out the window. The evening star was out now, and soon after, Rose could see the stars of the Big Dipper, which her father had once told her was the saucepan of God. As her father had once taught her to do, Rose followed the line of the star called Merak to the star called Duba, and followed Polaris, the North Star, who was just beginning to open his sleepy eye for her in the endless sky. She knew the names of so many stars, and the one she didn't, she had named herself after people she had lost long ago. How strange she thought that she couldn't hold on to the simplest of facts, but the celestial names were written on her memory forever. She'd studied them secretly over so many years, hoping that one day they might provide a pathway home. But she was still here on Earth, wasn't she? And the stars were just as far away as ever. Mamie. Hope asked after a while, breaking the silence. Rose turned to her and smiled at the word. She remembered her own Mamie fondly, a woman who had always seemed so glamorous to her, a woman whose trademarks were red lipstick, high cheekbones, and a smart dark bob that had gone out of style in the nineteen twenties. 
But then she remembered what had happened to her own Mamie, and the smile faded. She blinked a few times and returned to the present. Yes, dear? Rose asked. Who is Leona? The words stole Rose's breath for a moment, for it was a name she hadn't spoken in nearly seventy years. Why would she? She did not believe in resurrecting ghosts. No one, Rose finally replied, but that was, of course, a lie. Leona was someone. They all were. By denying them once again, she knew she was weaving the tapestry of deceit a little tighter. She wondered whether one day it would be tight enough to suffocate her. But Annie says you've been calling her Leona, Hope persisted. No, she is wrong, Rose told her instantly. There is no Leona. But how is Annie? Rose asked, changing the subject. Annie, she could remember clearly. Annie was the third generation of American in her family. First Josephine, then Hope. Now the little one, Annie, the dawn to Rose's twilight. Rose was proud of very few things in her life, but this, this she was proud of. She's fine, Hope replied, but Rose noticed that the line of Hope's mouth was set a bit unnaturally. She's been spending a lot of time with her dad lately. They spent the whole summer going to Cape League games. Rose searched her memory. What sort of league? Baseball, summer league, like the games Grandpa used to take me to when I was a kid. Well, that sounds nice, dear, Rose said. Do you go with them? No, Mamie, Hope said gently. Annie's father and I are divorced. Of course, Rose murmured. She studied Hope's face when the girl looked down, and she could see in her features the same kind of sadness she saw every time she looked at herself in the mirror. What was she so sad about? Do you still love him? She ventured. Hope looked up sharply, and Rose felt terrible when she realized that it probably was the wrong thing to have asked. She forgot, sometimes, what was polite and what was not. No, Hope murmured finally. She didn't meet Rose's eye as she added, I don't think I ever did. That's a terrible thing to say, isn't it? I think there's something wrong with me. Rose felt a lump in her throat. So then the burden had been passed to Hope, too. She knew that now. Her own closed heart had repercussions that she had never imagined. She was responsible for all of it. But how could she tell Hope that love did exist, that it had the power to change everything? She couldn't. So instead, she cleared her throat and tried to focus on the present. There is nothing wrong with you, dear, she told her granddaughter. Hope glanced at her grandmother and looked away. But what if there is? she asked softly. You must not blame yourself, Rose said. Some things are simply not meant to be. Something lurked at the edges of her memory again. She couldn't remember the name of Hope's husband, but she knew she never liked him much. Had he been unkind to Hope? Or was it just because he always seemed a little too cold, a little too together? He has been a good father to Annie, has he not? She added, because she felt she needed to say something good. Sure, Hope said tightly. He's a great father buys her anything she wants. But that is not love, Rose said tentatively. Those are just things. Right, well, Hope said. She looked suddenly exhausted. Her hair tumbled in front of her face like a sheet, obscuring her expression. In that moment, Rose was sure she saw tears in her granddaughter's eyes, but when Hope looked up again, 
Her achingly familiar eyes were clear. Have you gone out with other men then? Rose asked after a moment. After the divorce, she thought of her own situation and the way that sometimes you had to move on, even if you'd already given your heart away. Of course not. Hope hung her head and avoided Rose's gaze. I don't want to be like my mother, she mumbled. Annie comes first, not random guys. And then Rose understood. In a flash, she remembered bits and pieces of her granddaughter's childhood. She remembered how Josephine had searched endlessly for love in all the wrong places, with all the wrong men, when love was right there in Hope's eyes all along. She remembered countless nights when Josephine left her daughter with Rose so that she could go out. Hope, who was just a little girl then, would cry herself to sleep while Rose held her tight. Rose remembered the tear stains in her blouses, and the way they always made her feel empty and alone long after Hope had fallen asleep. You are not your mother, my dear. Rose said gently. Her heart ached for this. All of this was her own fault. Who could have known that her decisions would reverberate for generations? Hope cleared her throat, looked away, and changed the subject. So you're sure you don't know a Leona? She asked. Rose blinked a few times as the name pierced another hole in her heart. She pressed her lips together and shook her head. Maybe the lie wasn't as wrong if it wasn't uttered aloud. Weird, Hope murmured. Annie was so sure you'd called her that. How unusual. Rose wished she could give the girl the answer she sought, but she wasn't ready, for to speak the truth would be to open a floodgate. She could feel the water surging up behind the dam, and she knew it would spill over soon. For now, the rivers, the tides, the floodwaters were still hers, and she sailed them alone. Hope looked for a moment like she wanted to say something else, but instead, she stood and hugged Rose tightly, promising to return soon. She left without looking back. Rose watched her go, noting that darkness hadn't entirely fallen yet. Hope hadn't even stayed for the entire air bleu. This made Rose sad, although she didn't blame the girl. Rose knew that this, like so many other things, was her own fault. Sometime later, after all the stars were out, Rose's favorite nurse, a woman whose skin shone like the pan of chocolat Rose used to bring home for her brother David and her sister Danielle so long ago, came to make sure she'd taken her evening doses of medicine. Hi, Rose, she said, smiling into her eyes as she poured a small glass of water and opened Rose's pillbox. Did you have a visitor tonight? Rose puzzled this over, trying hard to remember. There was a flash of something glinting in the background of her memory, but then it was gone. She was certain that she'd watch the sunset alone, as she did every night. No, dear, Rose told her. Are you sure, Rose? The nurse prodded. She handed Rose her pills in a Dixie cup and watched as Rose swallowed and washed them down. Amy at the desk downstairs said your granddaughter was here. Hope. Rose smiled, for she loved Hope, who must be thirteen or fourteen by now. How quickly time flies, she thought. Before I know it, she will be all grown up. No. She told the nurse, "There was no one here, but you must meet her one day. She is a very nice girl. Maybe she will come visit with her mother." The nurse squeezed Rose's arm gently and smiled. "All right, Rose," 
she said. All right. Chapter 4 I never intended to come back here, to the bakery, to the Cape, to any of this. At 36, I wasn't supposed to be the mother of a teenager, the owner of a bakery. When I was in school, I dreamed of moving somewhere far away, traveling the world, becoming a successful attorney. Then I met Rob, who was in his last year of law school, just as I had started my J.D. If I thought the magnetic pull of the cape was strong, it didn't compare to being pulled into his orbit. When something went wrong with my birth control midway through my first year of law school, and I had to tell him I was pregnant, he proposed the next week. It was, he said, the right thing to do. We decided together that I'd take a year off to have the baby before returning to school. Annie was born that August. Rob got a job with a firm in Boston and suggested I stay home with our daughter for a while longer now that he was making more money. At first, it seemed like a good idea. But after the first year, the gulf between us had opened so wide that I no longer knew how to cross it. My days, filled with diapers, breastfeeding, and Sesame Street, held little interest for him, and I was admittedly jealous of him going out into the world each day and doing all the things I'd once dreamed of. Not that I regretted having Annie. I'd never felt that way for a second. I just regretted that I'd never had a chance to live the life I'd thought I was supposed to. When my mother was diagnosed with breast cancer for the first time, nine years ago, Rob agreed, after many nights of arguments, to relocate to the Cape, where he'd realized he could set up shop and be one of the only personal injury lawyers in the area. Mamie watched Annie at the bakery during the day, while I worked as Rob's legal assistant, which wasn't exactly what I dreamed of, but it was close enough. By the time Annie was in first grade, she was frosting cupcakes and fluting pie crusts like a pro. For a few years, the whole arrangement was almost perfect. Then my mother's cancer returned. Mamie's memory began to ebb at the edges, and there was no one to save the bakery but me. Before I knew what had happened, I had become the keeper of a dream that wasn't mine. And in the meantime, I lost my hold on everything I'd ever dreamed of. It's nearly five in the morning, and dawn is still two hours away. When I was in grade school, Mamie used to tell me that each new morning was like unwrapping a gift from God. This used to confuse me, because she wasn't a big churchgoer. But in the evenings, when my mother and I would visit for dinner— We'd sometimes find her on her knees at the back window, praying softly as the light fell from the sky. I prefer to have my own relationship with God, she told me once when I'd asked her why she prayed at home instead of at Our Lady of the Cape. This morning, the smells of flour, yeast, butter, chocolate, and vanilla danced through the kitchen, and I breathe in deeply relaxing into the familiarity of it all. From the time I was a little girl, these scents have always reminded me of my grandmother, for even when the bakery was closed, even after she'd showered and dressed at home, her hair and her skin still carried the perfume of the kitchen. As I roll out pie crusts and add more flour to the industrial mixer, my mind isn't on the tasks at hand. I'm thinking about Mamie's words last night as I methodically go through the motions of the morning preparations. Check the timer for the chocolate chip meringues in oven one. Roll out the dough for the almond rose tarts Matt Hines likes so much. Layer the baklava and slide it into oven two. 
Put the softened cream cheese for the lemon grape cheesecake into my second bowl mixer. Fold the layers of croissant around little squares of dark French chocolate for the pain au chocolat. Braid the long ropes of whole wheat challah, sprinkle it with raisins, and set it aside to rise again. There is nothing wrong with you, dear, Mamie had said. But what does she know? Her memory is all but gone, her senses completely off. Yet there are times when her eyes look as clear as ever, and when I'm sure she's looking directly into my soul. Although I never doubted that she and my grandfather loved each other, theirs always seemed to be a relationship of function more than romance. Had I had that with Rob and thrown it away because I believed there was more out there? Perhaps I'd been a fool. Life isn't a fairy tale. The timer on oven one goes off, and I move the meringues to a baking rack. I turn the oven on and prepare to slide the pain au chocolat in. I've started making a double batch of those in the mornings. They go more quickly now that it's autumn and the air has turned cool. Our fruit tarts and pastries are more popular in the spring and summer months, but the denser, sweeter confections seem to bring people comfort as winter approaches. I started helping Mamie in the bakery, the way Annie helps me now, when I was eight. Every morning, just before the sun came up, Mamie would stop what she was doing and lead me to the side window that looked due east, over the winding ribbon of Main Street. We'd watch the horizon in silence until dawn broke, and then we'd go back to our baking. What are you always looking at, Mamie? I'd asked her one morning. I am looking at the sky, my dear, she'd said. I know, but why? She'd pulled me close, hugging me against her faded pink apron, the one she'd been wearing for as long as I could remember. I was a little scared by how tightly she was holding on. Sherry, I am watching the stars disappear, she said after a minute. Why? I asked. Because even so you cannot see them, they are always there, she said. They are just hiding behind the sun. So? I asked timidly. She released me from the hug and bent down to look me in the eye. Because, my dear, it is good to remember that you do not always have to see something to know that it is there. Mamie's words from almost three decades earlier are still echoing in my head when I hear Annie's voice in the doorway to the kitchen, startling me out of my fog. Why are you crying? she asks. I look up, surprised to realize that she's right. There are tears rolling down my cheeks. I swat them away with the back of my hand, streaking wet, sticky dough across my face in the process, and force a smile. I'm not, I say. You don't have to, like, lie. I sigh. I was just thinking about Mamie. Annie rolls her eyes and makes a face at me. Great, now you decide to show some emotion. She throws her backpack down in the corner, where it lands with a decisive thud. What's that supposed to mean? I ask. You know, she says. She rolls up the sleeves of her pink, long-sleeved shirt and grabs an apron from a hook on the wall, just to the left of the racks where I store the trays. No, I don't know, I tell her. I stop what I'm doing and watch as she gets a carton of eggs and four sticks of butter out of the stainless steel refrigerator and grabs a measuring cup. She moves as fluidly through the kitchen as Mamie once did. Annie doesn't answer until she has creamed the butter in the stand mixer, added four cups of sugar, and cracked the eggs in, one at a time. 
Maybe if you'd been, like, capable of feeling anything when you were married to Dad, you wouldn't be divorced right now, she says finally, over the whir of the mixer. My breath catches in my throat, and I stare at her. What are you talking about? I showed emotion. She turns the mixer off. Whatever, she mutters, only to, like, send me to my room and stuff. When did you ever act like you were happy to be with Dad? I was happy. Whatever, she says. You couldn't even tell Dad you loved him. I blink at her. Did he say that to you? What, like I'm not old enough to figure things out on my own? She asks. But from the way she avoids my gaze, I know I've hit the nail on the head. Annie? It's not appropriate for your father to be saying bad things about me to you, I say. There are a lot of things about our relationship that you don't understand. Like what? It's a challenge, and she gazes at me coolly. I weigh my options, but in the end, I know it's not appropriate to drag our daughter into an adult battle that isn't hers to fight. That's between me and your dad. She laughs at that and rolls her eyes. He trusts me enough to talk to me, she says. And you know what? You ruin everything, Mom. Before I can reply, the front door to the bakery chimes. I glance at my watch. It's a few minutes before six, our official opening time, but Annie must not have locked the door behind her when she came in. We'll continue this later, young lady. I say sternly. Whatever, she mutters under her breath. She turns back to the batter she's mixing, and I watch for a second as she adds some flour and then some milk, then a dash of vanilla. Hey, Hope, you back there? It's Matt's voice from the front of the store, and I snap out of it. I hear Annie say, Of course it's him under her breath, but I pretend not to as I make my way up front. Mrs. Kuntz and Mrs. Sullivan come in at 7 a.m., as usual, and for once, Annie rushes out to wait on them. Usually, she's happier to be in the kitchen, baking cupcakes and miniature pies with her iPod on, effortlessly ignoring me until she has to go to school. But today, she's sunshine and smiles, whisking into the main room and pouring their coffee before they even have a chance to order. Here, let me help you to your seats, she says, juggling two coffee mugs and a little pitcher of cream as they trail behind her, exchanging glances. Why, thank you, Annie. Mrs. Sullivan says as Annie puts the coffees and cream down and pulls out her chair for her. You're welcome, Annie replies brightly. For a moment, she sounds exactly like the girl who inhabited her body before the divorce. Mrs. Kuntz murmurs a thank you, too, and Annie chirps, Yes, ma'am. She hovers while they each take their first sips of coffee, and she's practically hopping from foot to foot by the time Mrs. Sullivan takes a bite of her blueberry muffin and Mrs. Kuntz picks up her cinnamon sugar donut. Um, can I, like, ask you a question? Annie asks. I'm tidying up behind the counter, and I pause, straining to hear what she wants to know. You may, dear. Mrs. Kuntz says, but you mustn't use like in the middle of a sentence that way. Huh? Annie asks, confused. Mrs. Kuntz raises an eyebrow, and Annie's smart enough to correct herself. I mean, excuse me, she amends. The word like is not a space holder in a sentence, Mrs. Kuntz tells my daughter seriously. I duck behind the counter to hide my smile. Oh, Annie says. I mean, I know. I peek over the counter to see her face flaming red. I feel bad for her. Mrs. Kuntz, who'd been my 10th grade English teacher years ago, is a tough cookie. 
I think about coming to Annie's defense, but before I have a chance, Mrs. Sullivan jumps in. Oh, Barbara, give the child a break, she says, swatting her friend on the arm. She turns to Annie and says, ignore her. She simply misses being able to boss children around now that she's retired. Mrs. Kuntz starts to protest, but Mrs. Sullivan swats her again and smiles at Annie. Did you say you had a question for us, dear? Annie clears her throat. Um, yeah, she says. I mean, yes, ma'am. I was just wondering. She pauses and the women wait. Well, you knew my great-grandma, right? The women glance at each other, then back at Annie. Yes, of course, Mrs. Sullivan finally replies. We've known her for years. How is she? Fine, Annie says instantly. I mean, not totally fine. She's having some problems, but, um, mostly fine. Her face is flaming again. Anyways, I was just wondering, do you, um, know who Leona is? The women exchange looks again. Leona, Mrs. Sullivan says slowly. She mulls it over for a moment and shakes her head. I don't think so. It doesn't sound familiar. Barbara? Mrs. Kuntz shakes her head. No, she says. I don't think we know a Leona. Why? Annie looks down. It's just something she keeps calling me. I was just wondering, like, who she is. She looks horrified for a second and mumbles, sorry for saying like. Mrs. Sullivan reaches out and pats Annie's hand. Now you've gone and scared the child, Barbara, she says. Mrs. Kuhn sighs and says, I'm just trying to correct her grammar. Yes, well, this isn't the time or place, Mrs. Sullivan replies. She winks at Annie. Why is this so important to you, dear? The question of who this Leona is. My great-grandma seems sad, Annie replies after a minute, in a voice so low I have to strain to hear her. And I don't know that much about her, you know? My great-grandma, I mean. I want to help her, but I don't know how. A pair of customers come in then, a gray-haired man and a young blonde woman I don't know, and I miss what Annie and the women are talking about while I help them. The blonde orders a piece of carrot cake, after asking if we have anything diet. We don't. And her male companion, who looks a few decades too old to be squeezing her hand and kissing her ear, orders an eclair. By the time they leave and I glance back at Annie, she's seated with the two older women. I glance at my watch and consider reminding Annie that if she doesn't leave in the next few minutes, she'll be late to school. But the look on her face is so earnest that instead, I freeze for a minute and just look at her. I'm used to see her sneering and rolling her eyes lately every time she's around me. But in this moment, she just looks innocent and interested. I swallow the lump in my throat. I walk into the dining room with a rag and a spray bottle so that I can eavesdrop under the pretense of cleaning up. The women, I realize, are telling Annie the story of how Mamie came to live in Cape Cod. All the girls in town used to be in love with Ted, your great-grandfather? Mrs. Kuntz is telling her. Oh, my. Mrs. Sullivan fans herself with the newspaper. I used to scribble his name and mine in a notebook every day during our senior year of high school. He was older than us, Mrs. Kuntz says. By four years, Mrs. Sullivan agrees. He was off at college, Harvard, you know, but he'd come home every few weeks to visit. He had a car, a nice one, which was a big deal out here in those days, and the girls would just swoon. He was so kind, Mrs. Kuntz agrees, and like so many others, he joined the army the day after Pearl Harbor. 
The women pause in tandem and look down at their hands. I know they're thinking about other young men they'd lost so long ago. Annie shifts in her seat and asks, So then what happened? He met my great-grandma in the war, right? In Spain, I believe, Mrs. Kuntz says, looking to Mrs. Sullivan for confirmation. He was shot down somewhere in northern France or Belgium, I think. I never heard the whole story. Everyone here spent months believing he was missing in action. I was sure he was dead. But somehow he escaped to Spain, and your great-grandmother was there, too. Annie nods solemnly, like she knows this story by heart, although my grandfather died twelve years before she was born. She's French, of course, your great-grandmother Rose. By the way I understand it, her parents died when she was young, and she wanted to leave France because the country was at war, right? Mrs. Sullivan picks up the thread of the story, glancing at Mrs. Kuntz. Mrs. Kuntz nods. We never found out exactly how they met, but yes, I think Rose was living in Spain. But it was, what, 1944 when he heard he was back in America and he'd married a girl from France? Late 1943, Mrs. Sullivan corrects. I remember it exactly. It was my 20th birthday. Oh, yes, of course. You cried into your birthday cake. Mrs. Kuntz winks at Annie. She had a silly schoolgirl crush on your great-grandfather, but your great-grandmother stole him away. Mrs. Sullivan makes a face. She was two years younger than us, and she had that exotic French accent. Boys are very easily swayed by accents, you know. Annie nods again, solemnly, as if this is something she knows instinctively. I hide a smile as I pretend to concentrate on a particularly tough spot to wipe up. I've never heard my grandmother talk about how she and my grandfather met. She rarely talks about the past at all, so I'm interested to hear what the women know. Ted got some sort of job in New York at a secondary school after he received his doctoral degree, Mrs. Kuhn says, and then he and your grandmother moved back to the Cape. That's when he took the job at the Sea Oats. My grandfather, whose Ph.D. was in education, had been the first headmaster of the Sea Oats School, a prestigious private school one town over. It used to serve grades K through 12, but now it's only a high school. It's where Annie will go from ninth grade on, on a legacy scholarship. And, um, my grandma was there too? Annie asks. When Mamie and my great-grandpa moved here? Yes, your grandmother Josephine must have been, what, five years old? Six years old when they moved? Mrs. Sullivan says. They moved back to the Cape in 1950. I remember clearly because it's the year I got married. Mrs. Kuntz nods. Yes, Josephine started first grade when they moved here, if I remember right. And Mamie founded the bakery then? Annie asks. I think it was a few years later, Mrs. Kuntz says. But your mother would probably know. She calls to me, Hope, dear? I pretend I haven't been listening to their whole conversation. What's that? I ask, looking up. Annie here was wondering when your grandmother founded the bakery. In 1952, I say. I glance at Annie, who's staring at me. Her parents had owned a bakery in France, I think. I've never heard any more about Mamie's past than this. She never talked about her life before she met my grandfather. Annie ignores me and turns back to the two women. But you don't know anyone named Leona? She asks. No, Mrs. Sullivan says. Maybe she was a friend of your great-grandmother's from France. She never really had any friends here, Mrs. Kuntz says. 
Then she shoots me a guilty look and amends hurriedly. Of course, she's very nice. She just kept to herself, that's all. I nod, but I wonder whether that was all Mamie's fault after all. She's quiet and reserved, certainly, but it doesn't seem as if Mrs. Kuntz, Mrs. Sullivan, and the other women of the town exactly welcomed her with open arms. I feel a pang of sadness for her. I look at my watch again. Annie, you'd better get going. You're going to be late for school. Her eyes narrow, and the brief glimpse of the old Annie is gone. She's back to hating me. You're not the boss of me, she mutters. Actually, young lady, Mrs. Kuntz says, shooting me a look. She is. She's your mother, which makes her the boss of you until you turn eighteen at the very least. Whatever, Annie says under her breath. She gets up from the table and stomps into the kitchen. She emerges a moment later with her backpack. Thank you, she says to Mrs. Kuntz and Mrs. Sullivan on the way out the door. I mean, thanks for telling me about my great-grandma. She doesn't even look at me as she strides through the front door onto Main Street. Gavin comes by as I'm closing to drop off the spare keys I'd given him two days earlier. He is on the same pair of jeans with the hole in the thigh, which seems to have gotten marginally bigger since I saw him last. Your pipe's fixed, he tells me as I pour him the last of the afternoon's coffee. Dishwasher is running good as new. I don't even know how to thank you. Gavin smiles. Sure you do. You know my weaknesses. Star pie, cinnamon strudel, hours old coffee. He looks into his coffee cup and arches an eyebrow, but he takes a sip anyhow. I laugh, despite my embarrassment. I know I should be paying you in something other than baked goods, Gavin. I'm sorry. He looks up. You have nothing to be sorry for, he says. You're obviously underestimating my addiction to your baking. I give him a look and he laughs. Seriously, Hope, it's fine. You're doing your best. I sigh as I place the last of the day's remaining almond rose tarts into a flat Tupperware container that I'll store overnight in the freezer. Turns out my best isn't good enough, I mutter. Matt had brought me a bunch of paperwork that morning, and I haven't begun to read it yet, although I know I need to. I'm dreading it. You're not giving yourself enough credit, Gavin says. Before I can reply, he adds, So, Matt Hines has been around a lot. He takes another sip of his coffee. I look up from packing away the pastries. It's just business, I tell him although I'm not sure why I feel like I have to explain myself. Hmm, is all Gavin replies. We dated in high school, I add. Gavin grew up on the north shore of Boston. He told me about all his high school in Peabody one afternoon on the porch, so I assume he doesn't know about my past with Matt. I'm surprised when he says, I know, but that was a long time ago. I nod. That was a long time ago, I repeat. How's Annie holding up? Gavin changes the subject again, with the stuff between you and your ex and everything. I look up at him. No one has asked me this recently, and I'm surprised by how much I appreciate it. She's okay, I tell him. I pause and correct myself. Actually, I don't know why I said that. She's not okay. She seems so angry lately, and I don't know what to do about it. It's like I know the real Annie's in there somewhere, but right now she just wants to hurt me. I don't know why I'm confiding in him, but as Gavin nods slowly, there's not a bit of judgment on his face, and for that I'm grateful. I begin to wipe down the counter with a wet rag. It's rough when you're that age. He says, 
I was just a few years older than her when my parents got a divorce. She's just confused, Hope. She'll come out of it. You think so? I ask in a small voice. I know so, Gavin says. He stands and crosses to the counter, where he puts his hand on mine. I stop wiping and look up at him. She's a good kid, Hope. I saw that this summer with all the time I spent at your house. I can feel tears in my eyes, which embarrasses me. I blink them away. Thanks. I pause and pull my hand away. And if there's ever anything I can do, Gavin says. Instead of completing the sentence, he looks at me so intensely that I look away, my face burning. You're really nice to offer, Gavin, I say, but I'm sure you've got better things to do than worry about the old lady who runs the bakery. Gavin arches an eyebrow. I don't see any old ladies around here. That's nice of you to say, I murmur. But you're young, you're single, I pause. Wait, you're single, right? Last time I checked. I ignore the unexpected feeling of relief that sweeps through me. Yeah, well, I'm 36 going on 75. I'm divorced. I'm sinking financially. I've got a kid who hates me. I pause and look down. You've got better things to do than worry about me. Shouldn't you be out doing something, I don't know, something young single people do? Something young single people do? He repeats. Like what exactly? I don't know, I say. I feel foolish. I haven't felt young in ages. Clubbing? I venture in a small voice. He bursts out laughing. Yeah, I moved to the Cape because of the wild club scene. In fact, I'm just on my way back from a rave now. I smile, but my heart's not in it. I know I'm being dumb, I say. But you don't have to worry about me. I have a ton on my plate, but I've always handled everything before. I'll figure things out. Letting someone in once in a while wouldn't kill you, you know. Gavin says softly. I look at him sharply and open my mouth to respond, but he speaks first. Like I said the other day, you're a good mom, Gavin goes on. You've got to stop doubting yourself. I look down. It's just that I seem to screw everything up, I say. I feel the color rise to my cheeks and I mumble, I don't know why I'm telling you this. I hear Gavin take a deep breath, and a moment later, he's come around the counter and wrapped his arms around me. My heart thuds as I hug him back. I try not to notice how solid his chest is as he pulls me close, and instead focus on how nice it feels to be held. There's no one left to comfort me this way anymore, and I hadn't realized until this moment how much I've missed it. You don't screw everything up, Hope, Gavin murmurs into my hair. You've got to cut yourself a break. You're the toughest person I know. He pauses and adds, I know things have been hard on you lately, but you never know what will happen tomorrow or the next day. One day, one week, one month can change everything. I look up sharply and take a step away. My mother used to say that. Those exact words. Yeah? Gavin asks. Yeah. You never mention her, he says. I know, I murmur. The truth is, it hurts too much to think about her. I'd spent my childhood hoping that if I behaved a little better, or thanked her a little more profusely, or did more chores around the house, she'd love me a little more. Instead, she seemed to drift farther and farther away with every passing year. When she was diagnosed with breast cancer, and I came home to help her, the same cycle took over. I expected that she'd see how much I loved her as she lay dying, 
but instead she continued to keep me at a distance. When she told me on her deathbed that she loved me, the words didn't feel real. I want to believe that she felt that way, but I knew it was more likely that she was hazy and delusional in her final moments and thought she was talking to one of her countless boyfriends. I was always a lot closer to my grandmother than to my mom, I tell Gavin. Gavin puts a hand on my shoulder. I'm sorry you lost her hope, he says. I'm not sure whether he means my mother or Mamie, because in a lot of ways, they're both gone. Thanks, I murmur. As he leaves a few minutes later with a box of strudel, I stare after him, my heart thudding hard in my chest. I don't know why he seems to believe in me when I don't believe in myself anymore. But I can't think about that now. I have to tackle the more pressing issue, the bank's plans to foreclose. I rub my temples, plug in the electric tea kettle, and sit down at one of my cafe tables to read the paperwork Matt gave me. Chapter 5 I need to talk to you. It's a week and a half later, and I'm standing on Rob's doorstep, my old doorstep, my arms crossed over my chest. I look at my ex-husband now, and all I see is hurt and betrayal. It's as if the person I fell in love with has disappeared entirely. You could have called Hope, he says. He doesn't invite me in. He stands in the doorway, a guard at the door to a life left behind. I did call, I say firmly, twice to the house and twice to your office. You haven't called me back. He shrugs. I've been busy. I would have gotten back to you eventually. He shifts his weight to his left side, and for a moment, I have the distinct feeling he looks sad. Then, all the emotion is gone from his face, and he says, What is it you need? I take a deep breath. I hate arguing with Rob. I always have. He once told me that it was a good thing he was the one who became a lawyer, while I dropped out to raise the baby. You don't know how to fight, he'd say. You have to have that killer instinct if you're going to make it in the courtroom. We need to talk about Annie, I say. What about her? he asks. Well, for one thing, we need to be in agreement about the ground rules. She's twelve. She shouldn't be wearing makeup to school. She's a kid. Christ, Hope, is that what this is about? He laughs, and I'd be insulted if I didn't know that this is part of the strategy he employs regularly against opposing attorneys and witnesses for the other side. She's almost a teenager, for God's sake. You can't keep her a little girl forever. I'm not trying to, I tell him. I take a deep breath and struggle to stay collected. But I'm trying to set some boundaries, and when I set them, and you undermine them, she doesn't learn a thing, and she winds up hating me. Rob smiles, and perhaps I'd feel patronized if I hadn't spent endless nights during our marriage watching him practice his strategic smirk in the mirror. So that's what this is about, he says. Ah, yes, Rob Smith argument tactic number two. Pretend that you know exactly what the other person is thinking and that you're already way ahead of her. No, Rob. I pinch the bridge of my nose and close my eyes for a second. Relax, Hope. Don't get sucked into this. This is about our daughter growing up to be a decent young woman. A decent young woman who doesn't hate you he amends. Maybe you should just give her some space to be herself, Hope. That's what I'm doing. I glare at him. No, it's not, I say. You're trying to be the cool parent, so I'm stuck being the disciplinarian. That's not fair. He shrugs. So you say. Furthermore, 
I continue as if I haven't heard him. It's totally inappropriate for you to be saying bad things about me to Annie. What have I said? He asks, holding up his hands in mock surrender. Well, for one thing, you've apparently told her that I was never capable of telling you I loved you. I feel my throat close up a little, and I take a deep breath. Rob just looks at me. You can't be serious. That's a stupid thing to say to her. I told you I loved you. Yeah, Hope, what, once a year? I look away, not wanting to have this conversation again. What are you, an insecure teenage girl? I mumble. Did you want me to get you a BFF necklace, too? He doesn't look amused. I just don't want our daughter blaming me for our divorce. So the divorce had nothing to do with the affair you had with the girl from the Macy's and Hyannis? Rob shrugs. If I'd felt emotionally fulfilled at home... Ah, so you were seeking emotional fulfillment when you began sleeping with a 22-year-old, I say. I take a deep breath. You know, I've never felt that it's appropriate to tell Annie about your affair. That's between you and me. She doesn't know that you cheated, because I don't think she should have to see her father in that light. What makes you think she doesn't know? He asks, and for a moment I'm stunned into silence. You're saying she knows? I'm saying that I try to be honest with her. I'm her dad, Hope. That's my job. I stop for a minute and process what he's saying to me. I thought I was protecting her and her relationship with her father by not dragging her into it. What did you say to her? I ask. He shrugs. She's asked me about the divorce. I've answered her questions. By blaming it on me. By explaining that not everything is as simple as it appears on the surface. Meaning what? That I drove you to cheat? He shrugs again. Your words, not mine. I clench my fists. This is between you and me, Rob. I say, my voice shaking. Don't drag Annie into it. Hope, he says. I'm just trying to do what's best for Annie. I have some real concerns that she's going to turn out like you and your mother. The words physically hurt. Rob, I begin, but no other words come. He shrugs after a moment. We've had this conversation a thousand times. You know how I feel. I know how you feel. That's why we're divorced, remember? I don't acknowledge his words. What I want to say is that the reason we're divorced is he got bored. He got insecure. He got emotionally needy. He got flirted with by a stupid 22-year-old with legs up to her neck. But I know there's a grain of truth to what he's saying. The more I felt him slipping away the more I retreated into myself instead of hanging on. I swallow back the guilt. No makeup, I say firmly, not at school. It's inappropriate. And so is sharing the details of our divorce with her. That's too much for a 12-year-old. Rob opens his mouth to reply, but I hold up my hand. I'm done here, Rob, I say. And this time, I really am. We look at each other in silence for a minute, and I wonder whether he's thinking, as I am, about how we don't even know each other anymore. It seems like a lifetime ago that I promised him forever. This isn't about me and you, I say. It's about Annie. I walk away before he can reply. I'm driving home when my cell phone rings. I look at the caller ID and see Annie's cell number, the one she's supposed to use only in emergencies, even though I'm fairly sure Rob lets her text and call her friends with abandon. That is, after all, what cool parents do. Something in my stomach tightens. Why aren't you at work? Annie asks when I pick up. 
I called you there first. I had to go. I search for an explanation that doesn't involve her father. Run some errands. At four on a Thursday, she asks. The truth is, the bakery had been slow all day, and I hadn't had a customer since one o'clock, which left me plenty of time to think about Rob, Annie, and all the damage that was being done while I stood idly by, baking my way into oblivion. I knew Annie was planning to see Mamie after school, which meant I'd get Rob alone. Business was slow, is all I tell her. Well, anyways, she says, and I realize she's calling because she wants something. I steal myself for an absurd request: money, concert tickets, maybe the new four-inch heels I saw her gazing at in my copy of In Style last night. But instead, she sounds almost shy as she asks, "Can you like come over to Mamie's? Is everything okay?" I ask instantly. Yeah, she says. She lowers her voice. Actually, it's really weird, but Mamie is acting normal today. Normal. Yeah, she whispers, like she did before Grandma died. She's acting like she didn't lose her memory. My heart lurches a little, as I remember what the nurse told me when I was last there on my way out. There will be times she's as clear as day. She'll remember everything, and she's just as lucid as you or me. Those are the days you'll have to seize because there's no guarantee there will be more of them. Are you sure? I ask. Totally, Annie says, and I don't hear any of the sarcasm or anger I've been hearing in her voice lately. I wonder suddenly whether part of her attitude problem is that she's hurt that her great grandmother is forgetting her. I make a mental note to have a real talk with her about Alzheimer's. Then again, that means I'll have to face it myself. She's been like asking me about school and stuff. Annie continues, "It's weird, but she knows exactly who I am and how old I am and everything." Okay. I say, already checking my rearview mirror to make sure it's safe to do a U-turn. I'm on my way. She says she wants you to bring one of those miniature star pies from the bakery. Annie adds, "Those have always been Mamie's favorites, filled with a blend of poppy seeds, almonds, grapes, figs, prunes, and cinnamon sugar, and topped with a buttery star-shaped lattice crust." There are signature item. Okay, I tell her. I'll be there as fast as I can, and for the first time in a while, I feel a sliver of hope. I didn't realize until that moment how very much I missed my grandmother. I would like to go to the beach. Is the first thing Mamie says to me when she answers her door fifteen minutes later. For a moment, my heart sinks. It's late September, and there's a chill in the air. The memory cloud must be back, for it makes no sense for my eighty-six-year-old grandmother to suddenly want to go out and sunbathe. But then she smiles at me and pulls me into a hug. I am sorry, she says. Where are my manners? It is nice to see you, Hope, dear. You know who I am? I ask hesitantly. Well, of course I do," she says, looking insulted. "Do not tell me you think I am old and senile." Ah,、uh, I stall for time. Of course not, Mamie. She smiles. Do not worry. I am not a fool. I know I am forgetful at times. She pauses. You brought me the star pie," she asks, glancing at the white bakery bag in my hand. I nod and hand it to her. "Thank you, dear," she says. "Sure," I say slowly. She tilts her head to the side. Today, hope everything feels clear. 
Annie and I have just been having a lovely talk. I glance at Annie, who's perched on the edge of Mamie's sofa, looking nervous. She nods in agreement. But now you want to go to the beach? I ask Mamie hesitantly. It's, um, a little chilly for a swim. I'm not planning on a swim, of course, she says. I want to see the sunset. I look at my watch. The sun doesn't go down for almost two hours. Then we have plenty of time to get there, she says. Thirty minutes later, after Annie and I help Mamie to bundle up in a jacket, the three of us are headed for the beach at Payne's Creek, which was my favorite place to watch the sun sink into the horizon when I was in high school. It's a quiet beach on the western edge of Brewster, and if you walk carefully out on the rocks jutting out where the creek empties into Cape Cod Bay, you have a great view of the western sky. We stop on the way, at Annie's suggestion, to get lobster rolls and french fries at Joe's Dockside, a tiny restaurant that's been on the Cape even longer than our family bakery. People drive from miles away and wait in 45-minute lines during the summer for takeout lobster rolls, but fortunately, at 5 o'clock on a Thursday during the off-season, we're the only ones here. Annie and I listen in disbelief as Mamie, who orders a grilled cheese, she's never liked lobster, tells us a completely lucid story about the first time she and my grandfather took my mother here, when my mother was a little girl, and Josephine asked why lobsters would be silly enough to swim up to Joe's if they knew they might be made into sandwiches. We get to the beach just as the edges of the sky are beginning to burn. The sun hangs low on the western horizon above the bay, and the wispy clouds in the sky promise a beautiful sunset. Arms linked, the three of us make our way slowly down the beach, Annie on Mamie's left side and me on her right with a folding chair tucked under my arm. You okay, Mamie? Annie asks gently, once we're about halfway down the beach. We can stop and rest for a bit if you want. My heart lurches as I glance at my daughter. She's staring at Mamie with a look of concern and love so deep that I realize, suddenly, that whatever's going on with her now is truly just a phase. This is the Annie I know and love. It means I haven't screwed up entirely. It means my daughter is still the same decent person she's always been underneath, even if she hates me for the time being. I am fine, dear, Mamie replies. I want to be up on the rocks by the time the sun goes down. Why? asks Annie softly after a pause. Mamie is silent for so long that I begin to think she didn't hear Annie's question. But then, finally, she replies, I want to remember this day, this sunset, this time with you girls. I know I don't have many days like this left. Annie glances at me in concern. Sure you do, Mamie, she says. My grandmother squeezes my arm, and I smile gently at her. I know what she's saying, and it breaks my heart that she's aware of it. She turns to Annie. Thank you for your faith, she says, but sometimes God has another plan. Annie looks wounded by the words. She looks away, staring off into the distance. I know that the truth is finally beginning to sink in for her, and it makes my heart hurt. We finally reach the rocks, and I set up the chair I'd grabbed from the trunk of the car. I help Annie lower Mamie into it. Sit with me, girls, she says, and Annie and I quickly settle down on the rocks on either side of her. 
We stare in silence toward the horizon as the sun melts into the bay, painting the sky orange, then pink, purple, and indigo as it disappears. There it is, Mamie says softly, and she points just above the horizon, where a star twinkles faintly through the fading twilight. The evening star. I'm reminded suddenly of the fairy tales she used to tell me about a prince and a princess in a faraway land, the ones where the prince had to go fight the bad knights, and he promised the princess he'd come for her one day, because their love would never die. So I'm surprised when it's Annie who murmurs, As long as there are stars in the sky, I will love you. That's what the prince in your stories always said. When Mamie looks at her, there are tears in her eyes. That's right, she says. She reaches into the pocket of her coat and withdraws the star pie she asked me to bring from the bakery. It's smush now, and the star-shaped lattice crust on top is crumbling. Annie and I exchange looks. You brought the pie with you? I ask. My heart sinks. I thought she was entirely lucid. Yes, dear, she replies quite clearly. She stares down at the pie for a moment as the light continues to fade from the sky. I'm just about to suggest we start heading back before it gets too dark out when she says, You know, my mother taught me to make these pies. I didn't know that. I say. She nods. My mother and father had a bakery, very near the Seine, the river that runs through Paris. I work there as a girl, just like you do now, Annie, just like you did when you were a girl, Hope. You've never told us about your parents before, I say. There are a lot of things I've never told you, she says. I thought I was protecting you, protecting myself, but I am losing my memories now, and I fear that if I do not tell you these things, they will be gone forever, and the damage I have done will not be reversed. It's time you know the truth. What are you talking about, Mamie? Annie asks, and I can hear the worry in her voice. She looks at me, and I know she's thinking the same thing I am. Mamie's mind must be clouding over again. Before I can say anything, Mamie begins breaking off pieces of the star pie and throwing them into the ocean. She's whispering something under her breath, speaking so softly that I can barely hear her over the roll of the tide into the rocks below. Um, what are you doing, Mamie? I ask as gently as possible, trying to keep the worry from creeping into my voice. Shh, child, she says. Then she goes back to throwing pieces into the water. Mamie, what are you saying? Annie asks. It's not French, is it? No, dear, Mamie replies calmly. Annie and I exchange confused looks as Mamie throws the final piece of the pie into the water. She reaches for our hands. Who is like unto you, O God? She says in English. And you will cast all their sins into the depths of the sea. What are you saying, Mamie? Annie asks again. Is it from the Bible? Mamie smiles. It is a prayer she replies. She stares at the evening star for a moment, while Annie and I watch her in silence. Hope, she finally says, there is something I need you to do for me. Chapter 6 Roses Strudel Strudel Ingredients Three Granny Smith Apples peeled, cored, and sliced into narrow slivers. One Granny Smith apple, 
peeled, cored, and shredded. One cup raisins. Half cup chopped candied orange peel. Listen for the recipe below. One cup brown sugar. Two teaspoons cinnamon. Half cup slivered almonds. One sheet frozen puff pastry, thawed. One egg, beaten. Cinnamon sugar for sprinkling. Three parts sugar mixed with one part cinnamon. Directions. One. Mix apples, raisins, candied orange peel, brown sugar, and cinnamon in a large bowl. Let sit for 30 minutes. 2. Preheat oven to 400 degrees. 3. Spread slivered almonds in a thin layer on a baking sheet and toast in oven for 7 to 9 minutes until slightly browned. Remove and set aside for five minutes until cool enough to touch. Mix into the apple mixture. 4. Spoon apple mixture into a colander lined with cheesecloth and press down with another piece of cheesecloth to eliminate extra moisture in the mixture. Leave in cheesecloth-covered colander to drain while you place puff pastry sheet on a greased baking sheet. Roll lightly to expand area of pastry without breaking through the dough. 5. Spread apple mixture down the middle of the pastry lengthwise and fold the pastry around the mixture, sealing on all sides by using a bit of water on your fingers and pressing edges firmly together. 6. Brush top of pastry with beaten egg. Cut five or six narrow slivers in the top and sprinkle liberally with cinnamon sugar. 7. Bake for 35 to 40 minutes until golden brown. Candied Orange Peel Ingredients 4 oranges 14 cups water, divided 2 cups granulated sugar Directions 1. Peel all four oranges, taking care to remove the peels whole or in two pieces, if possible. 2. Cut the peels into thin strips. 3. Boil six cups of water and add the peels to the boiling water. Boil three minutes, drain, and rinse the peels, then repeat the same process again. This gets rid of some of the bitterness of the orange peels. 4. Mix remaining 2 cups water with 2 cups sugar and bring to a boil. Add the peels, reduce heat, and cover pot. Simmer for 45 minutes. 5. Remove from sugar water with a slotted spoon and lay peels on a rack to dry. Wait at least two hours before using them in the recipe for the strudels. Dip the remainder in dark chocolate and enjoy as a snack. Rose When Rose had awoken that morning, she knew. It was just like the old days, when she'd known things deep in her bones before they happened. Those days were far in the past, but lately, as the Alzheimer's had stolen more of the in-between, it was like the timeline of her life had become an accordion, folding in on itself, bringing the past ever closer to the present by bending and contracting the years that had gone by. But on this day, Rose remembered everything, her family, her friends, the life she'd once had. For a moment, she had closed her eyes and wished to drift back into the oblivion from which she'd come. The Alzheimer's terrified her some days, but other days it was a comfort. She was not ready for this clear window into the past. But then she opened her eyes and looked at the calendar that sat at her bedside table. Each night before closing her eyes, she crossed off the day she had just completed. She was losing everything else, but knowing the day of the week was something she could still control. And according to the red X's on the calendar, today, the 29th of September, 
was a special day. Rose knew in an instant that the fact she'd been granted a reprieve of clarity on this day, of all days, was a sign from above. And so she'd spent the morning writing it all down, as best she could, in a letter addressed to her granddaughter. Some day, Hope would read it and understand. But not yet. There were still pieces missing. When Rose closed the envelope, just before lunch, she felt empty and sad, as if she had just sealed off a piece of herself. In a way, she supposed, she had. She carefully wrote out the address of Tom Evans, the attorney who'd drawn up her will, and asked one of the nurses to please stamp and post the letter. Then she sat down and wrote out a list, forming each name carefully and clearly in big block writing, despite her shaking hands. Later that day, as she drove to the beach with Hope and Annie, she checked the pocket of her skirt three times just to make sure the list was still there. It was everything to her, and soon Hope would know the truth. It was impossible to hold back the tide any longer. In fact, Rose was no longer sure she wanted to. Being a one-woman dam against a surging flood was exhausting. Now, as she stood on the piled rocks, her granddaughter on one side and her great-granddaughter on the other, in the fading Eur Bleu, she looked up at the sky and breathed in and out, in tune with the ocean, as she held the star pie in her hands. She threw the first piece into the water and recited the words so softly that she couldn't hear them herself over the rhythmic rushing of the waves. I am sorry for leaving, she whispered into the wind. I am sorry for the decisions I've made. A piece of the crust landed on an incoming wave. I am sorry for the people I have hurt. The wind carried her words away. As she threw piece after piece of the pie into the ocean, she glanced at Hope and Annie, both of whom were staring at her in confusion. She felt a pang of guilt for scaring them, but they would understand soon enough. It was time. She looked back to the sky and spoke to God softly, using words she hadn't said aloud in sixty years. She did not expect forgiveness. She knew she didn't deserve it, but she wanted God to know that she was sorry. No one knew the truth, no one but God, and of course Ted, who had died twenty-five years earlier. He had been a good man, a kind man, papa to her Josephine and grandpa to her hope. He'd shown them love, and she would be forever grateful for that, because she had not known how. Still, she wondered whether he would have loved her the way he did if he'd known the whole truth. He'd guessed at it, she knew, but to tell him, to say it aloud, would have been to crush his soul. Rose took a deep breath and looked into the eyes of Hope, the granddaughter she knew she'd failed. Hope's mother, Josephine, had suffered from Rose's mistakes, and so, too, had Hope. Even now, Rose could see it in her granddaughter's eyes and in the way she lived her life. Then she looked to Annie, the one who brought all the memories rushing back in. She hoped for a better future for her. I need you to do something for me, Rose said at long last, turning to her granddaughter. What do you need? Hope asked softly. I'll do whatever you want. Hope didn't know what she was agreeing to, but Rose had no choice. I need you to go to Paris, Rose said calmly. Hope's eyes widened. Paris? Paris, Rose repeated firmly. Before Hope could ask any questions, she went on. I must know what happened to my family. 
Rose reached into her pocket and withdrew the list, the one that felt like it was on fire, along with the check she'd carefully made out for a thousand dollars, enough for a plane ticket to France. Her palm burned as hope took them from her. I must know, Rose repeated softly. The waves crashed against the dam of her memories, and she braced herself for the flood. Your family? Hope asked tentatively. Rose nodded, and Hope unfolded the slip of paper. Her eyes quickly scanned the seven names. Seven names, Rose thought. She looked upward to where the stars of the Big Dipper were beginning to appear. Seven stars in the sky. I must know what happened, she told her granddaughter. And so, now, must you. What's going on? Annie interrupted. She looked scared, and Rose longed to comfort her, but she knew she was no better at comfort than she was at truth. She never had been. Besides, Annie was twelve, old enough to know, just two years younger than Rose had been when the war began. Who are these people? Hope asked, looking down at the list again. They are my family, Rose said. Your family. She closed her eyes for a moment and traced their names on her own heart, which, astoundingly, had gone on beating for all these years. Albert Picard, born 1897. Cecile Picard, born 1901. Elin Picard, born 1924. Claude Picard, born 1929. Alan Picard, born 1931. David Picard, born 1934. Danielle Picard, born 1937. When Rose opened her eyes, Hope and Annie were staring at her. She took a deep breath. Your grandfather went to Paris in 1949, she began. Her voice was strained, for the words were hard to say aloud, even now, even so many years later. Rose closed her eyes again and remembered Ted's face the day he came home. He'd been unable to meet her eye. He'd spoken slowly as he delivered the news of the people she loved more than anything in the world. They all died, Rose continued after a moment. She opened her eyes again and looked at Hope. It was all I needed to know then. I asked your grandfather to tell me no more. My heart could not bear it. Only after he delivered the news had she finally agreed to return with him to the Cape Cod town where he'd been born and raised. Until then, she had been determined to remain in New York, just in case. It was where she'd always believed she'd be found, in the meeting place they'd spoken of years before. But now, there was no one left to find her. She was lost forever. All these people? Annie asked, breaking the silence, bringing Rose back to the moment. They all, like, died? What happened? Rose paused. The world fell down, she said finally. It was all she could explain, and it was the truth. The world had collapsed upon itself, writhing and folding into something she could no longer recognize. I don't understand, Annie murmured. She looked scared. Rose took a deep breath. Some secrets cannot be spoken without undoing a lifetime, she said. But I know that when my memory dies, so too will the loved ones I have kept close to my heart all these years. Rose looked at Hope. She knew that her granddaughter would do her best to explain it to Annie one day. But first, she would need to understand it herself. And for that, 
She needed to go to the place it had all begun. Please go to Paris soon, Hope, Rose urged. I do not know how much time I have. And then she was done. The toll was too high. She had said more than she'd said in sixty-two years since the day Ted had returned with the news. She looked up at the stars and found the one she had named Papa, the one she had named Mama, the one she had named Eline, Claude, Alan, David, Danielle. There was still one star missing. She could not find him, no matter how much she searched. And she knew, as she'd always known, that it was her fault he wasn't there. A piece of her wanted hope to find out about him on her journey to Paris. She knew the discovery would change Hope's life. Hope and Annie were asking questions, but Rose could no longer hear them. Instead, she closed her eyes and began to pray. The tide was coming. It had begun. Chapter 7 Do you, like, have any idea what she was talking about? Annie says as soon as we get back in the car after dropping Mamie off. She's fumbling with her seatbelt as she tries to buckle it. It's not until I notice that her hands are shaking that I realize mine are too. I mean, like, who are those people? Annie finally clicks the belt closed and looks at me. There's confusion etched across her smooth brow, along with her smattering of freckles that are fading more the farther we get away from the summer sun. Mamie's maiden name wasn't even Picard. It was Durand. I know, I murmur. When Annie was in fifth grade, her class did a basic family tree project. She tried to use a website to trace Mamie's roots, but there had been so many immigrants with the last name Durand in the early 1940s that she'd gotten stuck. She'd sulked about it for a week, upset at me that I hadn't thought to research Mamie's past before her memory began to vanish. Maybe she's got the name wrong. Annie says finally. Maybe she wrote Picard, but she meant Durand. Maybe, I say slowly, but I know that neither of us quite believes it. Mamie was as lucid as we'd seen her in years. She knew exactly what she was saying. We drove the rest of the way home without speaking, but for once, it's not an uncomfortable silence. Annie isn't sitting in the passenger seat, resenting me with her every breath. She's thinking about Mamie. The light in the sky has almost entirely gone out now. I imagine Mamie at her window, searching the stars as twilight finally gives way to the blackness of night. Out here on the Cape, especially when the summer tourists have all snuffed out their porch lights until the next season— the nights are dark and deep. The larger streets are lit, but as I turn onto Lower Road and then Prince Edward Lane, the faint glow of Main Street vanishes behind us, and ahead of us, the last vestiges of Mamie's air bleu disappear into the dark void that I know is the west side of Cape Cod Bay. I feel like we're in a ghost town as I make the last turn onto Bradford Road. Seven of the ten homes on our street are summer homes, and now that the season's over, they're deserted. I pull into my driveway, the same driveway where I spent summer nights as a little girl catching fireflies and winter days helping my mom shovel snow so she could get her old station wagon out and turn off the ignition. We're still in the car, but now that we're a block from the beach, I can smell salt in the air, which means that the tide is coming in. I have a sudden urge to hurry down to the beach with a flashlight and dip my toes in the frothy surf, but I quell it, 
I have to get Annie ready to go to her father's for the night. She doesn't seem to be any more ready to get out of the car than I am. Why did Mamie want to leave France so bad anyway? She finally asks. The war must have been pretty bad for her, I say. Like Mrs. Sullivan and Mrs. Coon said, I think her parents had died. Mamie would have only been seventeen when she left Paris. Then I think she met your great grandpa and fell in love. So she, like, left everything behind? Annie asks. How could she do that without being sad? I shake my head. I don't know, honey. Annie's eyes narrow. You never asked her? She looks at me, and I can tell that the anger, which had gone into hibernation temporarily, is back. Sure I did, I say. When I was your age, I used to ask about her past all the time. I wanted her to take me to France and show me all the things she did when she was a kid. I used to imagine her riding the Eiffel Tower elevator up and down all day with a poodle while eating a baguette and wearing a beret. Those are stereotypes, Mom, Annie says, rolling her eyes at me. But I'm fairly sure I can see the hint of a smile tugging at the corners of her mouth as she gets out of the car. I get out, too, and follow her across the front lawn. I forgot to turn the porch light on before I left the house earlier, so it looks like the darkness is swallowing Annie whole. I hurry to the door and turn the key in the lock. Annie lingers in the hallway for a long moment, just looking at me. I'm sure she's about to say something, but when she opens her mouth, no sound comes out. Abruptly, she turns on her heel and strides toward her bedroom in the back of our small cottage. I'll be ready in five, she yells over her shoulder. Since five usually means at least twenty minutes in Annie speak, I'm surprised to see her in the kitchen just a few minutes later. I'm standing at the refrigerator with the door open, willing dinner to materialize out of thin air. For someone who works around food all day, I do a lousy job of keeping my own fridge stocked. There's a healthy choice meal in the freezer, Annie says from behind me. I turn and smile. Guess it's time I go to the grocery store. Nah, Annie says. I wouldn't recognize our fridge if it was full. I'd think I'd accidentally gone into the wrong house. Ha ha, very funny, I say with a grin. I shut the refrigerator door and open the freezer, which contains two trays of ice cubes, a half bag of miniature Reese's peanut butter cups, a bag of frozen peas, and, as Annie promised, a healthy choice frozen meal. We already ate anyways, Annie adds. Remember the lobster rolls? I close the door to the freezer and nod. I know, I say. I look over at Annie, who's standing by the kitchen table, her duffel bag propped against the chair beside her. She rolls her eyes at me. You're so weird. Do you just sit here and eat junk food every time I go to Dad's? I clear my throat. No, I lie. Mamie used to deal with stress by baking. My mother used to deal with stress by getting furious about little things and usually sending me to my room after telling me what a lousy daughter I was. I, apparently, deal with stress by stuffing my face. All right, honey, I say. Got everything? I cross the kitchen toward her, moving absurdly slowly, as if I can prolong her time with me. I pull her into a hug, which seems to surprise her as much as it surprises me. But she hugs back, which makes the pain in my heart temporarily disappear. I love you, kiddo, I murmur into her hair. I love you too, Mom, Annie says after a minute, her voice muffled against my chest.
Now, could you let go of me before you, like, smother me? Embarrassed, I release her. I'm not sure what to do about Mamie, I say, as she reaches for her duffel bag and swings it over her shoulder. Maybe she's talking nonsense. Annie freezes. What are you talking about? I shrug. Her memory's gone, Annie. It's awful, but that's what Alzheimer's is. It wasn't gone today, she says, and I can see the inner corners of her eyebrows beginning to point sharply downward as she furrows her brow. Her tone is suddenly icy. No, but talking about these people we've never heard of, you have to admit it doesn't make any sense. Mom, Annie says flatly. Her eyes burn a hole into me. You are going to Paris, right? I laugh. Sure, then I'll go shopping in Milan and skiing in the Swiss Alps. Then maybe I'll take a gondola around Venice. Annie narrows her eyes. You have to go to Paris. I realize she's serious. Honey, I say gently, that's just not practical. I'm the only one here to run the bakery. So close it for a few days, or I'll help out after school. Sweetheart, that's not going to work. I think about how close I am to losing everything. But mom! Annie, who's to say that Mamie will even remember that conversation later? That's why you have to go, Annie says. Didn't you see how important it was to her? She wants you to find out what happened to those people. You can't just let her down. I sigh. I thought that Annie understood this better, that she realized how often her great-grandmother speaks nonsense. Annie, I begin. But she cuts me off. What if this is her last chance? What if this is our last chance to help her? I shrug. I don't know what to say. I can't possibly explain to her that we're teetering on the edge. When I'm silent for a moment, Annie seems to make up her mind without me. I hate you, she hisses. Then she turns on her heels and stalks out of the kitchen, her duffel bag bobbing behind her. A few seconds later, I hear the front door slam. I take a deep breath and follow her outside, stealing myself for a silent drive to her father's. The next morning, after a mostly sleepless night, I'm at the bakery alone, sliding a tray of giant sugar cookies into the oven, when there's a rattling knock on the glass-paned front door. I put the oven mitts on the counter, set the timer on the oven, dust off my hands on my apron, and check my watch. 5.35 a.m., 25 minutes before I open. As I cross from the kitchen to the sales floor, through the swinging, slatted door, I see Matt, his hand shading his eyes, as he presses his face against the glass and peers in. He sees me and backs up quickly, then waves casually, as if he hasn't just left his nose print on my window. Matt, we're not open yet, I say, after I've turned the three locks and cracked open the front door. I mean, you're welcome to come in and wait, but the coffee's not on yet, and... No, no, I'm not here for coffee, Matt says. He pauses and adds, but if you got some going, I'll take a cup. Oh, I say, checking my watch again. Yeah, okay. It shouldn't take more than two minutes to grind the beans, scoop them into the coffee maker, and push the brew button. I hurry to do that, mentally ticking off all the other things I need to do before we open, as Matt follows me inside and pulls the door closed behind him. Hope, I came over to ask what you're going to do, Matt says, while the coffee maker gurgles and spits its first sizzling drops into the pot. For an instant, I wonder how he knows about what Mamie said, 
But then I realize he's talking about the bakery and the fact that the bank is apparently ready to begin proceedings to take it away from me. My heart sinks. I don't know, Matt, I say stiffly without turning around. I pretend I'm busy with the coffee preparation. I haven't had a chance to work through things yet. In other words, I'm in denial. That's my general approach when things are going wrong. I simply bury my head in the sand and wait for the storm to pass. Sometimes it does. Most of the time, I only wind up with sand in my eyes. Hope, Matt begins. I sigh and shake my head. Look, Matt, if you've come here to try to persuade me to sell to these investors of yours, I've already told you that I don't know what to do yet, and I'm not ready to... He cuts me off. You're running out of time, he says firmly. We need to talk about this. Finally, I turn. He's standing at the counter, leaning forward. Okay, I say. My chest feels tight. He pauses and picks an invisible speck from his lapel. He clears his throat. The smell of coffee is wafting through the air now, and because he's making me nervous, I turn and busy myself with pouring him a cup before the maker has finished. I stir in his cream and sugar, and he takes the cup from me with a nod. I want to try to persuade the investors to make you a partner. He finally blurts out, if they'll take the bakery on, which we still don't know. They need to come in, view your operations, and run your numbers. But I'm talking you up. A partner? I ask. I decide not to mention how much it hurts to have it presented to me like a gift that I could have a share in my own family's business. Does that mean I'd have to come up with the money to cover a percentage of the purchase from the bank? Yes and no, he says. Because I don't have it, Matt. I know. I stare and wait for him to go on. He clears his throat. What if you borrowed some money from me? My eyes widen. What? It would be more of a business arrangement, Hope, he says quickly. I mean, I have the credit. So what if we went into this, say, 75-25? 75% ownership for you, 25 for me. And you just pay me what you can every month. We could keep a piece of the bakery in your family. I can't, I say, before I've even had a chance to consider it. The invisible strings attached would strangle me. And as much as I hate the idea of strangers owning the majority of my bakery, it's even worse to think of Matt having an ownership interest in it, too. Matt, it's such a nice offer, but I can't possibly... Hope. I'm just asking you to consider it. He's speaking quickly. It's not a big deal. I have the money. I've been looking for something to invest in, and this place is an institution in this town. I know you'll turn things around soon, and... His voice trails off, and he looks at me hopefully. Matt, that means a lot to me, I say softly, but I know what you're doing. What? he asks. Charity, I say. I take a deep breath. You feel sorry for me, and I appreciate that, Matt. I really do. It's just, I don't need your pity. But, he begins, but I cut him off again. Look, I'm going to sink or swim on my own, okay? I pause and swallow hard, trying to believe I'm doing the right thing. And maybe I'll sink. Maybe I'll lose everything. Maybe the investors will decide this place isn't worth it anyhow. I take a deep breath. But if that happens, maybe that's what's meant to be. His face falls. He taps his fingers on the counter a few times. You know, Hope, you're different, he says finally. Different? Than you used to be, he says. Back in high school, 
You wouldn't let anything get you down. You always bounce back. That was one of my favorite things about you. I don't say anything. There's a lump in my throat. But now you're ready to give up, he adds after a moment. He doesn't meet my eye. I just, I thought you would feel differently. It's like you're just letting life happen to you. I press my lips together. I know I shouldn't care what Matt thinks, but the words still wound me, largely because I know he's not trying to be cruel. He's right. I am different than I used to be. He regards me for a long moment and nods. I think your mother would be disappointed. The words hurt because they're meant to, but at the same time, they help because he's dead wrong. My mother never cared about the bakery the way my grandmother did. She looked at it as a burden. She probably would have been happy to see it fail while she was still around, so she could have washed her hands of it. Maybe, Matt, I say. He pulls out his wallet and takes out two dollar bills. He puts them on the counter. I sigh. Don't be silly. The coffee's on the house. He shakes his head. I don't need your charity, Hope, he says. He half smiles at me. Have a good one, he adds. He grabs his coffee and strides quickly out the front door. As I watch the darkness wrap itself around his disappearing silhouette, I shiver. Annie comes and goes that morning, and once again, she's barely speaking to me, other than to ask tightly whether I've had a chance to look into booking flights to Paris. By eleven in the morning, the bakery is empty, and I'm staring out the front panes at the changing leaves of Main Street. There's a breeze today, and every once in a while, oak leaves in fiery red or maple leaves in burnt orange waft by, reminding me of graceful birds. At 11.30, with no customers, nothing left to do, and a batch of star pies in the oven, I log on to the old laptop that I keep behind the register. I borrow Wi-Fi from Jessica Gregory's gift shop next door, and I slowly type in www.google.com. Once there, I pause. What am I looking for? I chew on my lip for a moment and enter the first name on Mamie's list, Albert Picard. A second later, the search results are up. There's an airport in France named Albert Picardy, but I don't think that has anything to do with Mamie's list. I read the Wikipedia entry, nonetheless, but it's clear that this is something else altogether. It's a regional airport that serves a community called Albert in the Picardy region of northern France. Dead end. I click back and scan the other search results. There's a Frank Albert Picard, but he's an American attorney who was born and raised in Michigan and died in the early 1960s. That can't be the person she's looking for. He has no ties to Paris. A few other Albert Picards come up when I add the word Paris to my search string, but nothing seems to fit with the time Mamie lived in France. I bite my bottom lip and clear the search field. I type in White Pages Paris, and after a few click-throughs, I wind up on a page titled Page Blanche, which asks for a nom and a prénom. I know from my limited high school French that this is surname and first name, so I type in Picard and Albert, and under the blank asking, Ooh, I enter Paris. One listing comes up, and my heart skips a beat. Will it really be this easy? I jot down the number. Then I erase Albert and fill in the second name on Mamie's list, Cecile. 
There are eight matches in Paris, including four people listed as C. Picard. I jot down those numbers too and repeat the search with the rest of the names: Eline, Claude, Alan, David, Danielle. I finish with a list of thirty-five numbers. I return to Google to figure out how to call France from the United States and jot down those instructions too. I work out the overseas number for the first Picard and reach for the phone. I pause before I pick it up. I have no idea what international calls cost because I've never had to make one before, but I'm sure it's something just short of a fortune. I think about the check for a thousand dollars Mamie wrote to me, and resolve to take the long distance charges out of that and deposit the rest of the money back into her checking account. It'll still be a lot cheaper than buying a ticket to Paris. I glance at the door. Still no customers. The street outside is empty. There's a storm brewing, and the sky is darkening. The wind picking up. I glance back at the oven. Thirty-six minutes left on the timer. The smell of cinnamon is wafting through the bakery as I breathe in deeply. I dial the first number. There are a few clicks as the call connects, and then a pair of almost buzzer-like pulses. Someone picks up on the other end. "Allo," a woman's voice says. It suddenly occurs to me that I don't speak more than rudimentary French. Um, hello, I say nervously. I'm looking for the relatives of someone named Albert Picard. There is silence on the other end. I search my memory desperately for the correct French words. Um, je cherche Albert Picard. I attempt. Knowing that's not quite right, but hoping that it conveys my point. There is no Albert Picard here. The woman speaks clear English with a heavy French accent. My heart sinks. Oh, I am sorry. I thought that there is no Albert Picard here because he is a useless bastard. The woman continues calmly. He cannot keep his hands from touching all the other women, and I am done with it. Oh, I'm sorry, I say, my voice trailing off because I'm not sure what else to say. You are not one of these women, are you? She asks, suddenly sounding suspicious. No, no, I say quickly. I'm looking for someone my grandmother once knew. Or maybe was related to. She left Paris in the early 1940s. The woman laughs. This Albert, he is only 32, and his father is Jean Marc, so he is not the Albert Picard you search for. I'm sorry, I say. I glance down at the list. Do you know a Cecile Picard or a Aline Picard or a Claude Picard, or I pause, or a Rose Duran or Rose McKenna? No, the woman says. Okay, I say, disappointed. Thank you for your time, and I hope um that you work things out with Albert. The woman snorts. And I hope he gets run over by a taxi. The line clicks, and I'm left holding the phone in surprise. I shake my head, wait for the dial tone, and try the next number. Chapter Eight. By the time Annie comes in, just before four, the star pies have cooled. I have tomorrow's blueberry muffins in the oven, and I've called all thirty-five numbers on my list. Twenty-two of them answered. None of them knew the people from Mamie's list. Two of them had suggested that I try calling the synagogues, which might have records of their members from that time period. Thank you, 
I told both of them, puzzled. But my grandmother is Catholic. Annie barely meets my gaze as she tosses her backpack behind the counter and stalks into the kitchen. I sigh. Great, we're going to have one of those afternoons. I already cleaned all the bowls and trays, I call to my daughter as I start pulling cookies from the display case in preparation for closing in a few minutes. We had a slow day today, so I had some extra time, I add. So did you book your trip to Paris? Annie asks, appearing in the doorway to the kitchen with her hands on her hips. With all this extra time you had? No, but I... I begin, but Annie holds up her hand to stop me. No? Okay, that's all I need to hear, she says, clearly borrowing phrasing from her father in an attempt to sound like a miniature adult. Just what I need. Annie, you're not listening, I say. I called all the... Look, Mom, if you're not going to help Mamie, I don't know what we have to talk about, she says sharply. I take a deep breath. I've been walking on eggshells around her for the last several months because I've been worried about how she's handling the divorce. But I'm tired of being the bad guy, especially when I'm not. Annie, I say firmly, I'm doing everything I can to keep us afloat here. I understand that you want to help Mamie. I do too. But she has Alzheimer's, Annie. The request she's making isn't logical. Now, if you'll just listen to me, I... Whatever, Mom. She cuts me off again. You don't care about anyone. She strides back into the kitchen, and I start to follow her, my hands clenched into fists as I struggle to control my temper. Young lady, don't you walk away from me in the middle of an argument. Just then, the door chime dings, and I spin around to see Gavin, dressed in faded jeans and a red flannel shirt. He meets my gaze and rakes a hand through his unruly brown curls, which I distractedly realize need to be cut. Um, am I interrupting something? He asks. He glances at his watch. Are you still open? I force a smile. Of course, Gavin, I say. Come in. What can I do for you? He looks uncertain as he approaches the counter. You sure? He asks. I can come back tomorrow if... No, I cut him off. I'm sorry. Annie and I were just having a... talk. Gavin pauses and smiles at me. My mom and I used to have a lot of talks when I was Annie's age. He says in a low voice, I'm sure my mom always enjoyed them. I laugh, despite myself. Just then, Annie emerges from the kitchen again. I brought you coffee, she announces to Gavin before I can say anything. On the house, she adds. She shoots a glance at me, as if daring me to challenge her. Little does she know that I haven't charged him for anything since he completed his work on our cottage. Well, thank you, Annie. That's generous, Gavin says, taking the coffee from her. I watch as he closes his eyes and breathes in the aroma. Boy, this smells great. I arch an eyebrow at him because I suspect he knows as well as I do that the coffee's been on the burner for approximately the last two hours and is anything but fresh. So, Mr. Keys, Annie begins, you like help people and stuff, right? Gavin looks surprised. He clears his throat and nods. Sure, Annie, I guess so. He pauses and glances at me. And you can call me Gavin if you want. Um, do you mean I help people by being a handyman? By fixing things? Whatever, she says dismissively. You help people because it's the right thing to do, right? Gavin shoots me another look, and I shrug. So anyways, Annie continues, if something was lost and it was really bothering someone, you'd probably want to help them find it, right? Gavin nods. Sure, Annie. 
he says slowly. No one likes to lose things. He shoots me another look. So, like, if someone asked you to help them find some of their relatives who they'd lost, you'd help them, wouldn't you? She asks. Annie? I say in warning, but she isn't paying any attention. Or would you, like, totally ignore them when they ask for your help? She goes on. She looks at me pointedly. Gavin clears his throat again and looks at me. I know he realizes he's been dragged unwittingly into our fight, despite the fact that he has no idea what we're arguing about. Well, Annie, he says slowly, turning his gaze back to her, I suppose I'd try to help find him, but it really depends on what the situation is. Annie turns to me with a triumphant look on her face. See, Mom, Mr. Keys cares even if you don't. She whirls around and disappears back into the kitchen. I close my eyes and listen to the sound of a metal bowl slamming into the counter. I open them again to see Gavin looking at me with concern. Our eyes meet for a moment, and then we both turn to look as Annie reemerges from the back. Mom, all the dishes are clean she says without looking at me. I'm walking to Dad's now, okay? Have a nice time, I say flatly. She rolls her eyes, grabs her backpack, and strides out without looking back. When I look up and meet Gavin's gaze again, the concern in his eyes makes me uncomfortable. I don't need him or anyone worrying about me. Sorry, I mutter. I shake my head and try to look busy. So, what can I get you, Gavin? I have some muffins in back that just came out of the oven. Hope, he says after a pause. Are you okay? I'm fine. You don't look fine, he says. I blink and continue to avoid his eyes. I don't? He shakes his head. You're allowed to be upset, you know he says. I must give him a harsh look without meaning to, because his cheeks suddenly flush and he says, I'm sorry, I didn't mean. I hold up a hand. I know, I say, I know. Look, I appreciate it. We're silent for a moment, and then Gavin says, So, what was she talking about? Is there something I can help you with? I smile at him. I appreciate the offer, I say, but it's nothing. He looks like he doesn't believe me. It's a long story, I clarify. He shrugs. I got time, he says. I glance at my watch. But you were going somewhere, weren't you? I ask. You came in for pastries. I'm not in a rush, he says but I will take a dozen cookies, the ones with cranberries and white chocolate in them, if you don't mind. I nod and carefully arrange the remaining Cape Cotter cookies in the display case in a robin's egg blue box with North Star Bakery Cape Cod written on it in swirly white letters. I tie it with a white ribbon and hand it across the counter. So? Gavin prompts as he takes the box from me. You really want to hear this? I ask. If you want to tell me, he says. I nod, realizing suddenly that I do want to tell another adult what's going on. Well, my grandmother has Alzheimer's, I begin. And for the next five minutes, as I pull miniature pies, croissants, baklava, tarts and crescent moons out of the display case and pack them into airtight containers for the freezer or boxes for the church's women's shelter, I tell Gavin about what Mamie said last night. Gavin listens intently, but his jaw drops when I tell him about Mamie throwing pieces of miniature star pies into the ocean. I shake my head and say, I know, it sounds crazy, right? He shakes his head, a strange expression on his face. No, actually it doesn't, 
Yesterday was the first day of Rosh Hashanah. Okay, I say slowly, but what does that have to do with anything? Rosh Hashanah is the Jewish New Year, Gavin explains. It's customary for us to go to a flowing body of water, like the ocean, for a little ceremony called a Tashich. You're Jewish? I ask. He smiles, on my mom's side, he says. I was kind of raised half Jewish, half Catholic. Oh, I just look at him. I didn't know that. He shrugs. Anyhow, the word Tashlich basically means casting out. I realize suddenly that the phrase rings a bell. I think my grandmother said something like that last night. He nods. The ceremony involves throwing crumbs into the water to symbolize the casting out of our sins. Usually bread crumbs, but I guess pie crumbs would work too. He pauses and adds, Do you think that might have been what your grandmother was doing? I shake my head. It can't be, I say. My grandmother's Catholic. As the words leave my mouth, I'm suddenly struck by the fact that two of the people I'd reached in Paris today suggested I call synagogues. Gavin arches an eyebrow. You sure? Maybe she wasn't always Catholic. But that's crazy. If she was Jewish, I would know. Not necessarily, he says. My grandmother on my mom's side, my nana, lived through the Holocaust, he says. Bergen Belsen. She lost both her parents and one of her brothers. Because of her, I got started volunteering with survivors when I was about 15. Some of them say that for a while they abandoned their roots. It was hard for them to hang on to who they'd been when everything was taken away especially those who were kids taken in by Christian families, but all of them eventually came back to Judaism, kind of like coming home. I just stare at him. Your grandmother was a Holocaust survivor? I repeat, trying to piece together a whole new side to Gavin. You used to work with survivors? I still do. I volunteer once a week at the Jewish nursing home in Chelsea. But that's a two-hour drive, I say. He shrugs. It's where my grandmother lived until she died. The place means something to me. Wow. I don't know what else to say. What do you do there when you volunteer? Art classes, he says simply. Painting, sculpture, drawing, things like that. I bring him cookies, too. That's where you're always going with the boxes of cookies you pick up here? He nods. I just stare at him. I'm realizing there are more layers to Gavin Keys than I'd ever appreciated. It makes me wonder what else I'm missing. You do art? I ask finally. He looks away and doesn't answer. Look, I know this thing with your grandmother. It's probably a lot to take in. And I may be totally off base here, but you know, some people who escaped before they were sent to concentration camps were snuck out of Europe with false papers that identified them as Christians, he says. Is it possible your grandmother could have come here under an assumed identity? I shake my head immediately. No, no way. She would have told us. But I realize suddenly... This could explain why everyone on the list she gave us had the last name Picard, while I'd always believed her maiden name to be Durand. Gavin scratches his head. Annie's right, Hope. You have to find out what happened to your grandmother. We talk for another hour, Gavin patiently explaining all the things I don't understand. If Mamie is indeed from a Jewish family in Paris, I ask, why can't I just call the synagogues in Paris? Or aren't there Holocaust organizations that help you track down survivors? I'm sure I've heard of places like that, although I've never had a reason to look into them before. 
Gavin explains that it's worth trying Holocaust organizations as a first step, but he thinks it's unlikely I'll find all my answers there. At most, even if I can find the names on a list somewhere, I'll only get a date and a place of birth, maybe a date of deportation, and if I'm lucky, the name of a camp where they were taken. But that won't tell you the whole story, he adds, and I think your grandmother deserves to know what really became of the people she loved. If she even is who you're saying she is, I interject. I think this sounds crazy. Gavin nods. I don't blame you, but you have to go find out. I'm not convinced, and I look away as he explains that the synagogues might have better records, that they might be able to point me to other survivors who remember the Picard family. Besides, he says, even though the Holocaust happened 70 years ago, some of the record keepers are reluctant to give out information over the phone. While there had been many efforts made over the years to open things up, for many of the people who'd been alive during the war, giving away names was like giving away lives. Plus, Gavin concludes, your grandmother obviously wants you to go to Paris. There must be a reason. But what if there isn't a reason at all? I ask in a small voice. She's sick, Gavin. Her memory's gone. Gavin shakes his head. My grandpa had Alzheimer's too, he says. It's awful, I know. But I remember his moments of clarity, especially about the past. And from what you said... It sounds like your grandmother was completely lucid when she gave you the names. I know, I admit finally. I know. By the time I lock up and we walk out, daylight is waning, the blue of the sky starting to deepen. I shiver as I pull my denim jacket a little tighter around me. You okay? Gavin asks, pausing before he turns to the left. I can see his jeep parked along Main about a block down. I nod. Yeah, thanks for everything. It's a lot to take in, he says, if it's true. He adds as an afterthought, and I know the words are for my benefit, not his. I nod again. I feel numb as if the things he explained to me this afternoon completely overloaded my system. I simply can't bring myself to believe that my grandmother has a past she's never spoken of. But I have to admit that everything he said made sense. That chills me to the bone. Well, Gavin says, and I realize I've been standing on the street, staring blankly into space. I shake my head, force a smile, and stick out my hand. Listen, thank you again, so much. Gavin looks surprised by my extended hand, but he shakes it after a moment and says, My pleasure. His hand is calloused and warm, and it takes me an instant longer than it should to let go. I hope you enjoy those cookies, I say nodding to the box in his left hand. He smiles. They're not for me, he says. I feel suddenly awkward. Well, take care, I say. Take care, he repeats. And as I watch him walk away, a sense of loss rolls in from nowhere. Chapter 9 I toss and turn all night, and when I do fall asleep, I have nightmares of people being rounded up in the streets, right outside my bakery, and marched off toward train cars. In my dream, I'm running through the crowd, trying to find Mamie, but she's not there. I awake in a cold sweat at 2.30 in the morning, and although I don't normally leave for work until 3.45, I get out of bed anyhow, pull on some clothes, and head out into the crisp air. I know I won't be able to sleep another wink. 
The tide must be low, because as I walk to my car, I can smell the muddy salt from the bay two blocks away. In the stillness of the early morning, I can hear the faint sound of waves rolling into shore. Before I get into the driver's seat, I stand there for a moment, breathing in and out. I've always loved the smell of salt water. It reminds me of my childhood, when my grandfather would come over after a day of fishing, the scent of the sea still on his skin, and swing me high into the air. Who's my favorite girl in the world? He'd ask while he flew me, Supergirl style, around the room. Me! I would reply with a giggle, delighted anew each time. I'd already figured out, even at that age, that my mother could be cold and moody, and my grandmother terribly reserved, but my grandfather smothered me in kisses, read me bedtime stories, taught me how to fish and play baseball, and called me his best pal. I find myself missing him terribly as I start my car engine. He'd know what to do about Mamie. I wonder suddenly whether he knew the secrets that she kept. If so, he'd never let on. I'd always thought that they had a decent marriage, but can a relationship really survive if there are lies wrapped around its roots? It's a few minutes past three by the time I walk into the bakery. I mechanically pull out yesterday's frozen muffins, cookies, and cupcakes, which will go into the bakery cases once they're defrosted. Then I sit down to spend an hour online before I need to start the day's baking. I log on to my email, and I'm startled to see a message from Gavin sent to the bakery's online orders address just past midnight. I click to open it. Hey, Hope, thought I'd send you the links to the organizations I told you about, www.yadvashem.org and www.jewishgen.org, are the best places to start your search. Then you might want to try the Memorial de la Shoah, the Holocaust Memorial in Paris. They have good records for French victims of the Holocaust, I think. Let me know if I can help. Good luck, Gavin. I pause and take a deep breath, bracing myself. Then I click on the first link, which takes me to a database of Holocaust victims' names. Below the search box, it's explained that the database includes records of half of the six million Jews murdered during World War II. My stomach lurches suddenly. I've heard the figure before, but it now feels more personal. Six million? My God! I remind myself that Gavin's probably wrong about Mamie anyhow. He has to be. The text on the main page also explains that millions of victims remain unidentified. I wonder how this can be the case seven decades later. How can so many people be lost forever? I take a deep breath, enter Picard and Paris, and click search. Eighteen results are returned, and my heart pounds as I scan the list. None of the first names match the names Mamie gave me, and I don't know whether to be relieved or disappointed about that. But there's an Annie on the list, which makes me feel suddenly ill. I click on her name, not realizing until I do so that my hand is trembling. I read the scant text. The girl was born in December 1934, it says. She lived in Paris and Marseille and died on July 20th, 1943, at Auschwitz. I do the math quickly. She didn't even live to see her ninth birthday. I think about my Annie. On her ninth birthday, Rob and I took her and three friends into Boston for an afternoon tea party at the Park Plaza. 
They dressed up like princesses and giggled about the little tea sandwiches with the crust cut off. The picture I took of Annie, in her pale pink dress, her hair long and loose as she blew out the candle atop a pink cupcake, is still one of my favorites. But little Annie Picard from Paris never had a ninth birthday party. She didn't become a teenager, fight with her mother about makeup, worry about homework, fall in love, or live long enough to figure out who she really wanted to be. I realize suddenly that I'm crying. I'm not sure when I started. I quickly close the page, wipe my eyes, and walk away. It takes 15 minutes of pacing the kitchen before the tears stop. I spend another 30 minutes clicking around the first site Gavin sent me, horrified by nearly everything I find. I remember reading Anne Frank's diary in school and studying the Holocaust in history classes, but there's something about reading about it as an adult that has a completely different impact. The staggering numbers and facts swim before my eyes— 200,000 Jews lived in Paris in 1939 when war broke out. Of those, 50,000 perished. The Nazis began arresting Parisian Jews in May 1941, when they rounded up 3,700 men and sent them to internment camps. In June 1942, all Jews in Paris were made to wear yellow stars of David, marked with Juif, the French word for Jew. A month later, on July 16, 1942, there was a massive roundup of 12,000 Jews, mostly foreign-born, who were taken to a stadium called the Velodrome d'Hiver, then deported to Auschwitz. By 1943, the Nazis were going into orphanages, retirement homes, and hospitals, arresting those who were the most defenseless. The thought makes my stomach lurch. I enter Picard into the second database Gavin sent me. I find three surviving Picards listed in a Munich newspaper, and three others, including another Annie Picard, listed as survivors living in Italy. There are three Picards listed in the death book of the Mauthausen concentration camp in Austria, another 11 listed at Dachau in Germany. There are 37 Picards on a list of 7,346 French female deportees who perished. I find the eight-year-old Annie Picard again on this list, and the tears return. My sight is so blurred that I almost don't notice when two familiar names come up on the screen. Cecile Picard, the second name on Mamie's list, and Danielle Picard, the last. Heart thudding, I read the details listed for the first name. Cecile Picard, born Cecile Paczynski on May 30th, 1901, in Krakow, Poland, from Paris, France, deported to Auschwitz, 1942, died autumn, 1942. I swallow hard a few times. Cecile Picard would have been 41 when she died, just five years older than I am now. Mamie, I know, was born in 1925, so she would have been 17 in 1942. Could Cecile have been her mother? My great-grandmother? If that's true, how is it that we've never spoken of this before? I blink a few times as I read the details of Danielle. My heart catches in my throat. Danielle Picard, born April 4th, 1937, from Paris, France, deported to Auschwitz, died 1942. She was only five. I close my eyes and try to breathe evenly again. 
After a moment, I Google the third organization Gavin suggested, the Memorial de la Shoah. I click on the link and enter the first name on Mamie's list, Albert Picard, into the search box. My eyes widen as I find him. Monsieur Albert Picard, né la 2603-1897. Deporté à Auschwitz par la convoi en 58 au départ de Drancy le 31-07-1942, de profession médecine. I quickly cut and paste the entry into an online translator and stare at the results. Albert Picard, born March 26, 1897. Deported to Auschwitz in convoy number 58 from Drancy on July 31, 1942. He was a doctor. Num, I enter the other family names. It doesn't say what happened to them, only the dates of their deportations. They'd all been taken to Auschwitz in convoys 57 or 58 in late July 1942. I find all of the names except Alan, who, according to Mamie's list, would have been eleven when it appeared his whole family was taken away. I stare at the screen, puzzled. I check my watch. It's 5.30 in the morning here. France is six hours ahead of us, so it's likely that there will be someone at the memorial's offices now. I take a deep breath try not to think of my phone bill, and dial the number on the screen. On the sixth ring, a machine answers in French. I hang up and redial, but once again, a machine picks up. I look at my watch again. They should be open by now. I dial a third time, and after a few rings, a woman answers in French. Hello, I say, exhaling in relief. I'm calling from America, and I'm sorry, but I don't really speak French. The woman switches immediately to heavily accented English. We are closed, she says. It is Saturday. We close every Saturday, for the Sabbath. I'm here completing some research. Oh, I say, my heart sinking. I'm sorry I didn't realize. I pause and ask in a small voice, Is it possible to answer a question for me quickly? It is not our policy. Her tone is firm. Please, I say in a small voice, I'm trying to find someone. Please. She is silent for a moment, and then she sighs. Fine, quickly. I hastily explain that I'm looking for people who may be my grandmother's family and that I found some of their names, but I'm missing one. She sighs again and tells me that the memorial has some of the best records in Europe because the deportations were recorded meticulously by the French police who carried them out. Through Europe, she says, half of the records are missing, but in France, we know the names of almost every person deported from our country. But how can I find out what happened to them after the deportations? I ask. In many cases you cannot, I'm afraid, she says. May, well, in certain cases you can. We have here the written records, the census documents, and some other things— some of the deportation cards have notes on them about what happened to the people. What about finding Alan, the name that's not in your database? That is more difficult, she says. If he was not deported, we would not have a record of him. But you can feel welcome to come here and look through our records. There's a librarian who will help you. Maybe you will find him. Come to Paris? I ask. Oui, she says. It is the only way. Thank you, I murmur. Merci beaucoup. De rien, she replies. 
Maybe we will see you soon. I hesitate for only a moment. Maybe you will see me soon. I'm so shaken by the results of the search and by the conversation with the woman at the memorial that I'm late in getting the star pies in the oven and the almond rose tarts prepped. This is very unlike me. Sticking rigidly to the morning schedule is what keeps me sane most days. So when the alarm clock in the kitchen goes off, alerting me to the fact that it's 6 a.m. and time to unlock the front door, I'm in an uncharacteristic state of disarray. I hurry out front and am surprised to see Gavin patiently standing outside. When he sees me through the glass, he smiles and raises a hand in greeting. I unlock the door. Why didn't you knock? I ask as I push it open toward him. I would have let you in. He follows me inside and watches as I flip the switch on the open sign. I haven't been here long, he says. Besides, you open at six. Didn't seem right to bother you before that. I gesture for him to follow me. I have pies in the oven. Sorry, I'm running a little late this morning. Coffee? Sure, he says. He pauses at the counter and I gesture again for him to follow me back into the kitchen. Can I do anything to help? He asks, rolling up his sleeves like he's already prepared to dive in. I shake my head and smile. No, I'm okay, I say, unless you can turn back time so that I'm running on schedule. I grind a cup of coffee beans and am surprised to turn around and see Gavin filling the coffee maker with water and lining the basket with a filter, as if he's entirely at home here. Thanks, I say. Rough morning? He asks. Weird morning. I got your email. Thanks. Did it help? I nod. I spent some time on those sites. And? And I found all but one of the names on my grandmother's list. I pour the coffee grinds into the filter, and Gavin flicks the switch to brew. We're silent for a moment as the coffee begins to gurgle and spit. I couldn't find Alan, but the others, they were all deported in 1942. The youngest one was five. The mother wasn't much older than I am now. I inhale deeply and feel my chest tremble as I do. I'm still not convinced they're my grandmother's family. How come? I feel suddenly embarrassed and avoid his eye. I don't know. It would change everything. What would it change? Who my grandmother is? I say. Not really, he says. It changes who I am, I add in a small voice. Does it? It makes me half Jewish, or a quarter Jewish, I guess. No, Gavin says. It would just mean you've had that piece of her past in you all along. It would mean you've always been a quarter Jewish. It wouldn't change anything about who you really are. I suddenly feel like I'm talking to a therapist, and I don't like it. Never mind, I say. The coffee pot is only half full, but I reach out abruptly to pour Gavin a cup as I change the subject. You're earlier than usual this morning. I realize as soon as the words come out of my mouth that it sounds like I'm keeping track of him. My cheeks heat up, but Gavin doesn't seem to notice. I couldn't sleep, and I wanted to see how your search was going. I nod and take this in as I pour a cup of coffee for myself. Are you going to Paris? Gavin asks. Gavin, I can't. The timer on the oven goes off, and I can feel Gavin watching me as I slip oven mitts on and remove two trays of star pies. 
I set the temperature 50 degrees lower for the croissants I've already rolled out and shaped, and I head out to the front of the bakery to see whether anyone has come in without me hearing the door chimes. The shop is empty. Gavin waits until I've slid the croissants into the oven before he speaks again. Why can't you go? he asks. I bite my lip. I can't afford to close the bakery. Gavin takes this in, and I sneak a glance at him to see if there's judgment on his face. There isn't. Okay, he says slowly. I realize he hasn't asked why, and I'm glad. I don't want to have to explain my situation to anyone. Can't someone run it for you for a few days? He asks after a moment. I laugh and realize the sound is bitter. Who? Annie's not even old enough technically to work here. I don't have enough money to hire someone. Gavin looks thoughtful. I'm sure you have friends who can step in. No, I say. I don't. Yet another one of my many failures in life, I add in my head. We're interrupted by the front door chime, and I head out to help my first customer of the day. It's Marcy Gagolski, who's been running the town's library since I was a little girl. As I pour her a cup of coffee in a to-go cup and package a blueberry muffin, her usual, I hope Gavin stays in the kitchen. I know how it will look to her if he's in back with me, and I don't like anyone in town making assumptions about my personal life. As much as I love it here, this town is as gossipy as a high school. The timer on the oven goes off just as I'm ringing Marcy up, and I hurry back to the kitchen after she leaves, afraid that I've slightly overdone the croissants. I'm surprised to see Gavin setting the tray of croissants gently on a cooling rack. Thanks, I say. He nods and slips the potholders off. I have to get going, he says, but you're wrong. About what? I ask, because if I'm going to be honest with myself, I'm sure I'm wrong about lots of things. About not having friends, he says. You have me. I don't know what to say, so I don't say anything. My heart is suddenly racing, though, and I can feel heat rising to my cheeks. I know you think I'm just the guy who fixes pipes and stuff, he adds after a moment. I can feel my face heat up. I'm a mess, I say finally. Why would you want to be my friend? For the same reason anyone wants to be anyone's friend? Gavin says, because I like you. I stare after him as he disappears out the front door. Annie is miraculously pleasant when she arrives in the afternoon. She's in such a seemingly good mood that I don't bring up the internet search I did or my conflicted thoughts about Paris because I can't bear the thought of another argument. She's heading back to her father's for the evening, and as we wash dishes side by side in the kitchen after closing, she breaks our companionable silence with a question. So, are you like dating Matt Hines or something? She asks. I shake my head vigorously. No, absolutely not. Annie looks skeptical. I don't think he knows that. Why do you say that? The way he looks at you, she says, and talks to you, all possessive-like, like you're his girlfriend. I roll my eyes. Well, I'm sure he'll figure out that I'm not. How come you never, like, date? Annie asks after a pause. From the way she's staring into the sink instead of meeting my eye, I get the sense that she's uncomfortable with the conversation. I wonder why she's bringing it up. Your dad and I haven't been divorced for that long, I reply after a moment. Annie gives me a strange look. So what, you want to get back together with dad or something? No, 
I say instantly, because that's not it at all. No, I think it's just that I didn't expect to be single again. Besides, you're my priority now, Annie. I pause and ask, why? No reason, Annie says quickly. She's silent for a moment. I know her well enough to know that if I don't press her, she'll say what's on her mind, or at least a version of it. It's just weird is all. What's weird? That you don't have a boyfriend or anything. I don't think it's weird, Annie, I say. Not everyone has to be in a couple. I don't want Annie growing up to be one of those girls who feels incomplete without a relationship. It hasn't occurred to me before this moment that those kinds of thoughts might be swirling in her head. Dad's in a couple, she mumbles. Again, she's staring straight into the sink, and I'm not sure what hurts me more initially, the sudden realization that Rob has moved on from me so quickly, or the fact that it's clearly bothering Annie. Either way, I feel like someone has punched me in the gut. Is he? I ask as evenly as possible. And what do you think about that? It's fine. I don't say anything, waiting for her to go on. She breaks the silence again. She's around all the time, you know, his girlfriend, or whatever. You haven't mentioned her before. Annie shrugs and mumbles, I thought it would make you feel bad. I blink a few times. You don't have to worry about that, Annie. You can tell me anything. She nods, and I can see her looking at me sideways. I pretend to be absorbed in the dishwashing. So what's her name? I ask casually. Sunshine? She mumbles. Sunshine? I stop what I'm doing and stare at her. Your dad's dating a woman named Sunshine? Annie cracks a smile for the first time. It's a pretty dumb name, she agrees. I snort and go back to washing off a baking tray. So do you like her? I ask carefully after a pause. Annie shrugs. She turns off her faucet, grabs a towel, and begins drying a stainless steel mixing bowl. I guess, she says. Is she nice to you? I try again because I feel like I'm missing something here. I guess, she repeats. Anyways, I'm glad you're not dating anyone, Mom. I nod and make an attempt at humor. Yeah, well, available men aren't exactly beating down the door. Annie looks confused, like she hasn't gotten the self-deprecating jab. Anyways, she says, it's better when we're a family, without strangers. I resist the urge to agree, which would be a selfish thing to do. But I'm supposed to do the right thing, aren't I? And the right thing here is to help her to understand that eventually, her father and I have to move on. We can still be a family, Annie, I say. Your dad having a girlfriend doesn't change how he feels about you. Annie narrows her eyes at me. Whatever. Sweetheart, your father and I both love you very much, I say. That'll never change. Whatever, she repeats. She places the mixing bowl in the drying rack. Can I go now? I have a lot of homework. I nod slowly and watch as she takes off her apron and hangs it carefully on the hook near the larger refrigerator. Sweetie, I venture, are you okay? She nods. She grabs her backpack and crosses the room to give me a quick, unexpected peck on the cheek. Love you, Mom, she says. I love you too, honey. You sure you're fine? Yes, Mom. Her annoyed tone has returned, and she rolls her eyes. She's gone before I can say anything more. I go to see Mamie that night, after I've closed the bakery. On the drive over, 
my insides are swimming with a mixture of trepidation, sadness, and dread that I can't quite understand. In the space of a year, I've become the divorced owner of a failing bakery whose daughter hates her. Now I might be Jewish, too. It's like I don't know who I am anymore. My grandmother is sitting at her window, gazing out to the east, when I let myself in. Oh, dear, she says, turning around. I did not hear you knock. Hi, Mamie, I say. I cross the room, kiss her on the cheek, and sit down beside her. Do you know who I am? I ask hesitantly, because this conversation will ride on how lucid she is. She blinks. Of course, dear, she says. You are my granddaughter, Hope. I sigh in relief. That's right. That is a silly question, she says. I sigh. You're right. Silly question. So, how are you, my dear? She asks. I'm okay, thanks, I say. I pause, struggling how to bring up the things I need to know. I'm just thinking about what you told me the other night, and I had some questions. The other night? Mamie asks. She tilts her head to the side and stares at me. About your family, I say gently. Something flickers in her eyes, and her gnarled fingers are suddenly in motion, kneading the tasseled ends of her scarf. At the beach the other night, I continue. She stares at me. We did not go to the beach. It is autumn. I take a deep breath. You asked Annie and me to take you. You told us some things. Mamie looks more confused. Annie? My daughter? I remind her. Your great-granddaughter? Of course I know who Annie is, she snaps. She looks away from me. I need to ask you something, Mamie, I say after a moment. It's very important. She's staring at the window again, and at first I don't think she's heard me. But finally, she says, Yes? Mamie? I say slowly, enunciating every syllable so that there's no chance of her misunderstanding. I need to know if you are Jewish. She whips her head toward me so quickly that I shift back in my seat, startled. Her eyes bore into mine, and she's shaking her head violently. Who told you that? She demands, her voice sharp and brittle. I'm surprised to feel my heart sink a little. As much trouble as I'm having believing in what Gavin has said, I realize I've been buying into the possibility. No one, I say. I just thought, if I were Jewish, I would be wearing the star. My grandmother goes on angrily. It is the law. You do not see the yellow star on me, do you? Do not make accusations you cannot prove. I am going to America to see my uncle. I stare at her. My face has turned pink, and her eyes are flashing. Mamie, it's me, I say gently. Hope. But she seems not to hear me. Do not harass me, or I will have you reported, she says. Just because I am alone does not mean you can take advantage of me. I shake my head. No, Mamie, I would never... She cuts me off. Now, if you will excuse me. I watch, open-mouthed, as she stands with surprising agility and walks quickly toward her bedroom. She slams the door. I stand up and take a step after her, but then I freeze. I don't know what to say or do. I feel terrible that I've made her upset. The violence of her response confuses me. After a moment, I follow after her and rap lightly on her door. I can hear her get up from the bed, the springs of her old mattress creaking in protest. 
She pulls open the door and smiles at me. Hello, dear, she says. I did not hear you come in. Forgive me. I was just reapplying my lipstick. Indeed, she has a fresh coat of burgundy on. I stare at her for a moment. Are you okay? I ask hesitantly. Of course, dear, she says brightly. I take a deep breath. She seems to have no recollection of her explosion just moments before. This time I reach for her hands. I need an answer. Mamie, look at me, I say. I'm your granddaughter, Hope. Remember? Of course I remember. Do not be foolish. I hold her hands tightly. Look, Mamie, I'm not going to hurt you. I love you very much, but I need to know if your family is Jewish. Her eyes flash again, but this time I hold on and make sure she doesn't look away. Mamie, it's me, I say. I feel her hands tighten around mine. I'm not trying to hurt you, but I need you to answer me. She stares at me for a moment, then pulls away. I follow her as she strides back to the window in the living room. I'm just beginning to think that she's forgotten my question when finally she speaks in a voice so soft it's almost a whisper. God is everywhere, my dear, she says. You cannot define him in any one religion. Do you know that? I put a hand on her back, and I'm heartened when she doesn't flinch. She's staring at the oyster sky as the blue seeps into the ground along the horizon. No matter what we think of God, she continues in the same soft, even tone. We all live under the same sky. I hesitate. The names you gave me, Mamie, I say softly. The Picards. Are they your family? Were they taken away during World War II? She doesn't answer. She continues to stare out the window. After a moment, I try again. Mamie, was your family Jewish? Are you Jewish? Yes, of course, she says, and I'm so startled at the immediacy of her reply that I take a step back. You are? I ask. She nods. Finally, she turns to look at me. Yes, I am Jewish, she says, but I am also Catholic, she pauses and adds, and Muslim too. My heart sinks. For a moment, I thought she was speaking with clarity. Mamie, what do you mean? I ask, trying to keep the tremor out of my voice. You're not Muslim. It is all the same, is it not? It is mankind that creates the differences. That does not mean it is not all the same God. She turns to look out the window again. The star, she murmurs after a moment, and I follow her gaze to the first pinprick of light against the sunset. I watch with her for a moment, trying to see what she sees, trying to understand what makes her sit at this window every night, searching for something she seems never to find. After a long while, she turns toward me and smiles. My daughter Josephine will come to visit one day soon, she tells me. You should meet her. You would like her. I shake my head and look down at the floor. I decide not to tell her that my mother has long since died. I'm sure I would, I murmur. I think I will rest, she says. She looks at me without a glint of recognition. Thank you for coming. I have enjoyed our visit. I will show you out now. Mamie, I try. No, no, she says. My Mamie does not live here. She lives in Paris, near the tower. 
but I will tell her you say hello. I open my mouth to reply, but no words come out. Mamie is herding me toward the door. I'm over the threshold, and the door has almost closed on me, when Mamie suddenly cracks it open once more and stares at me, long and hard. You must go to Paris, Hope, she says solemnly. You must. I am very tired now, and it is nearly time for me to sleep. And then the door is closed, and I'm staring at a characterless palette of pale blue paint. I stand there for so long, dumbstruck, that I don't even notice the nurse, Karen, approach me. Miss McKenna Smith, she says. I turn and look at her blankly. Are you okay, ma'am? she asks. I nod slowly. I think I'm going to Paris. Well, that's nice, Karen says hesitantly. She obviously thinks I've lost it, and I don't blame her. Um, when? As soon as I can, I tell her. I smile. I need to go. Okay, she says, still looking bewildered. I'm going to Paris, I repeat to myself. Chapter 10 Cape Cotter Cookies Ingredients 1 stick butter, softened 2 cups packed brown sugar 2 large eggs half teaspoon vanilla extract 2 tablespoons heavy cream 3 cups flour 2 teaspoons baking soda half teaspoon salt 1 cup dried cranberries 1 cup white chocolate chips Directions 1. Preheat oven to 375 degrees 2. In a large bowl, cream together butter and brown sugar using electric mixer. Beat in eggs, vanilla, and cream. 3. Sift together flour, baking soda, and salt, and add to the butter mixture, approximately one cup at a time. Beat just until combined. 4. Add cranberries and chocolate chips. Stir to distribute evenly. 5. Drop heaping teaspoons onto a greased cookie sheet with room to spread. Bake 10 to 13 minutes. Cool for 5 minutes on baking sheet, then move to a wire rack. Makes approximately 50 cookies. Rose The sunset that night was brighter than usual, and as Rose watched the eastern horizon, she thought about how the vivid illumination of the sky was one of God's most marvelous tricks. She remembered, with a clarity that surprised her, sitting at the window of her family's apartment on Rue de General Camus, watching the sun set in the west over the Champ de Mer. It had always seemed to her that the view at sundown was the most beautiful blend of the magic of God and the magic of man, a beautiful light show surrounding a glittering, mysterious tower of steel. She used to imagine that she was a princess in a castle, and that this light show was being put on just for her. She was sure that hers was the best window in the city, perhaps the best view in all the world. But that was back when she was still terribly proud of her country, proud to be Parisian. The Eiffel Tower seemed to be a symbol of everything that made her beloved city great. Later, she would hate what it stood for. She marveled at how quickly love and pride could transform into something dark and inescapable. Rose watched the Cape Cod sky flame orange and then fade to pink, and finally to the brilliant blue that made her feel at home, so far away here from the place where she'd begun her journey. 
Although the sunset itself looked different here than it did in Paris, a trick of the atmosphere, she supposed, the deep cerulean twilight was just the same as it had been all those years ago. It brought her comfort to know that while everything else in the world could change, the ending to God's light show remained eternally the same. Rose had the sense, as she sat at the window, that something important was happening. She was having trouble placing the feeling, though. It seemed that someone had told her something vital. But who? And when? She couldn't recall having any visitors. The doorbell rang, interrupting her wisps of thoughts, and with one last reluctant look at the North Star above the crest of the horizon, she moved slowly to her front door. She wondered when this body had begun to fail her. She could remember moving on her feet, light as air, graceful as a breeze. It felt like just yesterday. But now, her body felt to her like a sack of bones that she had to drag, with effort, everywhere she went. At the door, she found herself staring at the kind nurse, the one whose name she found impossible to remember. But she had a face that could be trusted, Rose knew. Hi, Rose, the nurse said in a gentle voice that reminded Rose that people here felt sorry for her. She didn't want their pity. She didn't deserve it. Are you coming down to dinner? The other three ladies at your table miss you in the dining room. Rose knew this wasn't true. She couldn't, for the life of her, remember the names or even the faces of the three women she ate three meals a day with. No, I will stay here, Rose told the nurse. Thank you. How about I bring you a tray in your room? The nurse asked. We're having meatloaf tonight. That would be fine, Rose said. The nurse hesitated. So you had a visit from your granddaughter today? Rose struggled to remember. Why, yes, I did, she said quickly, because the nurse seemed so sure of it, and of course she didn't want anyone to know that she was losing her memory. The nurse seemed encouraged by Rose's reply, and Rose, for a moment, felt a little guilty for deceiving her. How nice, the nurse said. She's been coming more often lately. That's wonderful. Yes, of course, Rose said, wondering when her granddaughter had been there. She supposed the nurse would have no reason to lie to her, and she felt a sudden, instant pang of regret that she could not bring to mind the visits. She would have loved to remember a visit with hope. The nurse patted Rose on the shoulder and continued in the same gentle voice. It sounds like she has an exciting trip planned, the nurse said. A trip? Mamie asked. Oh, yes, didn't she tell you? The nurse said, brightening. She's going to Paris. And suddenly, Rose remembered, Hope coming to see her. Annie's confusion when Rose handed Hope the list of names earlier in the week. The concern etched in Hope's face just this afternoon. She closed her eyes for a moment, the revelations washing over her, until she heard the nurse's voice, far away, calling her back. Rose? Mrs. McKenna? Are you all right? Rose forced her eyes open and feigned a smile. She had become skilled at faking happiness over the years. It was, she thought, a terrible talent to have. I am sorry, Rose said. I was just thinking about my granddaughter and her trip. The nurse looked relieved. Rose knew that the real explanation— that her mind was suddenly back in 1942, would frighten the woman, 
whose kind eyes gave away the fact that she never had to endure the kind of loss that shatters one's soul forever. Rose recognized that kind of loss in other people because she saw it in her own eyes every time she gazed at her reflection. The nurse left to go prepare a dinner tray, and Rose closed the door behind her and drifted to the window. She stared into the eastern sky, dotted with a sprinkling of twilight's first stars, but the sky looked different to her now than it had before. Beyond the darkness at the horizon, across the vast ocean, somewhere to the east, lay Paris, the city where it all began, the city where it would all end. Rose would never return there, but for the past to be completed, she knew that hope had to go. The end was coming, Rose knew. She felt it in her bones, just like she'd felt it that summer of 1942, before they came. When she'd arrived on American shores late that year, gliding into New York past the Statue of Liberty, she'd made herself a promise to put the past behind her forever. But the Alzheimer's nibbling at her brain, twisting her timeline, had brought it raging back, uninvited. Now, when Rose awoke each morning, she had trouble holding on to the present. Some days, she woke up in 1936, or 1940, or 1942 again. Things were as clear to her as if they'd just happened, and for scant, frozen moments in time, her life lay ahead of her, rather than behind. She imagined tucking them away in the beautiful jewelry box her own Mamie had given her for her thirteenth birthday, turning the lock and throwing the key into the endless depths of the Seine. But now that the present was blurred and uneven, it seemed that the beautiful box of memories, closed now for nearly seventy years, contained the only moments of clarity Rose could find in this life. She sometimes wondered whether the willful forgetting had, in fact, caused the recollections to survive entirely intact, the way that storing a document in an airtight, darkened container for years could keep it from disintegrating. To her surprise, Rose realized that she found comfort in the moments she'd hidden from for so many years. Slipping into the past was like watching a slow-motion picture show of the life she knew she would soon leave behind. And because of the gaps in her recollection, there were days when she could bask in the past without immediately feeling the crushing blow of its inevitable outcome. She loved seeing her mother, her father, her sisters, and her brothers in those brief journeys into the past. She loved feeling her Mamie's hand wrapped around hers. She loved hearing her baby sister's tinkling laughter. She loved breathing in the sweet, yeasty scent of her parents' bakery. Now she lived for the days when she could slip back in time and see the ones she had vowed never to speak of again. For that's where her heart remained. She had left it behind on those foreign shores so long ago. She knew now, as her own twilight closed in around her, that she was very wrong to have tried so hard to forget— for it was the key to who she was. But it was too late. She had left everything behind in that terrible, beautiful past, and there it would forever remain. Chapter 11 As I drive home in silence that night, my mind is spinning. I'm going to Paris. At the traffic light on Main, I pull out my cell phone and, before I can stop myself, dial Gavin's cell number. I let it ring once before I realize how foolish I'm being. 
I quickly hit end. Why would Gavin care that I'm going to Paris? He's been helpful, but I'm being presumptuous in assuming that my plans matter to him at all. The light turns green, and as I put my foot on the gas, my phone rings, startling me. I look at the caller ID and can feel my cheeks heating up as I realize it says Gavin Keys. Um, hello? I answer tentatively. Hope? His voice is deep and warm, and I'm annoyed at myself for feeling instantly comforted. Um, yeah, hi, I say. Did you just call? It was nothing. I can feel my cheeks grow even hotter. I don't even know why I was calling, I mumble. He's silent for a moment. Did you go see your grandmother? How did you know? I didn't. He pauses and adds, Are you going to Paris? I think so, I reply in a small voice. Good, he says immediately, as if he were expecting me to say this. Listen, if you need someone to help you keep the bakery open while you're gone. I cut him off. Gavin, that's so kind, but there's no way that would work. Why not? Well, for one thing, you've never run a bakery before, have you? I'm a quick learner. I smile. And besides, you have your own job. It wouldn't be a problem to take a few days off. If there are any emergencies, I can always take care of them after the bakery closes. I'm not accustomed to people caring, people helping me. It makes me uneasy, and I'm not sure how to reply. Thanks, I finally say, but I could never ask you to do that. Hope, you okay? Gavin asks. I'm okay, I tell him, but I'm pretty sure I'm lying. A week later, wondering whether I'm mad to be doing such a thing, I board an Aer Lingus flight from Boston to Paris via Dublin the cheapest flight I could find on such short notice. Annie was so thrilled that I decided to go that she didn't even give me a hard time about her having to spend a few extra days at her father's house. She'd asked to come along to Paris, of course, but she had seemed to understand when I told her that I could only afford one ticket. Besides, Mamie only asked you to go. Annie had mumbled, looking at her feet. Because she needs you here with her, I told my daughter. I decided to leave on a Saturday night so that I'd only have to close the bakery a total of three days. We're closed every Monday, anyhow. Still, it feels like an eternity to be gone, especially with the financial storm brewing. I don't know if and when the investors are coming to check out the bakery, because I haven't talked to Matt since I turned down his offer to loan me money. I know he was hurt, but I can't deal with that now. It's possible I'm making a huge mistake, but I know I couldn't refuse this trip. We have two orders to fill while I'm gone, both regular weekly orders for two hotels by the beach, and I'd reluctantly accepted Gavin's offer to drive Annie to deliver the muffins, which I'd baked in advance and frozen. She would need to defrost them before school on Monday morning, and after school, Gavin would take her to complete the deliveries and then drop her at Rob's house. Eleven hours after taking off from Boston and connecting through Dublin, I watch from the window as we break through the blanket of clouds covering the Paris sky and descend over the city. I can't make out any landmarks. I suppose I'll see them from the ground soon enough. But I can see the sapphire ribbon of the Seine River snaking across the terrain, as well as alternating patches of green grass and fiery-hued trees stretching across the countryside beyond the urban area. This was once Mamie's home, I think, as we come in for a landing. 
How strange it must have been to leave all of this behind, never to return. On the ground, I breeze through the tubular glass halls of Charles de Gaulle International, go through customs, and wait in line for taxis, which I'm surprised to realize are mostly luxury cars in France. I wait my turn, climb into a Mercedes, and hand the driver the address of the hotel I booked on Travelocity. I don't trust myself to correctly pronounce it aloud. It takes us 30 minutes to emerge from a series of industrial suburbs into the outskirts of Paris itself. We pass by a huge sports complex, and I'm struck suddenly by the recollection of what I'd read online about the massive roundup in 1942, where thousands of Jews were taken to a sports stadium before being deported to concentration camps. I doubt this is that stadium. It appears too modern, but the dark image stays with me as my driver weaves expertly around traffic, takes a harrowing left on a street called Rue de la Verrie, and screeches to a halt in front of a white building with big block letters, identifying it as the Hôtel de Mi Etoile. I look up at the wrought iron balconies surrounding French doors on the second floor and smile. Somehow, Paris is exactly as I'd pictured it. I also have the sense that in this neighborhood, at least, it hasn't changed much in the last century. It makes me wonder whether Mamie ever walked by this same building, marveled at these same balconies, wished she could see through the wispy curtains draping the same French doors. It's strange for me to think of her here, as a girl not much older than Annie. After checking in, I take a quick shower and throw on jeans, flat boots, and a sweater. Armed with directions from the concierge, I walk the few blocks toward Rue Jefferie Lasnier, where I know the Memorial de la Shoah is located. Paris in October is crisp and beautiful, I realize. I've never been here before, of course, so there's little to compare it against, but the streets seem quiet and peaceful. I'm fascinated by the way the old mixes with the new here. Cobblestone meets cement at some corners, and on others, stores selling electronics or high fashion inhabit buildings that look like they're hundreds of years old. Having spent most of my life in Massachusetts, I'm accustomed to history being naturally interwoven with modern life, but it feels different here, perhaps because the history is much older, or perhaps because there's so much more of it. I can smell baking bread and changing autumnal leaves and the faint odor of fire as I walk along, and I breathe in deeply because it's a blend I'm not used to. Little arched doorways, bicycles propped against stone walls, and nearly hidden gated gardens remind me that I'm in a place foreign to me. But there's something about Paris that feels very familiar. I wonder for the first time if a sense of place can be passed down through the blood. I dismiss the thought, but despite the fact that the streets are unfamiliar and winding, I easily find my way to the Holocaust Museum. After going through a metal detector outside the stout, somber building, I cross through an open-air, gray courtyard past a monument with the names of the concentration camps, beneath a metal star of David, and enter the museum through the doors ahead. The woman at the front desk, who fortunately speaks English, suggests that I first try the computers opposite the desk, which are the first stop for guests seeking family members. On those two, as expected, I find the same information I found on the Internet— the names on my grandmother's list, minus Alan. 
I return to the desk and explain to the woman that I'm looking for a person whose name doesn't appear in the records and for information about what actually happened to the people whose names I have found. She nods and directs me to the elevator down the hall. Take that to the first level, she says. There you will find a reading room. Ask at the desk for help. I nod, thank her, and follow her directions upstairs. The reading room is home to computers and long tables on the lower level and rows of books and files on the second level, beneath a high ceiling that lets light pour in. I approach the desk, where a woman greets me in French and switches to English as soon as I ask, Can you help me find some people, please? Of course, madame, she says. How can I help you? I give her the names from Mamie's list, along with their years of birth, and I explain that I can't locate Alan. She nods and disappears for a few minutes. She returns with several pages of loose records. Here is all we have on these people, she says. Like you said, we cannot find Alan on any list of the deported. What could that mean? I ask. There could be many reasons for this. As complete as our records are, there are occasionally people who have not been properly recorded, especially children. They were lost in the chaos. She hands me the document she has, and I sit down to read over them. For the next few minutes, I try to read the notations, some handwritten, some typed, all of them in French. It's not until I flip to the third document she's given me, a census page, that my eyes widen. There, in titled handwriting, on a list stamped with the word recensement, is a 1936 listing of the Picard family of Paris, and among their children is a daughter, Rose, born 1925. As caught up as I'd been in finding out the fate of the names on Mamie's list, and as much as I'd begun to believe that they were indeed her family, it's not until I see my grandmother's first name and her birth year scrawled in indelible ink that it finally sinks in. My heart pounds as I stare at the page. I read over the scant details. It appears that, like the deportation information I'd found online said, the man who may be Mamie's father, Albert, was a doctor. His femme... His wife, Cecile, is listed sans profession. She must have stayed home with the children. The fils and fille, including Rose, are listed, all but Danielle, the youngest, who wasn't born until 1937, the year after the census. Alan's name is on the list, too. He was just as real as the rest of them. I go through all the documents, which takes me a long time to read, both because my eyes keep tearing up and because I need to keep referring to the English-French dictionary I've brought with me. At the end, I'm no closer to finding out what happened to Alan than I was before, nor am I any closer to finding out what happened after the family was deported. None of the copies of deportation documents are annotated with any additional information. The last record of everyone in the family, except for Rose and Alan, for whom no records exist, is that they were all deported on convoys bound for Auschwitz. I take the documents back to the desk, where the woman who had helped me earlier looks up and smiles at me. Did you have luck? I nod and feel my eyes fill with tears. I think it's my grandmother's family, I say softly, but I can't tell what happened to them after they were deported. She nods solemnly. Of the 76,000 taken in France, only 2,000 survived. 
It is very likely that they perished, madame. I am sorry. I nod, and it's not until I draw in a deep breath that I realize I'm trembling. Did you find the name you were looking for? She asks after a moment. I shake my head. Only on the census form. There's no record of an Alan Picard being arrested or deported. She chews on her lip for a moment. Alors, there is another person here who might be able to help you. She is a researcher, and she speaks some English. Let me see if she is available. After a few brief phone calls in French, she tells me that Carol, from the research library, will help me in thirty minutes. She suggests waiting in the museum itself, where I'm welcome to browse the permanent exhibition. I walk down the stairs into the nearly deserted exhibit hall and am immediately struck by the number of photographs and documents lining the long, narrow room. In the middle of the room, a big screen plays a film in French, and as I listen to a man's voice talking about what I assume is the Holocaust, I drift to the first wall on the left and am heartened to realize that all the exhibits are captioned in English as well as French. At the end of the room, an eerie image of train tracks to nowhere is projected on a big blank wall, and I'm reminded of the dream I had just after Mamie gave me the list. For a half hour, I'm lost in my own thoughts as I read testimony after testimony of the beginning of the war, the loss of Jewish rights in France and across Europe, and about the first deportations out of the country. Not only did these things happen in my grandmother's lifetime, but they may very well have happened to the people she loved most in the world. I close my eyes and realize I'm breathing hard. My heart is still thudding double time in my chest when I hear a woman's voice in front of me. Madame McKenna Smith. I snap my eyes open. The woman standing there is about my age, with brown hair pulled into a bun and blue eyes rimmed with expression lines. She's wearing dark jeans and a white blouse. Yes, that's me, I say. I hastily add, sorry, I mean, oui, madame. She smiles. It is all right. I speak some English. I am Carol Didot. Would you like to come with me? I nod and follow her through the rest of the exhibit, where we walk briskly past another series of videos and more walls full of documents and information. She leads me out through a hall filled with photos of children. They go on as far as the eye can see. I stop and lean forward to read one of the captions at eye level. Rachel Founier, 1937-1942, it reads. In the photograph, a dark-haired little girl grins into the camera, her hair done up in pigtails tied with ribbons. She's clutching a big rubber ball and smiling directly at the camera. These are the French children whose lives were lost, Carol says softly. My God, I murmur. This hall hits me even harder than the chilling photographs of death I'd seen in the other room. As I gaze dazedly at the photos, I can't help but think of my own daughter. Had fate placed us in a different country, in a different time, she could have been one of these little girls on the wall. Nearly 11,000 children from France died in the Shoah, Carol said, reading my expression. This hall always reminds me of all that could have been and never was. Her words ring in my ears, and I follow her to an elevator, where she pushes the button for the fourth floor. We ride up in silence as I think about Mamie's family and all that was lost. 
Carol leads me into a modern office with two chairs facing a desk piled high in books and papers. Out the window, I can see a church tower over a series of apartments, and on the wall are pictures drawn by children that say Mama. Carol gestures to one of the chairs and takes a seat behind her computer. So, what makes you come all the way to Paris? She asks as she jiggles her mouse and hits a few keys on her keyboard. I briefly tell her Mamie's story and that I think the names she's given me were family members who'd been lost in the Holocaust. I explain that I found all but Alan, for whom no record seemed to exist. I also explain that I can't figure out what happened to my grandmother. There's no record of a Rose Picard in the deportation documents either. But your grandmother, you say she escaped Paris before arrest, no? Carol asks. I nod. Yes, I mean, I think so. She's never explained, and now she has Alzheimer's. Carol shakes her head. So the past, it is nearly lost for her. I nod. I just want to know what happened. She wanted me to find out what became of her family. If I go home without an answer about Alan, I'm afraid it will break her heart. I am sorry we cannot be more help, but if he is not in the records, he is not in the records. My heart sinks. So that's it? I ask in a small voice. I may never find out what happened to him? Carol hesitates. There is one more chance, she says. There is? There is a man, she says, but her voice trails off and she doesn't finish her thought. Instead, she flips through an old-fashioned Rolodex, pauses, and picks up her handset to dial a number. After a moment, she says something in rapid French, glances at me, says something else, and then hangs up. Voilà, she says. She jots something down on a piece of paper. Take this. I take a piece of paper from her and glance down to see a name, an address, and a series of four numbers in the letter A. This is Olivier Baer, she says. She smiles slightly. He is a legend. I look at her questioningly. He has 93 years, she goes on. He is a survivor of the Shoah, and he has made it his life's work to make a listing of all the Jewish people of Paris who were lost and all those who returned. I stare in disbelief. His lists are different than yours? Oui, she replies. They are from the people themselves, the people who were in the camps, the people who came to the synagogues after the war, the people who walk around still with the scars of loss. Our records are the official ones. His records are the verbal ones, which sometimes are more revealing. Olivier Bear, I repeat softly. He says you may come now. The number there is the code to his front door. He says to come in. I nod, my heart thudding. How do I get there? She gives me walking directions, explaining that it may take less time to go there by foot than to find a taxi. Plus, you will see the Louvre and cross the Seine at the Pont des Arts, she says. You should see some of Paris on your mission. I smile at this, suddenly aware that I haven't even bothered to look for the Eiffel Tower yet. Thank you, I say. I stand, not sure whether to feel disappointed about the lack of records here or hopeful because this Olivier Bear might be able to help. Bon chance.
Carol says with a smile. She reaches out to shake my hand. Good luck, she says, looking me in the eye. Carol Didot's walking directions take me through a few side streets onto the crowded Rue de Rivoli. I pass the Gothic facade of the Hotel de Ville on my left and continue down a strip of storefronts, H&M, Zara, Celio, Etem, that would be at home on Newberry Street in Boston. Several French flags whisper in the breeze, their crisp red, white, and blue blocks of color saluting as I walk by. The few trees that dot the sidewalk have blushed deep red with the coming of autumn and have begun to drop their leaves on the sidewalks, where a steady stampede of people tramples them. I do as Carol directed and turn left just as I begin passing the enormous Louvre Museum on my left. I emerge into a sprawling square surrounded on all four sides by the walls of the museum itself, and for a moment I stop in my tracks, breathless. I don't know much of the history of France, but I remember reading that the Louvre used to be a palace, and as I look around me, I can almost imagine a 17th century monarch striding through the square, trailed by his attendants. Emerging on the other side, I see the pedestrian bridge Carol told me about. She had explained that the rails of the bridge are lined with padlocks, put there by lovers to declare the sealing of their relationships. It's a romantic thought— but I know that, padlock or not, relationships are temporary, even when you believe in them with all your heart. I look to the right as I cross the bridge and smile to see the tip of the Eiffel Tower soaring over rooftops in the distance on the other side of the river. I've seen it in photographs a thousand times, but seeing it in person for the first time reminds me that I'm really, truly here, thousands of miles away, across an ocean from home. I miss Annie terribly at that moment. It's not until I'm halfway across the wooden bridge that I'm struck with a sudden sense of deja vu, as if I've been here before. It takes me a moment to realize why. And when I do, I stop in my track so abruptly that the woman behind me runs directly into me. She mumbles something in French, shoots me a withering glance, and makes an exaggerated, wide loop around me. I ignore her and turn in a slow circle, my eyes wide. To the right, beyond the glittering Seine, the tip of the Eiffel Tower slices through the blue of the sky in the distance. Behind me, the Louvre Museum looms, palatial and enormous, on the river's bank. To my left, I can see an island connected to two bridges. I quickly count the arches, seven on the left bridge, five on the right bridge and ahead, the building Carol had called the Institut de France, looks a lot like a second palace, as if it and the Louvre were once halves of the same royal kingdom. My heart pounds, and I can hear Mamie's voice in my ears, telling me the fairy tale she repeated so often that I knew it by heart by the time I was Annie's age. Every day, the prince walked across the wooden bridge of love to see his princess. The great palace lay behind him, and ahead of him was a domed castle at the entrance to the prince's kingdom. He had to cross a great moat to get his one true love, and to his left, there were two bridges leading to the heart of the city, one with seven arches and one with five. To his right, 
A giant sword cut through the sky, warning him of the dangers that lay ahead. Still, he came each day and braves that danger because he loves a princess. He said that all the danger in the world could not keep him away from her. Every day, the princess sat at her window and listened for his footsteps, because she knew he would never disappoint her. He loved her, and when he promised he would come for her, he always kept his word. I'd always thought that Mamie's stories were simply fairy tales she'd heard as a little girl, but for the first time. I find myself wondering whether she'd made them up herself and set them in her beloved Paris. I shake my head and begin walking again, but my knees feel wobbly beneath me. I imagine my grandmother as a teenage girl, walking across this same bridge, taking in the same buildings, the same current beneath her, imagining that a prince was coming for her one day. Had her footsteps fallen where mine fall now, in this very same place, some seventy years earlier? Had she stood on this bridge and looked for the stars to appear to the east, over the island in the middle of the Seine, the way she waits for them to appear now from her window each night? Had she regretted leaving it behind forever? As I walk on. I think of my favorite of her tales, the one in which the prince tells the princess that as long as there are stars in the sky, he will love her. One day, the prince said to the princess, "I will take you across a great sea to see a queen whose torch illuminates the world." Keeping all of her subjects safe and free. When I was a girl, I used to cling to those words, to imagine that one day I too would find a prince who would rescue me from my mother's coldness. I used to imagine climbing on this prince's white horse with him, because, of course, in my imagination, the prince had a white horse. And going away forever to that fairy tale kingdom with the queen who kept everyone safe. But now I'm thirty-six, and I know better. There are no dashing heroic princes waiting to save me. There's no magical queen to protect me. In the end, you can only rely on yourself. I wonder how old Mamie was when she learned those same truths. Suddenly, although I have the sense I'm being cradled by my grandmother's past, I feel more alone than ever. Rue Visconti is dark and narrow, more a long alleyway than a proper street. The sidewalks are slender ribbons on each side, and a long bicycle propped against a black doorway makes me think of an old-fashioned postcard. I pass a few storefronts and make my way down nearly to the end, where I finally see number twenty-four, a pair of huge black double doors under an arch. I enter the code Carol gave me, four eight a five one, on the keypad to the right, and when the door buzzes, I push it inward. When I make it from the cool darkness of the arched courtyard up to the second floor of the building, the door is already open. I rap lightly against the door frame, anyhow, and from the depths of the apartment, a deep, froggy voice calls, "Entre vous, entre vous, madame." I walk in, close the door tightly behind me. And make my way through a narrow hallway lined by bookcases, all of which are overflowing with old leather-bound volumes. I emerge into a sunlit room where I see a white-haired, stoop-shouldered man standing near the window, 
gazing out at the street below. He turns as I enter, and I'm surprised at how lined his face is. It appears as if he's lived through hundreds of years of history instead of just the 93 years Carol Didot had promised. I approach to shake his hand, and he looks at me oddly. Ah, an American, are the first words he says to me. He smiles then, and I'm struck by how bright his green eyes seem. They're the eyes of a young man and appear out of place housed in his sunken features. Madame Didot did not tell me you are American. In Paris, we greet with deux bisous, two kisses on the cheek, my dear. He demonstrates, leaning forward to kiss me lightly on each cheek. I can feel myself blushing. I'm sorry, I mumble. There is nothing to be sorry about, he says. Your American customs are quite charming. He gestures to a small table with two wooden chairs, which is situated near the window. Come, seat, he says. He waits until I'm seated, offers me a cup of tea, and when I decline, he sits down with me. I am Olivier Baer. I'm Hope McKenna Smith. Thank you for having me here on such short notice, I say slowly. I'm trying to be conscious of both his age and the fact that English isn't his first language. It is no trouble, he says. It is always a pleasure to have a visit from a pretty girl. He smiles and pats my hand. I understand you search for some information. I nod and take a deep breath. Yes, sir. My grandmother is from Paris. I just learned recently that her family may have died in the Holocaust. I think they were Jewish. He looks at me for a moment. You learned this only recently. Embarrassed, I struggle to explain. Well, she never spoke of it. You were raised in another religion. It is a statement, not a question. I nod. Catholicism. He nods slowly. That is not entirely unusual. Leaving the past behind in this manner. May, in her heart, I suspect, your grandmother may still consider herself juive. I tell him briefly what happened on Rosh Hashanah with the crusts of the star pie. He smiles. Judaism is not just a religion, but a state of the heart and of the soul. I suspect perhaps all religions are this way, for those who truly believe in them. He pauses. You have come here today for answers. Yes, sir. About what became of her family. Yes, sir. She'd never spoken of them before. Again, he nods knowingly. You have with you their names. Yes, I say. I pull out a copy of Mamie's list and hand it to him. As his clear eyes scan the page, I add quickly, But Alan, her brother, isn't in any Holocaust registry. He looks up and smiles. Ah, yes, but my registries are different. He stands, trembling a little on his feet, and then he gestures with a crooked finger. He moves slowly one foot in front of the other in a shuffle, toward the hallway lined with books. I was twenty years of age when the Second World War began, twenty-two years of age when they began taking us away, right from the streets of France. More than seventy-six thousand Juifs were taken from France, most never to return. I shake my head, suddenly mute. I was at Auschwitz, he continues, and suddenly he stops his slow shuffle to the hall, 
pausing as if the memory itself holds him back. After a moment, he moves again. More than 60,000 were sent there from France. Did you know? He stops speaking again for a moment, and then he coughs. After la liberation, I return to find everyone gone. All my friends, my neighbors. What about your family? I ask. All of them dead. His voice is flat. My wife, my son, mother, father, sisters, brother, aunts, uncles, cousins, grandparents, everyone. When I came home to Paris, I came home to nothing, to no one. I'm so sorry, I murmur. The enormity of it begins to hit me. I've never met a concentration camp survivor before, and as the images from the Memorial de la Shoah play themselves over again in my mind, I blink a few times, feeling numb. The atrocities in the pictures had actually happened to this kind man before me. I can feel tears in my eyes. I blink them away before he notices. He waves a hand, dismissing my words. It is the past. Not for you to be sorry about, mademoiselle. The world you live in today is very different, and I am glad. He shuffles a little farther and regards his wall of books solemnly. He touches a gnarled finger to one book spine, then another. The only place I knew to go when I returned was to the synagogue I had attended as a boy. But it had been destroyed. It was a shell, no longer a place. I'm frozen as I watch him scan the books. He pulls one out, reads something inside, and then returns it to the shelf. When I realized that the ones I loved were never coming home, I began to think about the great tragedy, not just of their deaths, but all of the loss of their legacies, he continues. For when you take away an entire family, and they all perish, who will tell their stories? No one, I murmur. Precisément. And when that occurs, it is as if their lives have been lost twice over. That is when I began creating my own records. He reaches for another book, and this time, his eyes light up and he smiles. He flips through a few pages and stops at one. He's silent for a moment as he reads. Your own records? I ask. He nods and shows me the page he stopped on. I see a cursive scrawl across neat, lined pages that are yellowed at the edges. My least of the lost, he smiles and adds, and of the found, and of the stories that go with them. I take a step back and look in awe at his bookshelves. All of these books are your lists? Yes. You compiled them yourself? I look around in disbelief. I filled my time in those early days, he says. It is how I stopped living in the sadness. I began visiting synagogues every day, looking at their records, talking to every person I could meet. But how did you put together so much information? To everyone I met, I asked them for the names of anyone they knew who had been lost and anyone they knew who had survived. Family, friends, neighbors, it did not matter. No piece of information was small or insignificant. Each one represented a life lost or a life saved. Over the years, I have written and rewritten their memories, organized them into volumes, 
followed the lead they gave me and sought out the people who survived. My God, I murmur. Each person who survived a camp, he continues, has many stories to tell. Those people are often the key to who was lost and how. For others, the only key we have is that they never returned. But their names are here, and what details we do know. But why aren't these lists in the Memorial de la Shoah? I ask. These are not the kind of records they keep, he says. They keep official records, the ones made by the governments. These are not official. And for now, I want my lists with me, because I am always finding new names, and it is important to keep up my life's work. When I die, these books will go to the memorial. It is my hope that they, too, will keep them alive and, in doing so, keep the people who live in these pages alive forever. That is amazing, Monsieur Bear, I say. He nods, smiles slightly. It is not so amazing. Amazing would be to live in a world where there was no need to make lists of the dead. Before I can reply, he puts a finger on the page of his open book and says calmly, I have found them. I look at him confused. Your family, he clarifies. My eyes widen. Wait, you found the names? Already? He chuckles. I have lived inside these lists for many years, madame. I know my way. He closes his eyes for a moment and then focuses on the page before him. The Picard family, he says. Dix rue de General Camus, septième arrondissement. What does that mean? It was your grandmother's address, he says. Number ten on the street of General Camus. I tried to include addresses wherever I could. He smiles slightly and adds, Your grandmother, she must have lived in a nice place, in the shadow of the Tour Eiffel. I swallow hard. What else does it say? He reads ahead for a moment before speaking. The parents were Albert and Cécile. Albert, he was a doctor. The children were Eline, Rose, Claude, Alan, David, Daniel. Rose is my grandmother, I whisper. He looks up from the book with a smile. Then I will have to change my list. Why? She is listed as presumed dead the 15th of July, 1942, in Paris. He squints at something on the page. She went out that night and never returned, according to my notations. The next day, her family was all taken. I can't seem to muster words. I just stare at him. The 16th of July, 1942, he continues. His voice has softened now. The first day of the Veldiv Roundup. My throat is dry. It's the massive arrest of 13,000 Parisians that I'd read about online. I was there too, he adds softly. My family was taken that day. I stare. I'm so sorry. He shakes his head. It was the end of the life I once knew, he says softly, the beginning of the life I now live. Silence descends. What happened? I ask finally. He looks into the distance. They came for us before dawn. I did not know to expect them. I did not know it could happen. As I look back, I realize I should have. 
we all should have. But sometimes in life, it is easier to believe things will be all right. We were blind to the truth. But how could you have known? I ask. He nods. It is easy to look back and question, but you are correct. It would have been impossible to know what was coming. For us, for my wife and my son, just three years old, we were taken with many others to the Velodrome Dive in the Kenzium, just near the Eiffel Tower and very near the Seine. There were maybe seven thousand, maybe eight thousand people there. It was hard to count them all. It was a sea of people. There was no food, hardly any water. We were packed together like fish in a can. Some people killed themselves. I saw a mother smother her baby, and I thought she was crazy. But by the end of the third day, I understood that she was merciful. Later, as she wailed, I watched a guard shoot her. I remember thinking quite clearly, she is lucky. His voice is flat, but his eyes are watery as he goes on. We stayed there for five days before they moved us. On the fourth day, my son, my Nicholas, he died in my arms. And before we were taken away to Drancy and seen to Auschwitz, my wife and I were separated, but I could see in her eyes that she was already gone. Losing Nicholas had taken her will to live. I was told later that she did not pass the initial selection at Auschwitz when she arrived, and that she did not cry, not once, as they led her away. I am so sorry, I murmur, but he waves dismissively. It was long ago, he says. I watch as he turns back to his book, studying the page that he said contained the records I was looking for. Allo, he says. He blinks a few times. Your family, the Picards of Rue de General Camus, the youngest two, David and Danielle, they died at Auschwitz upon arrival. David was eight years of age. Danielle was five. God, I breathe. They were just babies. Monsieur Bear nods. Most of the young ones never returned. They were taken to the gas chamber immediately because the Germans considered them useless. He swallows and continues reading. Aline, age 18, and Claude, age 16, died at Auschwitz in 1942. So did the mother, Cecile, the father, Albert, died in Auschwitz at the end of 1943. He pauses and adds softly, it says here that he worked in the crematorium until he became ill in the winter. That must have been terrible. He knew his own fate. I feel tears in my eyes, and this time it's too late to blink them back. Monsieur Bear is silent as the rivers run down my cheeks. It takes a few moments for his words to fully settle into my soul. All of them died there, I whisper, at Auschwitz. He meets my eye and nods slowly, a look of pity on his face. What about Alan? How did he die? For the first time today, Monsieur Bear looks surprised. Die? But he is the one who gave me this information. I stare at him. I don't understand. He squints at the page again. Yes, this interview is dated the 6th of June, 2005. I remember him. A very nice man. 
kind eyes. You can always know a person by his eyes. He was playing chess with another survivor, a man I knew. That is how I came upon him. Wait, I say. My heart is thudding as I struggle to understand what he's saying. You're telling me that Alan Picard, my grandmother's brother, is still alive? And that you talk to him? Monsieur Bear looks concerned. Bien sûr, he was alive in 2005. I do not know what became of him after that. He was never deported, but he suffered during the war. Everyone did. He told me that he went into hiding for nearly three years. He had very little food. A man, his old piano teacher, gave him a place to sleep on the coldest winter nights, but the man was afraid of putting his own family in danger. So Alan, he slept on the streets, and sometimes the nuns at the church would give him meals. He would be eighty now if he is still alive. Then again, I am ninety-three, my dear, and I'm not giving up any time soon. He smiles at this. I'm too stunned to reply. My grandmother's brother, I murmur. Do you know where he is? Monsieur Bear reaches for a pad of paper. Do you have a pen? He asks. I nod and fumble in my purse. He jots something down on a piece of paper, rips it off, and hands it to me. This is the address he gave me in 2005. It is in the Marie, the Jewish quarter, near the Place de Vosges. That is where I found him playing chess. That's near my hotel, I tell him. I look at the address he's handed me. 27, Rue de Foin, number 2B. I feel a chill run down my spine. Well, then, Monsieur Bear says, you should go now. The past waits on no one. Chapter 12 I'm in stunned disbelief as I bid Monsieur Bear adieu and hurry downstairs. My feet carry me back toward the Seine, where I hail a cab on the main street and hand the driver the slip of paper Monsieur Bear has just given me. The driver grunts in reply and pulls away from the curb. He veers across lanes of traffic, takes a bridge over the Seine, and cuts back to the east, where he parallels the river as I watch the twin towers of Notre Dame grow closer and closer out the right window. Finally, he turns left and, after a series of twists and turns, screeches to a halt in front of a gray stone building with a pair of massive, dark wooden doors. I pay the driver, and as he pulls away, I approach the call box. There, in black and white, is the name Picard A. I take a deep breath and push the buzzer next to the now familiar last name. Only then do I realize my hands are shaking. My heart pounds wildly as I wait. There's no reply. I push the buzzer again, but there's still no response. My heart sinks. What if it's too late? What if he's dead? I remind myself that it's equally possible he's merely out. It's mid-afternoon on a lovely fall day. Perhaps he's gone for a walk or to the store. I linger outside the building for a few minutes, in hopes that someone will come in or out and I'll be able to ask about him, but the street is quiet and there's no one coming or going. I check my watch. Perhaps he's in the Place de Vosges, playing chess, like Monsieur Bert said. I pull out my map, flip to the correct page, and realize the park is less than a block away. I turn and walk in that direction. On the way, I stop at a payphone, and after spending a few minutes trying to get an English-speaking operator, 
I use my visa to make a call to Annie's cell. I realize she's probably asleep and won't answer, but I'm suddenly dying to tell her what I found. The call goes to voicemail, and although I'd expected that, my heart still sinks. I consider telling her about Alan, but instead I say, I was just thinking about you, honey, and I wanted to say hi. It's beautiful here in Paris. I think I might have found something, but I'm trying not to get my hopes up. I'll call you later. I love you. Five minutes later, I enter the Place de Vosges through the middle of three stone arches beneath a building. The whole square is surrounded by uniform brick and stone buildings, with graying roofs, French doors, and narrow balconies. Nearly twenty soaring trees with Kelly green leaves surround a statue on horseback in the middle of the rectangular park, while four two-level fountains hold up the four grassy corners inside the frame of the sandy footpaths. I look around for anyone who matches Alan's general description, but so far the oldest man I've seen, a man walking a little black dog, couldn't be much older than sixty. I quickly walk the length of the park, staring into the faces of those who pass by, but there is no one here who might be Alan. My heavy heart in my chest, I sigh and walk out the way I came. It's beginning to dawn on me that I might not encounter him, here or anywhere. I fight off a feeling of crushing disappointment, I can't admit defeat yet. I wander east to kill a little more time before I return to the address Monsieur Bear gave me. I turn a few corners, passing apartment buildings and storefronts, until I find myself on a narrow street filled with people ducking in and out of designer stores. Rue de Rosier, I read from a street sign. I wander down the street, staring up at a disconcerting mix of ancient-looking butcher shops, bookstores, and synagogues, blended with modern clothing stores. I come to a stop outside a small storefront marked with the Star of David and the word synagogue, which is apparently the same in French as it is in English. My heart is thudding, and I reach out a shaking hand to touch the outer wall. I wonder how long it's been here, and whether my grandmother might have worshipped here at some point. As I stand there, lost in thought about the past, a familiar scent tugs me back to the present. The air smells ever so faintly like the buttery, cinnamon-scented, fig-and-prune-filled star pies I bake every day in my own bakery. I turn, slowly, and find myself facing a deep red storefront with big picture windows overflowing with breads and pastries. A bakery. I blink a few times and as if drawn forward by an invisible magnet, float across the street and through the doors. Inside, the store is packed with people. To the right is a long deli case with meats and prepared salads. To the left is a seemingly endless display of bagels, cheesecakes, pies, tarts, and pastries— all with little signs announcing their names in French and their prices in euros. I'm frozen in place as my eyes roam over the familiar selection. I see the lemon grape cheesecake that's one of the North Star's specialties. There's a delicate-looking strudel that looks just like the one that always sells out of my bakery. I take a step closer and realize it's practically identical. It has apples, almonds, raisins, candied orange peel, and cinnamon, just like I use. There's even a sourdough rye bread like the one I earned top honors with two years ago in the Cape Cod Times, Best Breads of the Cape poll. And there, in the window, are slices of something they call Ronde de Pavé. 
I'm accustomed to seeing them baked into little individual pies with star-shaped lattice crusts, but as I bend to look at the slices, the filling is unmistakable. Poppy seeds, almonds, grapes, figs, prunes, and cinnamon sugar, just like Mamie's beloved star pies. Que puis-je pour vous? There's a high-pitched French voice behind me, and I turn slowly, as if in a fog. Um, I don't speak French, I stammer. I'm sorry. My heart is still pounding a mile a minute. The woman, who looks about my age, smiles. No problem, she says, switching seamlessly to accented English. We have a lot of tourists here. What would you like? I point shakily to one of the pieces of Ronde de Pavé. She begins to bag it for me, but I reach out to stop her. I realize my hand is trembling when it makes contact with her arm. She looks up in surprise. Where do these recipes come from? I ask her. She frowns and looks suspicious. They're old recipes of my family, madame, she says. We do not give them out. No, no, that's not what I mean, I say quickly. It's just that I have a bakery in the States, in Massachusetts, and I make the same things, all the recipes that I thought were my grandmother's family recipes. The suspicion fades from her expression, and she smiles. Ah, your grandmother, she is Polish. And no, she's from here, Paris. The woman tilts her head to the side, but her parents are from Poland, no? She bites her lip. This bakery, it was opened by my great-grandparents just after the war, in 1947. They were from Poland. These recipes, they have much influence of Eastern Europe. I nod slowly. Everything we bake was developed in the Tradition Ashkenaza, of my family's past. We keep to those traditions today. Your grandmother, she is juive, um, Jewish. I nod slowly. Yes, I think. But what's the tradition, ash, whatever you said? It's the, how you say, le Judaism traditionnel in Europe, she explains. It began in Germany, but hundreds of years ago, these Juifs moved to other countries of Europe in the East. Before the war, most communauté Juifs, um, communities of Juifs in Europe were Ashkenazi, like my great-grandparents, before Hitler destroyed them. I nod slowly and look at the pastries again. My grandmother always said her family had a bakery here in Paris, I say quietly, before the war. I look around and realize how many of Mamie's favorite pastries are missing. Do you have pistachio cakes? I ask. She shakes her head, looking at me blankly, and I go on to describe Mamie's sweet crescent moons and her almond rose tarts. Again, the woman shakes her head. Those do not sound familiar, she says. She looks around, seeming to suddenly realize how crowded the shop is. I am sorry, she says. I must go now, unless you want a pastry. I nod and point to one of the Ronde de Pave, which I know will taste just like one of our star pies. I'll take one of those, please, I say. She nods, wraps it in wax paper, and places it in a little white bakery bag for me. There is no charge, she says, handing it to me with a smile. Maybe you will give me a pastry if I come to Massachusetts some day. I smile back. Thank you, and thanks for all your help. She nods and turns away. I'm already walking toward the door when I hear her call out, Madame? I turn around. Those other things you mentioned, she says. I do not think they are of the Eastern European tradition Ashkanze. 
She waves and disappears into a crowd of waiting customers. I frown and stare after her in confusion. I eat my ron de pavé as I retrace my steps back to the address Monsieur Bear gave me. It's not exactly like one of our star pies, but it's close enough. The one I make is heavier on the cinnamon. Mamie has always loved cinnamon, and our crust is a little denser and more buttery. The raisins in the ronde are golden, while I use traditional dark raisins. But it's clear that the recipes originate from the same place. I've finished the pastry, but not my swirling questions. By the time I reach Alan's door again. I take a deep breath and close my eyes for a moment, stealing myself for the feeling of disappointment I know will flood through me if he doesn't answer. I open my eyes and press the buzzer. At first, I'm greeted by silence. I buzz again and I'm about to turn away when suddenly, there's a crackling sound and a muffled male voice on the other end. Hello. I practically shout into the call box, my heart suddenly pounding. I am trying to find Alan Picard. There's a pause, and then more crackling and a muffled male voice. I'm sorry, I can't understand you. I say, I'm trying to reach Alan Picard. The speaker crackles again. The voice says something, and then, to my relief, I hear the front door buzz. I push it open and hurry into a tiny, beautiful courtyard, where vines creep up old stone walls framed by red roses and yellow daffodils. I cross quickly and make my way into the building. He's in apartment two B, Monsieur Bear said. I climb the flight of stairs in the corner and am momentarily surprised to see that the two apartments in front of me are labeled. One A and one B. Then I remember that the French think of the ground floor as zero instead of one, and I ascend a second flight of stairs. Heart pounding, I knock on the door marked two B. The moment it opens, and I find myself face to face with an old, slightly stooped man with thick white hair. I know for sure. He has Mamie's eyes, the slate gray, slightly almond-shaped eyes that she passed on to my mother. I've found my great uncle. Mamie is part of this mysterious lost Picard family after all, and therefore so am I. I take a deep breath. Alan Picard, I manage when I found my voice. Oui, he says. He's staring at me. He shakes his head and says something in rapid French. I, I'm sorry. I say, I only speak English. I'm sorry. Forgive me, Mademoiselle. He says, switching seamlessly to English. It is just that you look like someone I used to know. It is like seeing a ghost. My heart thuds. Do I remind you of your sister? I ask. Rose. The color drains from his face. But how did you? His voice trails off. I think I'm your great niece. I tell him. I'm Rose's granddaughter, Hope. No, he says. His voice nearly a whisper now. No, no, that is impossible. My sister died seventy years ago. I shake my head. No, I say, she's still alive. No, ce n'est pas possible. He murmurs. It is not possible. She always believed you had died. I tell him softly. He stares. She is alive. He whispers after a long pause. You are certain. I nod. The words stuck behind the sudden lump in my throat. But how? How are you here? How did you find me? 
She asked me to come to Paris to find out what happened to her family, I say. Your name was nowhere in the records. I quickly explain about how the people at the memorial sent me to Olivier Bear. I remember him, he says softly. He spoke to Jacob, too, a long time ago, right after the war. Jacob? I ask. His eyes widen. You do not know of Jacob? I shake my head. Is he another of your brothers? I wonder why Mamie didn't put his name down on the list. Alan shakes his head slowly. No, he says, but he was more important to Rose than anyone else in the world. I follow Alan into his apartment, which is small and filled with books. Dozens of teacups sit with their matching saucers on shelves and atop cabinets, a few even framed on the walls. My wife collected those, Alan says, following my gaze and nodding to a shelf filled with cups and saucers as he shuffles down the hall toward a sitting room. I never liked them, but after she died, I could not bring myself to throw them away. I'm sorry, I say. When did she? A very long time ago, he says, looking down. We enter the sitting room, and he gestures to one of the two high-backed chairs, upholstered in red velvet. I sit, and he shakily sinks into the seat opposite me. My Anne, she was one of the few who survived Auschwitz. We used to say how lucky she was, but she could never have children because of what they had done to her. She died at forty with a broken heart. I'm so sorry, I murmur. Thank you, he says. He leans forward eagerly and stares at me with eyes that are achingly familiar. Now, please, tell me about Rose. Forgive me, I am in shock. So I quickly tell him what I know, that my grandmother came to the United States in the early 1940s after marrying my grandfather, that they had one daughter, my mother. I tell him about the bakery Mamie opened on Cape Cod and how just an hour earlier I'd stumbled upon the Ashkenaza Jewish Bakery on Rue des Rosiers, and realized how familiar so many of the pastries were. I always knew Rose had baking in her blood, Alan says softly. Our mother, she was from La Pologne. Her parents brought her here to Paris when she was just a little girl. They had a bakery, and before our mother married our father, she worked there every day. Even after our mother had children, she would still help at the bakery on the weekends and on busy evenings. Rose, she loved to go there with her. Baking is our family's legacy. I shake my head. It's incredible, I think, that I've been surrounded by Mamie's family history for all my life and never known it. Every time I baked a strudel or a star pie, I was following a tradition that had been in our family for generations. But how did she escape Paris? Alan asks, leaning forward even farther, so far that I'm beginning to fear he might fall from his chair. We always believed she died somehow, just before the roundup. My heart sinks. I don't know, I say. I was hoping you would know. He looks confused now. But she is still alive, you say. Can you not ask her? I hang my head. She has Alzheimer's disease, I say. I don't know how to say it in French. I look up and Alan nods, sadness sweeping his features. It is the same word. So she does not remember, he whispers. 
She's never talked about the past before, I say. In fact, I didn't know until just a few days ago that she was even Jewish. Now he looks confused, but of course she is Jewish. I shake my head. For my whole life, she's been Catholic. Alan looks puzzled, but he stops there, as if unsure of what to ask me next. I don't understand either, I say. I never knew until just a few days ago that our family was Jewish. I never even knew her maiden name had been Picard. She'd always said it was Durand. My daughter even did a family tree project a few years ago, and it's Durand in every piece of documentation we could find. There's no record of her being a Picard. Alan looks at me for a long moment and sighs. Rose Durand is probably the identity she escaped under. To have gotten out of France at that time, she would have had to get new identity papers, probably in unoccupied France. And to get new papers, she likely would have had to claim to be someone else. She probably had help from the Résistance. They would have given her false papers. False papers that listed her as a Christian? That listed her as Rose Durand instead of Rose Picard? Much easier to escape as a Catholic than as a Jew, of course, during the war. Alan nods slowly. If she believed she had lost all of us, perhaps she wanted to forget. Perhaps she lost herself in her new identity— because it was the only way to maintain her santé d'esprit, her sanity. But why would she think you were dead? I ask. After the liberation, everything was confused, Alan says. Those of us who were left came to the Hotel Lutetia on the Boulevard Raspail. It was where all the survivors came after— some to heal, to receive medical care. For the rest of us, it was the place to find each other, to seek our families that had been lost. You went there? I ask. He nods. I was never deported, he says softly. After the war, I came to the Hotel Lutetia to find my family. I wanted so badly to believe they had survived hope. We would arrive and put the names of the family members on a board. I am looking for Cécile Picard, mother, age 44, arrested July 16, 1942, taken to Verdive. People would come to you and tell you, I knew your mother at Auschwitz. She died in her third month of pneumonia. Or, I worked with your father in the crematorium at Auschwitz. He became sick and was sent to the gas chamber just before the liberation of the camp. I stare at him. You found out that they all died. All of them. Alan whispers. Grandparents, cousins, aunts, uncles. Rose was listed as dead, too. Two people swore they had seen her shot in the streets during the roundup. I left without giving my name, because there was no one left to find me. That is what I believed. It is why there is no record of me. I wanted only to disappear. How did you escape being captured? I was eleven years old when they came for us. My parents, they did not believe all the rumors we were hearing. But Rose believed. She could not convince my parents. They thought she was crazy, that she was a fool for accepting the predictions of Jacob, whom they viewed as a young rebel who knew nothing. There it was again, that name. You never told me who Jacob is. Alan searches my face for a moment. Jacob was everything, he says simply. 
Jacob was the one who told me to run if the police came. Jacob was the one who told me to try to convince my family. Jacob was the one who saved me. For when the police came for us, to take us away, I climbed out the back window, fell to the ground from three floors above, and ran. He looks down at his hands for a long moment. They're gnarled and scarred. Finally, he draws a deep breath and continues, I let my family die because I was scared, he says. He looks up at me and there are tears in his eyes. I did not try hard enough to persuade them. I did not take Danielle and David, the younger ones, with me. I was frightened, very frightened, and because of that, they are all gone. A tear runs down his cheek. Before I can even consider what I'm doing, I've crossed the room to hug him. He stiffens for a moment, and then I feel his arms encircle my shoulders. His whole body is shaking. You were eleven, I murmur. You are not to blame. I pull away, and he sighs. No matter who holds the blame, my family was all murdered, and I am still here, seventy years later. I have lived with that all my life. It is heavy in my heart. I can feel tears in my own eyes as I sit back down. How did this Jacob know? How did he know to tell you to run? He was part of an underground movement against the Nazis, Alan says. He believed the rumors of the death camps. He believed they were exterminating us systematically. He was in the minority, but Rose believed him. And Jacob was my hero, so I believed him too. He must have saved her. How? I ask softly. Alan looks at me for a long moment. I do not know, but she was the love of his life. He would have done anything to protect her. Anything. I blink. She loved him too? He nods. With a strength I had never known she had, he says. He looks off into the distance for a long time. That is why, for all these years, I've always firmly believed that she died. For if she had lived, I know she would have come back for him. She must have believed that he was dead too, I murmur. Was his name at the Hotel Lutetia? Alan looks perplexed. Yes, it was, he says. He was hoping beyond hope that she had made it out, that she had survived, despite the rumors we had heard. His name was always there, so if she came back, she would find him. But my grandfather came back, I tell him, in 1949, to find out what happened to her family. That's what my grandmother said. There were no records of me, Alan says. That is surely why he did not find me. But Jacob did everything to be listed, just in case Rose had somehow survived. I swallow hard and wonder what this means. Had Mamie not given Jacob's name to my grandpa? Or had my grandfather found Jacob's name on survivor lists after all and told Mamie otherwise because he realized how much she apparently loved him and wanted to protect the life he'd already begun with her? I shudder involuntarily. Did this Jacob escape like you and my grandmother did? I ask Alan. Before the roundup? Alan shakes his head and draws a deep breath. Jacob was at Auschwitz, he says simply. He survived because he was so sure Rose was safe somewhere, and he had vowed he would find her. He told me, when I last saw him, that he could not believe she was dead, because he would have felt it in his soul. 
It was that hope of reuniting with her that kept him alive in that hell on earth. Chapter 13 Lemon Grape Cheesecake Ingredients One and a half cups ground graham cracker crumbs One cup granulated sugar, divided One teaspoon cinnamon Six tablespoons unsalted butter, melted Two eight-ounce blocks of cream cheese One quarter cup white grape juice Juice and zest of one lemon Two eggs. Directions. 1. Preheat oven to 375 degrees. Mix graham cracker crumbs, one half cup sugar, cinnamon, and melted butter until well blended. Press evenly into an 8 inch pie pan. 2. Bake for 6 minutes. Remove from oven and cool. 3. Reduce oven temperature to 300 degrees. 4. In a medium bowl, beat cream cheese until smooth using an electric mixer. Gradually beat in remaining half cup sugar. Gradually add grape juice, lemon juice, lemon zest, and eggs, and beat until just smooth and lump free. 5. Place cooled crust on a cookie sheet. Pour cream cheese mixture into crust. 6. Bake for 40 minutes or until center of crust no longer jiggles. Rose Annie had been to see Rose earlier that day. Rose was sure of it, but she couldn't quite make sense of what the girl had said. Mom's in Paris right now. Annie had declared, her gray eyes flashing with excitement. She left me a message. She said she might have, like, found something. How nice, my dear, Rose had replied, but she couldn't quite place who Annie's mother was. Was she a relative of Rose's? Or maybe one of her customers at the bakery? But she couldn't tell the girl that she didn't remember her mother. So instead, she said, did your mother find something nice at the boutique? A scarf or some shoes, perhaps? Paris was, after all, known for its shopping. Annie had laughed then, a bright sound that reminded Rose of the birds that used to sing outside her window on the Rue de General Camus so very long ago. No, Mamie, she had exclaimed. She went to the Holocaust Museum, you know, to find out what happened to those people you told us about. Oh, Rose had murmured, all of the breath suddenly gone from her lungs. Annie had departed soon after, and Rose had been left alone with her thoughts, which were closing in on her. The girl's words had triggered a tornado of memories that threatened to lift Rose off her feet and take her away, into the past, where she found herself dwelling more and more frequently now. Most days, the memories rolled in uninvited, but this day, it was the mentions of Paris and the Holocaust, the Shoah, that sent Rose spinning backward to that terrible day in 1949, her dear Ted had come home and confirmed her worst fears. She loved her husband, and because she loved her husband, she had told him about Jacob, because she knew she was supposed to be honest with the people she loved, and she had been honest, to a point— she had told Ted that there was a man she had loved very much in Paris. It had hardly needed to be said. She knew it was already clear. But when he'd asked her if she loved the man in Paris more than she loved him, she hadn't been able to meet his eye. And so he had known. He had always known. She wished she felt differently. Ted was a wonderful man— he was a wonderful father to Josephine. He was trustworthy and loyal. 
He had built her a life she never could have dreamed of all those years ago in the land of her birth. But he wasn't Jacob, and that was his only flaw. For the first few years after the war, she hadn't wanted to know. Not officially, anyhow. When she'd first been married to Ted and they'd been living in New York, in an apartment not far from the Statue of Liberty, there had been bits and pieces of news from other immigrants who drifted in from France. Survivors, they called themselves. Rose thought that, instead, they looked like ghosts, already dead. Pale, washed out, hollowed eyes, floating through rooms like they didn't quite belong there. I knew your mother, one of the ghosts would say. I watched her die at Auschwitz. I saw sweet little Danielle at Drancy, another would say. I don't know if she made it to the transport. And the bit of news that shattered her soul from a ghost named Monsieur Penusivitz, whom she'd known in a former life. He was the butcher whose shop was just down the street from her grandparents' bakery. That boy you were running around with, Jacob! Rose had stared at him. She hadn't wanted him to go on, because she could see the truth written in his eyes. She couldn't bear to hear it. She made a muffled sound, for it was all she could muster, and he took it as a signal to go on. He was at Auschwitz. I saw him there, and I saw him the day they led him to the gas chamber. And that was it. He was gone. The ghost of Monsieur Penusivitz, as well as the last shred of hope she had that she could somehow find her past again. By the time she left New York, she knew they were all gone. The ghosts had told her. One had watched her father get sick while working at Auschwitz crematorium. One had held her mother's hand as she died. Another had worked alongside Aline and had one day returned from the field, a day that Aline had been too sick to rise from her bed, to find her on the floor beaten to death by the guards, her lovely brown hair matted with blood. The fates of the others were less clear, and Rose didn't ask questions. What mattered was that they were all dead, all of them. And so, when Ted had promised her a life far away from these hollow-eyed ghosts, far away from New York, in a magical place called Cape Cod, where he said the waves washed up on sandy beaches and cranberry bogs grew, she said yes, because she loved him, and because she needed to finish becoming someone else. She needed to concentrate on building a family, because the one she'd had was gone forever. But by 1949, seven years after she'd left Paris, she had needed to know for sure. She knew she could not bury Rose Picard without the certainty that could only come from the official records. What if one of the ghosts was wrong? What if little Danielle had survived and was in an orphanage somewhere, believing there was no one in the world who loved her? What if Aline hadn't died on that floor, but had escaped and was waiting for her, wondering where she was? What if the ghost who said she'd held Rose's mother's hand had been mistaken about the identity of the woman she'd watched die? But Rose couldn't go. It had been nothing short of miraculous that her falsified papers had gotten her into the United States in the first place. She knew it was likely that the immigration people had looked the other way because she had married Ted, a war hero. She had made her bargains. Now her life was here, and she had a little girl who needed her. She didn't trust France. She didn't trust that she could get out again. And she feared her heart wouldn't be able to bear going back anyhow. So she asked Ted to go 
And because he loved her, and because he was a good man, he said yes. He left on a shining summer Monday. She waited, the seconds ticking by like minutes, the minutes feeling like hours. Time stretched like the taffy she, Ted, and little Josephine had eaten on their trip to Atlantic City the summer before. When he finally came home, very late that Friday, he sat her down in the still, damp heat of the Cape Cod night and told her everything. He had been to the synagogue Rose had grown up in. It pained her deeply when he told her the synagogue had been destroyed during the war, but that they had rebuilt it as good as new. She knew then that he didn't understand that when things were rebuilt, they weren't the same. You could never get back the things that had been destroyed. They all died, Rose, he told her gently, looking into her eyes and holding her hands tightly, as if he were afraid she'd float away like a helium balloon bound for the heavens. Your mother, your father, your sisters, your brothers, all of them. I am so sorry. Oh, was all she could muster. I spoke to the rabbi there, Ted said softly. He showed me where to find the records. I am so sorry. She didn't say anything. Do you want to know what happened to them, Rose? Ted asked. No. She shook her head, looked away. She could not hear it. She feared it would break her heart in a million pieces. Would she die right here, in front of her husband, with her daughter upstairs, when it shattered? It is my fault, she whispered. No, Rose, Ted exclaimed. You can't feel that way. None of this is your fault. He took her in his arms, but her body was stiff, unwilling. She shook her head slowly against his chest. I knew, she whispered. I knew they were coming for us, and I did not try hard enough to save them. She knew she would have to live with that forever, but she didn't know how. It was why she couldn't be herself any more. It was why she had found solace in Rose Durand and then Rose McKenna. It was impossible to be Rose Picard. Rose Picard had died in Europe with her family long ago. It's not your fault, Ted said again. You have to stop blaming yourself. She nodded because she knew it was what was expected of her. She pulled away from him. And Jacob Levy, she asked in a flat voice, looking up at long last to meet Ted's eye. This time, it was he who looked away. My dear Rose, he said, your friend Jacob died at Auschwitz just before the liberation of the camp. Rose blinked a few times. It was as if someone had pushed her head under water. All of a sudden, she couldn't see, couldn't breathe. She gasped for breath. You are certain? She asked, after a very long while, when air filled her lungs again. I'm sorry, Ted said. And that had been that. The world became very cold for Rose that day. She nodded and looked away from her husband. She would not cry. She could not cry. She had already died inside, and to cry would be to live. And how could she live without Jacob? Jacob had always told her that love would save them, and she had believed him. But he'd been wrong. She had been saved, but what good was she without him? What meaning did her life have? It was at that moment that Josephine appeared from around the corner, wearing the long pink cotton nightgown Rose had sewn for her 
clutching her Cynthia doll. What's wrong, Mama? Josephine asked from the doorway, blinking sleepily at her parents. Nothing, my dear, Rose said, standing and crossing the room to kneel beside her daughter. She looked at the little girl and reminded herself that this was her family now, that the past was in the past, that she owed it to this life to keep going. But she felt nothing. After she'd tucked Josephine back into bed, singing her a lullaby her own mother had sung to her so many years before, she had lain beside Ted in the dark until his chest rose and fell in slumber, and she could feel him slipping away into his dreams. She rose softly, silently, and moved toward the hall. She climbed the narrow staircase to the small widow's walk atop their house, and she emerged into the still night. The moon was full, and it hung heavy over Cape Cod Bay, which Rose could see over the rooftops. The pale lunar light reflected on the water, and if Rose looked down, she could almost believe that the sea was lit from within. But she wasn't looking down. Tonight, she was searching the heavens for the star she had named. Mama, Papa, Aline, Claude, Alan, David, Daniel. I am sorry, she whispered to the sky. I am so sorry. There was no answer. She could hear, in the distance, the waves lapping at the shore. The sky was silent. She searched the sky, murmuring apologies until dawn began to break on the eastern horizon. Still, she could not find him. Was this her fate? Was he lost to her forever? Jacob, where are you? She cried out to the sky. But there was no reply. Chapter 14 The air in Paris becomes very still as darkness falls. First, the sky begins to deepen, from the pale, hazy periwinkle of late afternoon to the deepening cerulean of evening, streaked with tangerine and gold at the horizon. As the stars begin to poke holes in the blanket of dusk, the wispy clouds hold on to the disappearing sunset, turning shades of ruby and rose. Finally, as sapphire fades to night, the lights of Paris come on, as twinkling and endless as stars. I stand on the Pont des Arts with Alan, watching in awe as the Eiffel Tower begins to sparkle with a million tiny white lights against the velvet sky. I've never seen anything so beautiful, I murmur. Alan has suggested a walk, because he needed a break from speaking about the past. I'm eager to hear the story of Jacob, but I don't want to push him. I have to keep reminding myself that Alan is 80, and these must be painful, long-buried memories. We're leaning against the railing of the bridge, looking west, as he folds his hand gently over mine. I can feel it trembling. Your grandmother used to say the same thing, he says softly. She would take me here when I was a boy, before the occupation, and tell me that the sunset over the Seine was God's show, put on just for us. I feel tears in my eyes and shake my head, trying to rid myself of them, for they blur the perfect view. Whenever I feel alone... Alan says, I come here. I've spent years dreaming that Rose was with God, lighting the sky for me. I never imagined that all this time she's been alive. We have to try to call her again, I say, 
We had tried her number before leaving for a walk, but there'd been no answer. She was likely napping, something she seemed to be doing more of lately. We have to tell her that I found you, even though she might not understand or remember. Of course, Alan says, and then I will come with you back to Cape Cod. I turn and stare at him. Really? You'll come with me? He smiles. I've spent seventy years without a family, he says. I do not want to waste another moment. I must see Rose. I smile into the darkness. When the last rays of the sun have seeped into the horizon and the stars are all out, Alan loops his arm through mine, and we begin to walk slowly back the way we came, toward the palatial Louvre, which is aglow in muted light, reflecting on the river beneath us. I will tell you about the Jacob now, Alan says softly, as we begin to cross through the courtyard of the Louvre, toward the Rue de Rivoli. I look at him and nod. I realize I'm holding my breath. Alan takes a deep breath and begins, his voice slow and halting. I was with Rose when she met him. It was the end of 1940, and although Paris had already fallen to the Germans, life was still normal enough that we could believe it would all be okay. Things were beginning to get bad, but we never could have imagined what was in store. We turn right on the Rue de Rivoli, which is still crowded with people, although the stores have closed. Couples stroll through the darkness, holding hands, whispering to each other, and for a moment, I can imagine Mamie and this Jacob walking the same street seventy years ago. I shiver. It was love at first sight, something I had never seen before or since. Alan continues. I would not believe in it if I had not seen it for myself, but from the very first moment it was as if they found the other half of their souls. As corny as it sounds, there's something in the gravity of Alan's voice that makes me believe him. Jacob was with us always from that first moment, Alan continues. My father did not care for him, for he was from a lower class. My father was a doctor, while Jacob's father was a factory laborer. But Jacob was kind, polite, and intelligent, so my parents tolerated him. He was always taking the time to teach me things and to play with David and Danielle. Alan pauses and I imagine he's thinking about his little brother and sister, lost so long ago. We stroll in silence for a while, and I wonder what it's like to entirely lose one's innocence at such a young age, to never be able to retrieve it. We pass the Hotel de Ville, Paris's palatial city hall, which is bathed in pale light. Alan takes my hand as we cross the street, and as we make our way north to the Marais, he doesn't let go. I realize I don't want him to. I've been missing a family, too, now that my mother is gone and my grandmother's memory has all but vanished. When the anti-Jewish laws began being imposed, and as things became worse for us, Jacob began to become more vocal about his opposition to the Nazis, and my parents were concerned. Alan continues, My father, you see, wanted to believe that we would be immune because we were wealthy. He wanted to believe that people were blowing everything out of proportion, that the Nazis did not truly intend us harm. Jacob, on the other hand, understood exactly what was happening. He was part of an underground movement. He believed the Nazis were coming to erase us all from the face of the earth. He was right, of course. I look back now, 
and I wonder why my parents could not see things more clearly, Alan says. I think they didn't want to believe that our country could turn its back on us. They wanted to believe the best, and when Jacob spoke the truth, they would not hear it. My father was outraged and accused him of bringing lies and propaganda into our home. Rose and I were the only ones who believed him. Alan's voice is hollow, almost a whisper, and that is what saved us both. We walk in silence for a little while more. Our footfalls echo off the stone walls around us. Where is Jacob now? I ask finally. Alan stops in his tracks and looks at me. He shakes his head. I do not know, he says. I do not know if he is still alive. My heart drops in my chest. The last time we spoke was 1952, when Jacob set off for America, Alan says. I stare at him. He moved to America? Alan nods. Yes, I do not know where in America, but of course that was nearly sixty years ago. He would be eighty-seven now. It's very possible he is not alive anymore. Remember, he spent two years in Auschwitz, Hope. That takes a toll. I don't trust myself to speak until we arrive back at Alan's building. I can't fully wrap my mind around the idea that my grandmother and the apparent love of her life have been living in the same country for 60 years and never knew the other had survived. But if Jacob had found her during the war, my mother might never have been born, and of course I wouldn't have been either. So had things worked out the way they were supposed to? Or was my very existence a slap in the face of true love? I have to try to find him, I say, as Alan punches his code into the keypad to the right. He holds the door open for me. Yes, he agrees simply. I follow him up to his apartment. I feel like I'm in a fog. Shall we call Rose again now? he asks, once he's locked the door behind us. I nod again. But remember, she has good days and bad ones, I remind him. It's very possible that she won't understand who you are. She's different than she used to be. He smiles. We're all different than we used to be, he says. I understand. I check my watch. It's nearly ten, so it would be nearly four on the Cape, late enough in the day that Mamie is probably sundowning. It's common for dementia patients to be less lucid as the day wears on. You sure you don't mind if I call from your phone? I ask. It's expensive. Alan laughs. If the cost were a million euros, I would still say yes. I smile, pick up the receiver, and punch in 001, then Mamie's number. I listen to the line ring six times before I hang up. That's strange, I say. I check my watch again. Mamie doesn't participate in the social activities at her home. She says bingo is for children. So there's no reason she shouldn't be in her room. Maybe I dialed wrong. I try again, and this time, I let it ring eight times before I hang up. Alan is frowning at me, and although there's a bad feeling in the pit of my stomach, I force a smile. She's not answering, but maybe my daughter took her out for a walk or something. Alan nods, but he looks concerned. Do you mind if I try her? I ask. My daughter? Of course. Alan says, please. I dial 001 and then Annie's cell number. She picks up after half a ring. Mom? She asks, and I can tell from her voice that something's wrong. What is it, honey? I ask. It's Mamie, she says. Her voice is trembling. 
She, she had a stroke. My heart stops, and I look up at Alan, stunned. I know he can read everything on my face. Is she? I ask. I don't complete the sentence. She's in the hospital, Annie says, but she's not looking good. Oh my God. I look up at Alan, who looks panicked. What has happened? He asks. I cover the receiver with my hand and say, My grandmother had a stroke. She's in the hospital. Alan puts a hand over his mouth as I turn my attention back to my daughter. Honey, are you okay? I ask. Who's with you? Mr. Keys, she mumbles. Gavin? I ask, confused. But where's your dad? Still at work, she says. I, I tried to call him, but his assistant said he was in the middle of an important case. She said he'd call me when court was in recess. I close my eyes and try to breathe. I'm so sorry I'm not there with you, honey. I'm coming home as soon as I can. I promise. I try calling you at your hotel, Annie says in a small voice. Where were you? I look up at Alan, who has tears in his eyes. I have a lot to tell you, Annie, I say. I'll tell you as soon as I get home, okay? Okay, she says in a small voice. Can I talk to Gavin for a minute? She doesn't answer, but I hear a rustling as she passes the phone to him. Hello? He says a moment later, and it's not until I hear his voice that I release a breath I didn't realize I'd been holding. Gavin, what happened? I ask right away. I know I should begin by thanking him for once again coming to my rescue, but all I can think about is Mamie and how Annie is coping. Hope, your grandmother had a stroke, but they've stabilized her, he says, and his voice is all business, but there's a gentleness there that soothes me. She hasn't regained consciousness, but they're monitoring her. It's too soon to tell how much damage there's been. How? What? My voice trails off because I don't know what I'm trying to ask. I look up at Alan helplessly again. He's sunk into a chair opposite me and is watching with watery eyes. His gnarled hand is still over his mouth. How did you know? I finally ask. Annie called. Gavin explains quickly. She was at her father's house. I guess your grandmother's assisted living place still had your old phone number as one of the emergency contacts, so a nurse called there and Annie answered. She couldn't reach anyone to take her to the hospital, so she called me. I'm sorry, I mumble. I mean, thank you. Hope, don't be silly, Gavin says. I was happy to help Annie out. I'm glad she called. I was just down the street, actually, finishing up a repair job at Joan Navarre's cottage, so I was able to come get her right away. I close my eyes. Thank you, Gavin. I don't even know how to thank you enough. It's fine, he says dismissively. Is she okay? I ask. Annie? She's okay, he says. Shaken up, but okay. Don't worry. I'll stay with her until your ex gets out of work. Thank you, I whisper. I'll make it up to you, Gavin. Don't worry, he repeats. I take a deep breath. I'll be on the next available flight. I'm not good at accepting favors from people, and I know that the guilt from this one will weigh on me for a long time. Hope, are you okay? Gavin asks. I blink a few times. No one ever asks me that. Yeah, I say, but it's a lie. Can I talk to Annie again? Sure, Gavin says. Hang in there. See you soon. I hear a rustling again, and then Annie's on the line. Mom? She asks. Listen, I'm sorry about your dad, I say. 
I'm going to call him right now and make sure that... I'm fine, Mom, Annie interrupts. Mr. Keys is with me. I sigh and pinch the bridge of my nose. I'll be there as soon as I can, sweetheart, I say. I know, Annie says. I love you, honey. There's a pause. I know, Annie says again, but then she adds, I love you too. It's only then that I begin to cry. Alan calls all the airlines while I struggle to get myself under control. I pace his apartment, feeling like a caged animal. For the thousandth time, I visualize Annie crying in the waiting room, with no one there to comfort her except Gavin Keyes. He's been wonderful to us these last few months, but still, she doesn't know him that well, and she must be scared about Mamie. Her father should be with her, not Gavin. As soon as Alan gets off the phone, I plan to call Rob and give him a piece of my mind. I switched your ticket, Alan tells me when he finally hangs up, and I bought one for myself. The earliest non-stop I could get us was for 1.25 p.m., arriving in Boston just after three. There were early flights from Paris, but with the stops, they would have gotten us into Boston later. I blink and nod. 1.25 p.m. tomorrow feels like an eternity from now. Thank you, I say. How much do I owe you? I know I shouldn't be thinking about money now, but I'm aware that the cost will be much more than the thousand-dollar check Mamie gave me. I have no idea how I'll pay for this. Alan looks confused. Do not be crazy, he says. This is not a time to talk about such things. We must get to Boston quickly to see Rose. I nod. I'll insist later. I don't have the energy right now. Thank you, I say softly. I ask Alan whether I can use his phone once more, and he watches me carefully as I speak first to Rob's assistant, and then, after I persuade her to put me through, to Rob, my voice taut with tension. Jesus, Hope, I'll get there as soon as I can, Rob says. I'm in the middle of an important hearing. It's not like Annie's life is in danger or something. Your daughter is at the hospital, alone and scared, I say through gritted teeth. That doesn't matter to you? I said, I'll get there as soon as I can, he repeats. Yeah, I heard you the first time, I retort, and it sounded just as selfish then. As I place the receiver down, I realize I'm shaking. Alan crosses the room and hugs me. I hesitate for a moment, then hug back. You are not married to the father of Annie? Alan asks after a moment, and I realize that for all the talking we've done about Mamie, I've barely told him anything about myself. No, I say, not anymore. I'm sorry, Alan says. I shrug. Don't be, I say. It's for the best. I'm trying to sound more lighthearted and casual about it than I feel, but I can tell from the look on Alan's face that he sees right through my nonchalance. I'm grateful that he doesn't ask anything else. You are welcome to stay here tonight if you wish, Alan says, but I think you have things at your hotel that you need to retrieve. Yeah, I have to pack. I say numbly, and check out. I will not sleep tonight, Alan says. There are too many things in my mind, so please return when you would like in the morning. There is no time too early. We will have breakfast together before we leave for the airport. I nod. Thank you, I murmur. Thank you, Alan says. He squeezes my hands and kisses me on both cheeks. 
you have given me my family back. I can't sleep that night either, although I try. I feel ashamed to be crawling under the covers while my daughter is alone and scared thousands of miles away. I try Annie twice more, but she doesn't answer. Her phone goes straight to voicemail, and I wonder whether the battery has run out. Around four in the morning Paris time, I reach Gavin on his cell, and he tells me that he left when Rob got to the hospital around seven in the evening. As far as he knows, there's been no change in Mamie's condition since then. Try to get some rest, Hope. Gavin says softly, you're coming home as soon as you can, and you're not helping anyone by lying there awake right now. I mumble a thank you and hang up. The next thing I know, I'm staring at a clock that tells me it's 5.45 in the morning. I don't remember falling asleep. I'm at Allen's by seven, after showering, shoving the remainder of my things into my duffel bag, checking out, and hailing a cab outside the hotel. Alan is already dressed for our trip, in slacks and a button-down shirt with a navy tie, when he greets me at the door. He kisses me on both cheeks and embraces me. You did not sleep much either, I see, he says. Barely. Come in, he says, stepping aside. My friend Simon is here. He knew our family before the war. And my friend Henri, he is a survivor too. They want to meet you. My heart is in my throat as I follow Alan into his apartment. In the sitting room, two men are sipping tiny cups of espresso by the window, while sunlight streams in, lighting their matching snow-white heads of hair. Both stand and smile at me as I enter, and I note that they look even older than Alan and are both significantly stooped. The one closest to me speaks first. His green eyes are watery. Alan is right. You look just like Rose, he whispers. Simon, Alan says, stepping into the room behind me. This is my niece, Hope McKenna Smith. Hope, this is my friend, Simon Rameau. He knew your grandmother. You look just like her, he says. He takes a few steps forward to meet me in the middle of the room. As he leans forward to kiss me on both cheeks, I notice two things, that he's trembling and that he has a number tattooed on the inside of his left forearm. He sees me staring at it. Auschwitz? He says simply. I nod and look away quickly, embarrassed. For me the same, the other man says. He holds up his left arm, and I see a similar tattoo, the letter B followed by five digits. He steps forward to kiss me on both cheeks, too, and backs away, smiling. I never knew your grandmother, he says, but she must have been very beautiful, for you are very beautiful, young lady. I smile weakly. Thank you. I am Henri Levy. My heart skips and I look at Alan. Levy? A common last name, Alan explains quickly. He is no relation to Jacob. Oh, I say, feeling oddly deflated. Shall we sit down? Henri motions to the chairs. Your uncle forgets I am ninety-two. He is, how do you say in English, a spring chicken. I laugh and Alan smiles. Yes, a spring chicken, Alan says. I am sure that is just what young Hope sees when she looks at me. Hope, do not listen to these old men, Simon says. He totters back to his chair. We are only as old as we feel, and today I feel like I am thirty-five. I smile, and after a moment, Alan offers me a cup of espresso, which I gladly accept. The four of us settle into seats in the living room, and Simon leans forward. 
I know I have said this, he begins, but you bring me back in time. Your grandmother was, is, a wonderful woman. He always had a crush on her, Alan interjects with a grin, but he was eleven like me. She was his babysitter. Simon shakes his head and shoots Alan a look. Oh, she had a crush on me too, he says. She just did not know it yet. Alan laughs. You are forgetting Jacob Levy. Simon rolls his eyes. My great foe for Rose's affection. Alan looks at me. Jacob was only Simon's foe in Simon's own mind, he says. To everyone else, Jacob was Prince Charming, and Simon was a miniature toad with sticks for legs. Hey, Simon exclaims. My legs developed very nicely, thank you. He points to his legs and winks at me. I laugh again. Now, Henri says after a moment, perhaps Hope can tell us a little about herself. Not that we are not very interested in the legs of Simon. The three men look at me expectantly, and I clear my throat, suddenly nervous to be put on the spot. Um, what would you like to know? Alain says you have a daughter, Henri asks. I nod. Yes, Annie. She's twelve years old. Simon smiles at me. So what else, Hope? he asks. What do you do for work? I have a bakery. I shoot a look at Alan. My grandmother started it in 1952. It's all her family recipes from back here in Paris. Alan shakes his head and turns to his friends. Incredible, isn't it, that she has kept our family's tradition alive all these years. It would be more incredible, says Henri, if she had brought us some pastries this morning, since you, Alain, did not bother to get any. Alan holds up his hands in mock defeat, and Simon tilts his head to the side. Perhaps Hope can tell us about some of her pastries, he says, so that we can imagine eating them. I laugh and begin to describe some of my favorites. I tell them about the strudels we make and the cheesecakes. I tell them about Mamie's star pies and how they're virtually identical to the slices of pie I found at the Ashkenaza bakery the day before. The men are smiling and nodding enthusiastically, but something changes when I begin listing some of our other specialties. The orange flower-tinged crescent moons, the savory anise and fennel cookies, the sweet pistachio cakes drenched in honey. Henri and Alan are staring at me in confusion, but Simon looks like he's just seen a ghost. All the blood has drained from his face. I half laugh uneasily. What? I ask. Those aren't pastries from any traditional Jewish bakery I've ever heard of, Henri says. Your grandmother wouldn't have gotten those from her family. I watch as Henri and Simon exchange looks. What? I ask again. It's Simon who speaks first. Hope, he says softly, all trace of jest gone from his voice. I think those are Muslim pastries from North Africa. I stare back. Muslim pastries? I shake my head. What? Henri and Simone glance at each other again. Alan looks like he understands what they're talking about now, too. He asks something in French, and when Simone replies, Alan murmurs, It cannot be true, can it? What are you talking about? I ask, leaning forward. They're making me nervous. The men ignore me and exchange a few more words in rapid French. Alan checks his watch, nods, and stands up. The other two men stand too. Come, Hope, Alan says. 
There is something we must do. What? I ask, completely baffled. Do we even have time? Alan looks at his watch again, and I check mine too. It's nearly eight. We will find the time, he says. This is important. Let us go. Bring your things. I grab my duffel bag and follow behind the men as we silently leave the apartment. Where are we going? I demand once we get on the Rue de Turenne and Henri puts his arm up to hail a cab. To the Grand Mosque de Paris, Simon says. The Grand Mosque. I stare at him. Wait, we're going to a mosque? Alan reaches out and touches my cheek. Trust us, Hope, he says. His eyes are sparkling, and he smiles at me. We will explain on the way. Chapter Fifteen. We never knew whether to believe the rumors. Alan began once we've piled into a cab and are hurtling south toward the river. Outside, the streets are just coming alive with people. As the sun begins to warm the earth and bathe the buildings in lemon light, what rumors? I ask. What are you talking about? Alan and Simon exchange looks. Henri speaks first. There have been rumors that the Muslims in Paris saved many Jews during the war. He says flatly. I stare at him. Then I look at Alan and Simon, who are nodding. Wait, you're telling me that Muslims saved Jewish people? We never heard about it during the war, says Simon. He glances at Alan. Well, almost never. Alan nods. Jacob said something once that made me think. His voice trails off, and he shakes his head. But I never really believed it. There was a time, Henri says, that we viewed each other as brothers in a way, the Jews and the Muslims. The Muslims were not persecuted during the war as we were, but they were always made to feel as outsiders, just like the Jews. I would guess that to some Muslims, seeing Jews being persecuted felt very personal. Who was to say that the country wouldn't turn its back on them next? And so the rumor was that they helped us. Simon says, "I never knew it was true." What do you mean? I ask. The rumors have always said that they gave housing and shelter to many children whose parents had been deported, and a few adults too. Alan says. And that eventually they sent those people through underground channels to the free zone, in some cases helping them to get false papers. You're telling me Muslims smuggled Jews out of Paris? I ask. I shake my head. It's difficult to believe. The leader of the Grand Mosque of Paris was, at that time, the most powerful Muslim in Europe. Henri says. He glances at Alan. Si Kador Ben, comment se il appelle? Ben Rabit. Alan says. Henri nods. Yes, that is it. Si Kador Ben Rabit. The French government was afraid to touch him. And it is possible he used that power and influence to save many lives. I shake my head and stare out the window at Paris rolling by. The towers of Notre Dame are silhouetted in the distance against the sky to the right, as we cross over a bridge and hurtle toward the left bank. Far away, I can hear church bells striking the hour. So you're saying that might be how my grandmother got out of Paris? That Muslims from the Grand Mosque may have gotten her out? It would explain where she learned to bake Muslim pastries, Alan says. 
it would answer a lot of questions. Henri adds, it is doubtful that there are any records. No one speaks of it. The secrets of that time have died with that time. Today, there is much tension between the religious groups. It is impossible to know whether it is true. But what if it is? I whisper. And then I remember, suddenly, Mamie's words for me just before I left for Paris, when I was pressing her for an answer about whether or not she was Jewish. Yes, I am Jewish, she had said, but I am also Catholic, and Muslim too. A shiver of realization runs through me and my eyes widen. The cab pulls up to the curb alongside a white building with deep green tiles on its roof, ornate arches, and glistening domes. A green-trimmed minaret rises from the building, and although it's decidedly Moroccan in its details, it looks a lot like one of the towers of Notre Dame that we just passed. Something else, Mamie said, echoes in my head. It is mankind that creates the differences, she had told me last week. That does not mean it is not all the same God. Henri pays the driver, and we get out of the cab. I give both Henri and Simon a hand as they straighten their legs and step out onto the sidewalk. There was a time I used to be able to do that myself, Henri says with a smile. He winks at me, and the four of us head toward an arched entrance at the corner of the building. If no one here ever speaks of what happened, I whisper to Alan as we cross into a small courtyard. What are we doing here? He links his arm through mine and smiles. Looking at pastries, he says. The courtyard is dappled in patches of sunlight that filter through the trees and throw shadows on the tiled white ground. Small blue and white tiled tables are set up in the middle of the courtyard and along the walls, and all of them are framed by wooden chairs with seats and backs of woven bright blue. Deep green plants with yellow flowers creep up the walls, and sparrows hop from table to table. It's peaceful, tranquil, and so empty that I'm not certain it's open yet. A middle-aged Arab man dressed all in black approaches and says something in French. Alan replies and gestures to me, and for the next minute, the four men talk in rapid French I can't understand. The man shakes his head at first, but finally he shrugs and gestures for us to follow him up a small stairway into the main building. There's a dark-haired, olive-skinned younger man, maybe twenty-five, inside the doorway, filling a clear bakery case with pastries, and my heart stops as I look inside. There, in the case, are numerous baked goods, nearly half of which are exactly the same as the pastries I make at my own bakery. There are delicate crescent moons dusted in snow-white powdered sugar, small pale green cakes and white pastry wrappers topped with tiny pieces of pistachios, honey-drenched slices of baklava, and sticky almond pastries topped with single cherries in their middles. There are thin rolls of phyllo dough rolled in sugar, thick slices of sugary almond cake rolled in almonds, and even the small, dense rings of cinnamon and honey that have been Annie's favorite since she was a little girl. My heart is thudding as I look up at Alan. They are the same, he asks. I nod slowly. They are the same, I confirm. He smiles, his eyes suddenly watery, and turns to the older man, who is frowning at us. They exchange a few sentences in French, and then Alan turns to me. Hope, would you tell this man about your pastries? 
I've told him what we think might have happened with Rose. I smile at the man who looks skeptical. The things you make here, I say, they are the same as my grandmother taught me to make. They are the same things we sell in our bakery in Cape Cod. The man shakes his head. But that means nothing. These are common pastries, and there are many Jews who came from northern Africa. The pastries are not just Muslim, you see. Your grandmother, she could have learned to make them anywhere. She probably learned them from another Jew. My heart sinks. It's silly for us to be staking our whole idea of the past on a collection of pastries. Of course, I murmur. I'm sorry. I nod slowly and turn away. Alan puts his hand on my arm. Hope, he asks, are you all right? I nod again, but I don't mean it. I can't find words because I feel like I'm about to cry, and I can't understand why. I don't know why it feels so important to me to be able to explain what happened to Mamie, but it does. I'm not sure that she wanted me to come here to learn about her past, but now we may never know how she made it out alive during the war. Let's go, I finally muster. The man in black nods curtly at us and walks away, while Henri and Simon begin making their way back out the way we came in. Alan and I start to follow, but suddenly... I catch the scent of something familiar, and I come to an abrupt halt. I turn slowly around and look at the young man behind the pastry counter, who was sliding a tray of rectangular, sugar-powdered pastries into the display case. I walk back up to the counter. Excuse me, I say. Do you, by any chance, have, um... I struggle to remember the name of the pastry from the bakery in the Marais. Ronde de Pavé? The man looks at me. Ronde de Pavé, he repeats. I speak no good the English. Mais non, I do not know what this is, Ronde de Pavé. Um, I look around for Alan. He joins me at the counter. Can you tell this man that Ron de Pavé is a pie made of poppy seeds, almonds, grapes, figs, prunes, and cinnamon sugar? Can you ask him if that sounds familiar? I know I might be losing my mind, but I swear I can smell star pie wafting through the air. Before Alan translates, he gives me a strange look. That was my mother's recipe he says. I nod. It's our bakery specialty, I tell him, and my grandmother's favorite thing. Alan blinks at me a few times, turns back to the young man, and quickly translates. I watch as the young man nods and says something in return. Alan turns to me. He says yes. He says that here, though, they make the pies individually, and each crust has the pattern of a star. My mouth falls open. That's how Mamie taught me to make them, I say softly. She calls them star pies. Alan scratches his head. Beside me, Simon and Henri are silent. We all stare at the young man as Alan explains the star pies in French. The man's eyes widen, and he looks quickly at me and then back to Alan. He says something in rapid French, and then Alan turns to look at me. He says there is a man who lives in the sixth, Alan says, not so very far away. His family has a Muslim bakery. The recipe came from him. He might be able to explain where it originated. I nod and glance at the young man. Thank you, I say. Merci beaucoup. De rien? The man nods and smiles. Bon chance. As I follow Alan and his two friends back through the courtyard toward the street, 
My heart is pounding. Do you think the pies have something to do with my grandmother? I ask him. There is no way to tell, Alan says, but from the sparkle in his eyes and the quickening of his step, I can tell he's hopeful, and that gives me hope too. We hail a cab and ride in silence for fifteen minutes until our driver pulls up in front of the address the young man at the bakery gave us. It's a small bakery that looks typically French, except for its sign, which is in both Arabic and French. Inside, the smell of yeast is heavy, and the walls are lined with baguettes standing vertically. The display case in front is an endless array of pastries dotted with fruits and crystallized sugar. I recognize the large star pies immediately. With their signature crisscross crust pattern that I've been making for years, and my heartbeat picks up. Surely this is a sign that we're on the right path. We ask the young man behind the counter whether we can speak with the owner, and a moment later, a tall, middle-aged man with caramel skin and jet black hair, graying at the temples, emerges from a back room. He's wearing a stark white baker's apron over perfectly pressed khaki slacks and a pale blue button-down shirt. Ah, yes, Saib telephoned from the mosque and told me you would be coming, the man says after greeting the four of us. I am Hassan Ramyo, and you are most welcome here, but I am afraid I may not be able to help you. My heart sinks, sir. Do you know where the recipe for the pies with the star lattice crust comes from? I ask in a small voice, pointing to the pies in the display case. He shakes his head. I have owned this bakery for twenty years now, he tells me, and the recipe has been here as long as I can remember. My mother before me made it too, but she died long ago. I thought always it was a family recipe. It's a Jewish recipe, Alan interjects softly. Monsieur Romeo looks at him with raised eyebrows. It comes from my grandmother's mother in Poland many years ago. Jewish, Monsieur Romeo asks, and Polish. Are you quite certain? Alan nods. It is the exact same recipe my grandparents made in their bakery, before World War Two. We believe there is a chance my sister may have taught your family how to make this pie, during the war. Monsieur Romeo looks at Alan for a long time and then nods. Alors, my parents have both died, but they were young in the war, just children. They would not remember, but my mother's uncle—he may know. Is he here? I ask. Monsieur Romeo laughs. No, Madame. He is very old. He is seventy-nine. Seventy-nine is not old. Henri mutters under his breath behind me, but Monsieur Romeo doesn't seem to hear him. I will telephone him now, he says. But he is nearly deaf. You understand? It is difficult to talk with him. Please try, I say in a small voice. He nods. Now I admit I am curious too. He crosses behind the counter, picks up a cell phone, and scrolls through the phone's address book. He pushes send a moment later, and lifts the phone to his ear. It's not until I hear him say, "Allo, Uncle Nabi," that I realize I've been holding my breath. I exhale slowly. I listen without understanding as he speaks loudly into the phone in French, repeating himself several times. Finally, he puts his hand over the mouthpiece and addresses me. "This tart of stars," he says. "My." Uncle Nobby says his family learned it from a young woman. Alan and I exchange glances. 
When? I ask urgently. Monsieur Romeo says something else into the phone. Then he repeats himself more loudly. He puts his hand over the receiver once more. During l'année 1942, he says. 1942. I gasp. Is it possible? I ask Alan, my voice trailing off. I turn to Monsieur Romeo. Does your uncle remember anything about this woman? I watch as he repeats my question in French over the phone. A moment later, he looks up at us again. Rose, he says. Elle s'est appelée Rose. What? I ask Alan in a panic. Alan turns to me with a smile. He says that the woman's name was Rose. That's my grandmother, I murmur, looking at Monsieur Romeo. He nods, then he says something else into the phone and listens for a moment. He hangs up and scratches his head. This is all very unusual, he says. He glances at Alan, then back at me. All of these years I had no idea. His voice trails off and he clears his throat. My uncle, Nabi Hadam, would like you to visit him right away. D'accord? Merci, d'accord. Alan agrees instantly. He glances at me. Okay, he translates. We will go now. Five minutes later, Simon, Henri, Alan, and I are in a cab heading south, toward an address on the Rue de Lyonnais, which Monsieur Romeo assured us was close by. I check my watch again. It's 8.25. We'll barely make our flight, but right now, this feels like something we have to do. I'm shaking by the time we pull up to Nabi Hadam's apartment building. He's already outside waiting for us. I know from what Mr. Romeo told us that he's just a year younger than Alan, but he looks like he's from a different generation entirely. His hair is jet black and his face isn't nearly as lined as my uncle's. He's dressed in a gray suit and his hands are clasped together. As we step out of the car, he stares at me. You are her granddaughter, he says haltingly, before we've had a chance to introduce ourselves. You are the granddaughter of Rose. I take a deep breath. Yes. He smiles and strides quickly over. He kisses me on both cheeks. You are a mirror image, he says. There are tears in his eyes as he pulls away. Alan introduces himself as Rose's brother, and Henri and Simon say hello, too. I tell Monsieur Hadam that my name is Hope. It is right, this name, he murmurs. For your grandmother, she survived because of Hope. He blinks a few times and smiles. Please, come in. He gestures to the door of the building, punches in a code, and leads us into a dark hallway. A door to the left is ajar, and he pushes it open farther for us. My home, he says, gesturing around. You are welcome here. Once we're seated in a dimly lit room lined with books and photographs of whom I'm guessing are Monsieur Hadam's family members, Alan leans forward. How did you know my sister, Rose? Pardon? He says. He blinks a few times and says, I am nearly so deaf. I am sorry. Alan repeats the question loudly, and this time Monsieur Hadam nods. He smiles and leans back in his chair. He looks at Alan for a long time before answering. You are her younger brother. You had eleven years in 1942. Oui, Alan says. She talked of you often, he says simply. She did, 
Alan asks in a whisper. Monsieur Hadam nods. I think it was one reason why she was so kind to me. I had just ten years old that year, you see. She told me often that I made her think of you. Alan looks down, and I know he's struggling not to cry in front of the other men. She thought you were all lost, Monsieur Hadam says after a moment. I think her heart, it was broken because of this. She often cried herself to sleep, and she said your names as she wept. When Alan looks up again, there's a single tear rolling down his right cheek. He brushes it away. I thought she was lost, too. He says, all these years. Monsieur Hadam turns to me. You are her granddaughter, he says. And so she lived. She lived, I say softly. Still, she is alive. I pause. Yes, I'm about to tell him that she's had a stroke, but I swallow the words. I'm not sure whether it's because I'm not ready to acknowledge the fact or because I don't want to ruin Monsieur Hadam's happy ending. How? What happened? I finally ask. Monsieur Hadam smiles. Can I get any of you a cup of tea? He asks. We all shake our heads. The men are as eager as I am to hear the story. Very well. Monsieur Hadam says, I will tell you. He takes a deep breath. She came to us in July of 1942, the night those terrible roundups began. The Valdive, I say. Monsieur Hadam nods. Yes, before that, I think many people were blind to what was happening. Even after that, Many people remained blind, but Rose, she knew it was coming, and she came to us for sanctuary. My family, we took her in. She told the officials at the mosque that her mother's family were bakers, so they asked us if we could provide her refuge for a time. That was a time in the world when a shared profession meant more than different religions. I looked up to Rose in a way that concerned my father at first because she was different and I was not supposed to have such admiration for a young woman from a different world, he continues. But she was kind and gentle and taught me many things. And in time, I think my parents understood that she was not so different from us after all. He pauses for a moment, his head bent. Finally, he sighs and continues. She lived with us as a Muslim for two months. Every morning and every night, she said our prayers with us, which made my parents happy. But she still prayed to her God, too. I heard her every night, long into the night, asking for the protection of the people she loved. It seems that in you, God answered her prayers. He smiles at Alan, who covers his face with his hands and looks away. We taught her many things about Islam and about baking, Monsieur Hadam continues, and in turn, she taught us many things, she worked in our bakery. She and my mother spent hours in the kitchen whispering to each other. I do not know what about. My mother would always say it was woman talk. But Rose, she taught us the tart de étoile, the star pie that brought you here to me today. It was her favorite, and it was my favorite too because Rose told me the story. What story? I ask. Monsieur Hadam looks surprised. The story of why she made the crust of stars. Alan and I exchange looks. 
Why? I ask. What's the story? You do not know, Monsieur Haddam asks. When Alan and I shake our heads, he continues. It was because it made her think of her true love's promise to love her as long as there were stars in the sky. I look at Alan. Jacob, I whisper. He nods. All these years that I've been making star pies, I realize I've been baking a tribute to a man I never knew existed. A small noise rises from the back of my throat as I choke back a sob that seems to come from nowhere. There were many nights when it is not safe to be outside, or when the clouds covered the city, or when smoke hung thick in the air, Monsieur Haddam continues. On those nights that Rose could not see the stars, she said she needed comfort in something, and so she began putting the stars in her tarts. Years later, when I was a young man, my mother used to bake me the same pies and remind me that true love is worth everything. It is not a common concept in those days. There were many arranged marriages. But she was right, and I waited. I married the love of my life. And so for the rest of my days, I have made the tart des étoiles in honor of Rose, and I taught my children and my cousins and the next generation to do the same, to remember to wait for love, like Rose did, like I did. So then, did Rose reunite with the man she loved? Monsieur Haddam asks after a moment. After the war? Alan and I exchange looks. No, I say, feeling the weight of the loss pressing against my chest. Monsieur Haddam looks down and shakes his head sadly. Beside me, Henri clears his throat. I'd become so enraptured by Monsieur Haddam's story that I'd almost forgotten that he and Simon were still here. So how did he get out of Paris? he asks. Monsieur Haddam shakes his head. It is impossible to know for sure. Part of the reason that the mosque was able to save many people was that everything was shrouded in secrecy. The Quran teaches us to give to those in need and to do it quietly, for God will know your deeds. For that reason, and because of the danger involved, no one talked of these things, even then, certainly not to a ten-year-old boy. But from what I have learned since that time, I believe many of the Jews we sheltered were brought through the catacombs to the River Seine. Perhaps she was smuggled onto a barge that took her down the river to Dijon or taken with false papers across the line of demarcation. Was that not expensive? Henri asks. Getting false papers? Getting across the line? He turns to me and adds, My family could not get out because of the expense. Yes, Monsieur Haddam replies. But the mosque helped her with papers. That much I know. And the man she loved, Jacob, he left her with money. She sewed it into the lining of one of her dresses. My mother helped her. Once she was in the unoccupied zone, it would have been easier for her to get out of the country, Monsieur Haddam continues. Here in Paris, she lived as a Muslim with false papers, but in Dijon, or wherever she went, she likely filled out a census form with the Jean de Marie. Because she was French, she was likely able to pay a small bribe and obtain papers listing her as Catholic. From there, she could have made it to Spain. She met my grandfather in Spain, I say. 
Your grandfather is not Jacob, Monsieur Haddam asks with a frown. It seems impossible that she loved another so soon. No, I say softly. My grandfather's name was Ted. He bows his head. So she married another. He pauses. I always assumed Rose perished, he says. So many did in those days. I always believed she would have made contact after the war if she had lived, but perhaps she wanted only to forget this life. I think of what Gavin said about some Holocaust survivors wanting to start over when they believe they'd lost everything. But why are there no records of any of this? I ask after a moment. It's so brave and heroic what your family did, what other people at the Grand Mosque did. Monsieur Haddam smiles. At the time, we could not keep any sort of written record, he says. We knew we were tying our fate to that of the people we saved. If the Nazis or the French police had raided the mosque and found even one piece of evidence, it could have been the end of us all. So we helped quietly, he concludes. It is the thing I am proudest of in all my life. Thank you, Alan whispers. For what you did, for saving my sister. Monsieur Haddam shakes his head. There is no need to thank me. It was our duty. In our religion, we are taught whoever saves one life saves the entire world. Alan makes a strange, strangled sound. In the Talmud, it is written if you save one life, it is as if you have saved the world, he says softly. He and Monsieur Haddam look at each other for a moment and smile. We are not so different then, Monsieur Haddam says. He looks at Henri and Simon and then back at Alan. I never understood the war between our religions or the war with Christianity. If there is one thing I learned from the time young Rose spent with us, it is that we are all speaking to the same God. It is not religion that divides man. It is good and evil here on earth that divides us. The words sink in as we look at one another in silence. Your sister, Monsieur Haddam continues, turning to Alan, she suffered every day because she left her family. She never believed she did enough to save you. But you understand, of course, she did what she had to do. She had to save her baby. In the silence that follows, you could hear a pin drop. Her baby? Alan finally asks, his voice an octave higher than it should be. My mouth is suddenly dry. Yes, of course, says Monsieur Haddam. He blinks at us. It is why she came here. She was with child. You did not know. Alan turns to stare at me. Did you know this? Of course not, I say. It's... it's not possible. My mother wasn't born until 1944. I turned back to Monsieur Haddam, and my mom didn't have any siblings. My grandmother couldn't have been pregnant in 1942. He pauses and stands up. Excuse me for a moment, he says. He disappears into his bedroom while Alan and I go back to staring at each other. How could she have been pregnant? Alan asks. Well, she and Jacob were in love, Henri says, his voice trailing off. Alan shakes his head. No, absolutely not. She was very religious, he says. She would never have done such a thing. He glances at me and adds, Things were different in those days. People did not have relations before marriage. 
Certainly not Rose. Maybe Monsieur Hadam is remembering wrong, I say. But when he emerges from his bedroom a moment later, he's carrying a photograph, which he hands to me. I recognize my grandmother immediately. She looks just like I looked when I was sixteen or seventeen, and her head is wrapped in a scarf. She has one arm around a dark-haired, smiling boy, and the other around a middle-aged woman. That is my mother and me, Monsieur Hadam says softly, and your grandmother, the day she left, the last time I ever saw her. I nod, but I can't seem to speak, because I can't look away from the bulging belly in the photograph. There's no doubt that my grandmother is pregnant. She gazes into the camera with wide eyes that broadcast extraordinary sadness, even in grainy black and white. Alan sinks down beside me on the couch and stares at the photo, too. She knew that if she was taken to one of the camps, she would be killed as soon as they found out she was with child. Monsieur Hadam says softly after a moment. She knew she had to protect herself in order to protect the baby. It was the only reason she let Jacob separate her from her family. My God, Alan murmurs. But what happened to the baby? I ask. Monsieur Hadam frowns at me. You are certain that the baby was not your mother? I nod. My mother was born a year and a half later to my grandfather Ted, not Jacob. I turn to Alan. The baby must have died, I say softly. Even saying the words aloud horrifies me. Alan hangs his head. There is so much we do not know. What if she does not wake up? He murmurs. His words send me hurtling back from a past we can't escape to a present we can't control. But we can control whether we leave for the airport on time. I look at my watch and stand up. Monsieur Hadam, I'm sorry, but we have to leave. I say, I don't know how to thank you. He smiles. Young lady, you do not have to, he replies, knowing that Rose lived and went on to have a happy life is thanks enough for a million years. I wonder, in that moment, whether my grandmother's life was happy. Had she ever let go of the sadness she must have felt when she believed she lost Jacob and her family forever? Please, Monsieur Hadam says, tell your grandmother that I think of her often, and that I thank her for helping me to believe in finding love. She changed my life. I will never forget her. Thank you so much, Monsieur Hadam, I murmur. I'll tell her. He kisses me on both cheeks, and as I follow Alan, Henri, and Simon back out to the street to hail a cab to the airport, I find myself wondering whether this is why Mamie sent me here. I wonder whether somewhere deep down she wanted me to hear the story of her first love and of the lost child she gave everything to protect. I wonder whether I'm supposed to learn something about love from all of this. Or perhaps it's too late for me. Alan and I are silent on the way to the airport, both of us lost in our own worlds. Chapter 16 Anise and Fennel Cookies Ingredients Two cups sugar four eggs, two teaspoons anise extract, three cups flour plus extra for rolling, three teaspoons baking powder, one teaspoon salt, one teaspoon anise seed, two cups confectioner's sugar, one tablespoon fennel seed. 
Directions 1. Preheat oven to 350 degrees. 2. In a medium bowl, using a hand mixer, beat sugar, eggs, and anise extract until well blended. 3. Sift together 3 cups flour, baking powder, and salt, then add to the egg mixture, approximately 1 cup at a time, beating after each addition. 4. Add anise seed and make sure mixture is well blended. 5. In a separate, shallow bowl, mix together confectioner sugar and fennel seed. 6. Flour hands lightly and roll tablespoon-sized lumps of dough into balls. Roll each ball in confectioner sugar mixture, making sure it's well coated, and place on greased cookie sheets. 7. Bake for 12 minutes. Cool for 5 minutes on baking sheets, then remove to wire racks. Rose Something was terribly wrong, and Rose knew it. All afternoon, she'd been sitting in front of her television, watching daytime reruns of programs she knew she had seen before. But it didn't matter. She couldn't remember the plots anyhow. She had grown very tired, and back in her room, she realized she could no longer feel her body. Then, everything had gone black. The world had still been dark as night when they came for her, the people from the home. She heard them saying, unconscious, and stroke, and barely hanging on, and she wanted to tell them that she was fine. But she found that she could no longer use her tongue, nor could she open her eyes, and it was the first time that she realized her body was failing her, just like her mind was. Perhaps it was time. And so she let go and drifted further into the past. As the ambulance siren sounded in the distance, as the doctors shouted and gave orders from very far away, as the small voice of a child cried near her bed, she released her grip on the present and let herself float like jetsam on a wave back to a time just before the world fell apart. There were voices then, too, in the darkness, just as there were now. And as the present disappeared, the past came into focus, and Rose found herself in her father's study, in the apartment on Rue de General Camus. She was seventeen again, and she felt as if she had a crystal ball and no one believed her. Please, she was begging her father, her voice hoarse from endless hours of fruitless persuasion. If we stay, we die, Papa. They are coming for us. The Nazis were everywhere. German soldiers filled the streets, and the French police followed along like lemmings. Jews were no longer permitted to go without the yellow star of David sewn over their left breast, a brand marking them as different. Nonsense, said her father, a proud man who believed in his country and in the goodness of his fellow man. Only criminals and cowards run. No, papa, Rose whispered. It's not just criminals and cowards. It's people who want to save themselves, who don't want to blindly follow, hoping that everything will be okay. Her father closed his eyes and rubbed the bridge of his nose. Beside him, Rose's mother rubbed his arm comfortingly and looked at her daughter. You are upsetting your father, Rose, she said. But Mama... Rose exclaimed. We are French, her father said tersely, opening his eyes. They are not deporting French. But they are, Rose whispered. And Mama is not French. To them, she is still Polish. In their eyes, that makes her and us 
for a nurse. You are talking nonsense, child, her father said. This roundup is going to be different, Rose said. She felt like she'd said it a thousand times before, but her father wasn't hearing her because he didn't want to. They are coming for all of us this time. Jacob says... Rose? Her father interrupted, slamming his fist on the table. Beside him, Rose's mother jumped, startled, and shook her head sadly. That boy has a runaway imagination. Papa, it's not his imagination. Rose had never spoken against her parents before, but she had to make them believe her. This was life and death. How could they be so blind? You are our father, Papa. You have to protect us. Enough, her father roared. You will not tell me how to run my family. That boy, Jacob, will not tell me how to run my family. I am protecting you children and your mother by following the rules. Do not tell me how to be a parent. You know nothing of such things. Rose fought back the tears in her eyes. She put her right hand on her belly, without intending to, and she quickly moved it back to her side when she saw her mother look at her curiously and frown. She wouldn't be able to hide it from them for much longer, and then they would know. Would they forgive her? Would they understand? Rose thought not. She wished she could tell them the truth, but now wasn't the time. It would only complicate matters. Before she did anything, she needed to save them. Rose, her father said after a moment. He stood and walked over to where she sat. He knelt beside her, the way he used to when she was a little girl. She remembered, in that moment, the way he'd been so patient with her when he'd taught her to tie her shoelaces, the way he'd comforted her the first time she skinned her knee, the way he'd pinched her cheeks when she was just a little girl and called her ma filfi en sucre, my little girl made of sugar. We will do what they say. If we follow the rules, everything will be fine. She looked into his eyes and knew at that moment that she would never change his mind. And so she wept, for she had already lost him. She had already lost them all. When Jacob came for her later that night, she wasn't ready. How could she ever be ready? She gazed into his gold-flecked green eyes, which had always reminded her of a magical ocean, and thought about how she could get lost there forever. Her own eyes filled with hot, stinging tears as she realized she might never sail those seas again. Rose, we must go, he whispered urgently. He took her in his arms and tried to absorb her sobs with his body. But how can I leave them, Jacob? She whispered into his chest. You must, my love, he said. You must save our baby. She looked up at him. She knew he was right. There were tears in his eyes, too. Will you try to protect them? She asked. With every ounce of my being, Jacob vowed. But first... I must protect you. Before they left, she slipped into the room Alan and Claude shared. Claude was sleeping soundly, but Alan was wide awake. You're leaving now, aren't you, Rose? Alan whispered as she drew close. She sat down on the side of his bed. Yes, my dear, she whispered. Will you come with us? I must stay with Mama and Papa. Alan said after a moment. Maybe they are right. They are not, Rose said. Alan nodded. I know, he whispered. He paused for a moment and then wrapped his arms around her. 
I love you, Rose, he whispered. I love you too, my little man, she replied, pulling him tightly to her. She knew Alan didn't understand why she was leaving him. She knew it seemed to him as if she was choosing Jacob over her family. But she couldn't tell him about the baby growing within her. He was eleven, too young to understand. She hoped that someday he would realize that she felt as though her heart were being ripped in two. Thirty minutes later, Jacob led her through an alleyway, where his friend Jean-Michel, who was part of the resistance movement, waited outside a darkened doorway. Jean-Michel kissed Rose hello on both cheeks. You are very brave, Rose, he said simply. I am not brave. I am frightened, she replied. She did not want anyone to think she was brave. To think it was brave to leave her family behind was absurd. She felt, in that moment, like the worst human being on earth. May we have a moment alone? Jacob asked Jean-Michel. Jean-Michel nodded. But quickly, please, there isn't much time. He slipped through the doorway, leaving Rose and Jacob alone in the darkness. You are doing the right thing. Jacob whispered. It does not feel that way anymore, Rose said. She took a deep breath. You are completely sure about this roundup? Jacob nodded. I'm certain. It's beginning in a few hours, Rose. She shook her head. What has happened to us? She asked. To this country? The world has gone mad, Jacob murmured. She took a deep breath. You will come back for me. I will come back for you, Jacob said immediately. You are my life, Rose. You and our baby, you know that. I know, she whispered. I will find you, Rose, Jacob said. When all of the horrors are over and you are safe, I will come for you. I give you my word. I will not rest until I am beside you again. Nor will I, Rose murmured. He pulled her to him, and she breathed in the scent of him, memorized the feel of his arms around her, pressed her head against his chest, and wished she never had to let go. But then Jean-Michel was back, and he was gently pulling her away from Jacob, softly telling her that they had to go now, before it was too late. She knew only that Jean-Michel, a Catholic, was taking her to another man who was part of a resistance, a man named Ali, who was a Muslim. It was the sort of thing that would have made her smile, Catholics, Jews, and Muslims working together as one, had the world not been falling down around them. Jacob pulled her to him once more for one more long kiss goodbye. As Jean-Michel led her away, she pulled away from him. Jacob, she called softly into the darkness. I'm here, he said. He reappeared from the shadows. She took a deep breath. Go back for them, please, my family. I can't lose them. I can't live with myself if they perish because I did not try hard enough. Jacob stared into her eyes for a moment. Rose wanted to take the words back because she knew what she was asking, but there wasn't time. He nodded and said simply, I will go back. I promise. I love you. And then he was gone into the inky darkness. Rose stood paralyzed, rooted to the spot, for what felt like an eternity but was only a few seconds. No, she murmured to herself. What have I done? She took a step after Jacob, meaning to stop him, meaning to warn him, but Jean-Michel wrapped his arms around her and held tight. No, he said. No, it is in God's hands now. 
you must come with me. But, she protested, trying to pull away. It is in God's hands, Jean-Michel repeated as sobs began to rack Rose's body. He held her more tightly and whispered into the darkness, For now, all we can do is pray and hope that God can hear us. It was torture, after that, to live in Paris in secret, knowing that within a mile or two, her family or Jacob might also be in hiding, knowing that she could not reach out to find them, that her one responsibility now was protecting the child within her, made her weep with helplessness every night. The people who took her in, the Hadams, were kind, although she knew the mother and the father did not want her there. She was, after all, a liability. She knew her very presence put them in danger. If not for the baby she had vowed to protect, she would have left long ago, out of politeness. Still, they were hospitable, and over time they seemed to accept her. Their boy, Nabi, reminded Rose of Alan, and this is what kept her sane most days. She could talk to him the way she had once talked to her little brother, and in that way, this new home felt a little more like the one she'd left behind. She and Madame Hadam spent many hours in the kitchen, and after a while, Rose had the courage to offer Madame Hadam some of the recipes from her own family's Ashkenaze bakery. Madame Hadam, in turn, taught Rose to make many delicious pastries that she never heard of before. You should know how to cook with rose water, Madame Hadam had told her one day. It is only fitting for a girl named Rose. And so Rose fell in love with the almond crescents and the orange blossom baklava and the rose water cookies that crumbled in her mouth like magic, and these were the foods that nourished the baby within her. Her father had often said negative things about the Muslims, but Rose knew that he'd been just as wrong about religion as he had been about the intentions of the Nazis. The Hadams had put their own lives at risk to save hers. They were some of the best people she had ever known. Furthermore, Rose knew that in order to make pastries like the ones the Hadams made, one had to be good and kind. One's heart always came out in the baking, and if there was darkness in your soul, there would be darkness in your pastries, too. In the Hadams' pastries, though— there was light and goodness. Rose could taste it, and she hoped the baby growing inside her could too. Sometimes Madame Hadam would let Rose accompany her to the market, as long as Rose vowed not to speak and veiled herself with a scarf. She liked the anonymity it gave her, and at the market, even though the Hadam shopped in a Muslim neighborhood— Rose would scan the crowd desperately, hoping for a glimpse of someone from her old life. One day on the street, she saw Jean-Michel, but she couldn't yell for him because of the sudden lump in her throat. By the time she could make a sound again, he was long gone. One evening, after saying the Salah in Arabic with the Hadams, Rose was in her own room praying in Hebrew when she turned around and saw Nabi watching her. Come, Nabi, she said to the boy. Pray with me. He knelt beside her while she finished her prayers, and then they sat together in silence. Rose, he asked after a long while, do you think God speaks Arabic or Hebrew? Can he hear your prayers or mine? Rose considered this for a moment and realized that she did not know the answer. She had begun to doubt recently that God could hear her at all, no matter what language she spoke. For if he could hear her, how could he allow her family and Jacob to vanish from her life? I do not know, she said finally. 
What do you think, Nabi? The boy thought about this for a long time before replying. I think God must speak all the languages. His tone was confident. I think he can hear all of us. Do you think we are all praying to the same God? Rose asked after a moment. Muslims and Jews and Christians and all the people who believe in other things. Nabi appeared to be considering this question quite seriously, too. Yes, he finally told Rose. Yes, there is one God, and he lives in the sky, and he hears all of us. It is just that here on earth we are confused about how to believe in him. But what does it matter as long as we trust he is there? Rose smiled at that. I think perhaps you are right, Nabi, she said. She thought of the words Jean-Michel had spoken to her the last time she saw Jacob. For now, she said softly to the young boy, reaching out to ruffle his hair. All we can do is pray and hope that God can hear us. Chapter 17 After persuading the gate agent to take us after the required check-in time, rushing through security and running to our gate, Alan and I make it onto our flight five minutes before they close the cabin doors. I used Alan's cell phone to call Annie from the taxi, but she didn't answer, nor did Gavin or Rob, both of whom I tried. Mamie's home had no new information about her condition, and the nurse I reached at the hospital said that my grandmother was stable, but that it was impossible to tell how long she'd stay that way. As we taxi down the runway and take off over Paris, I watch the Seine disappear beneath us, a ribbon cutting through the land, and I imagine Mamie hiding on a barge at the age of seventeen, slowly snaking down the same Topaz River to the unoccupied zone. Is that how she'd gotten out of Paris? I wonder whether we'll ever really know. What do you think happened to the baby she was carrying? Alan asks me softly as we climb higher into the sky. We're above the clouds now, with sunlight filtering down all around us, and I can't help but wonder whether this is a bit like what heaven looks like. I shake my head. I don't know. I should have guessed that she was with child, Alan says. It explains why she left us. That never made sense to me. It would not have been in her nature to run and leave us behind. She would have stayed to try to persuade us, to try to protect us, even if it meant risking her own life. But she believed it was more important to protect the baby, I murmur. Alan nods, and it was. She was right. That is what it means to be a parent, is it not? I think it was the same with my parents. They truly thought that following the rules would protect us all. Who could have known that their best intention would lead where it did? I shake my head, too sad to speak. I can't imagine the feeling of horror my great-grandmother must have felt when Danielle and David were torn from her. Had she been able to stay with the oldest, Aline, after they separated the men and the women? Had she lived long enough to suffer the anguish of realizing that all her children had been lost? Had my great-grandfather regretted not listening to his daughter's words of warning? What would it feel like as a parent to realize too late that you'd made a terrible, irreversible mistake and that your children were going to die for it? I stare out the window for a long moment and turn back to Alan. Maybe my grandmother couldn't care for the baby. Maybe the baby was born and she put it up for adoption. I don't really believe the words, but it feels better to say them. Impossible, I think, Alan says. He frowns. 
If the baby was a piece of her and Jacob, I cannot imagine there was any way she would have parted with the child. He looks at me sideways and adds, You are absolutely certain there is no chance the baby was your mother? He asks. I shake my head. When my mother died a couple of years ago, I had to get her estate in order, I say. I remember looking at her birth certificate. It clearly said 1944. Plus, she looked a lot like my grandfather. Alan sighs. The baby must have died then. I look away. I can't imagine anything sadder. But to think she would get pregnant again so soon after... I add, my voice trailing off. I can't understand that piece of the puzzle. That is not as unusual as it sounds, Alan says softly. He sighs again and turns to look out the window. After the war, many Shoah survivors married and tried to have babies right away, even the ones who were malnourished and had no money. I look at Alan, surprised. But why would they do that? To create life when everything around them was death, he says simply, to be a part of a family again, after they'd lost everyone they'd ever loved. By the time Rose met your grandfather, she must have thought that all of us, including Jacob, were dead, and if she had lost the baby too, she must have felt very, very alone. Maybe she just wanted to create a family so that she'd have a place in the world again. It takes an eternity to get our bags, get through customs, and retrieve my car from the parking garage, but eventually we're on our way to the Cape. We're out of Boston just before rush hour hits, and as we hurdle south on Route 3, I take my chances, weaving in and out of traffic at 20 miles over the speed limit. I call Annie on the way, and this time she answers. Her voice sounds hollow, but she tells me she's at the hospital and that there hasn't been any change in Mamie's condition. Is your dad with you? I ask. No, she says without elaborating. I can feel my blood pressure rising. Where is he? Don't know, she says. Maybe at the office? Did you ask him to go with you to the hospital? Annie hesitates. He was here earlier, but he had to leave to get some work done. It physically hurts my heart to hear her say that. I want nothing more than to protect my daughter, and it seems that the last place in the world I should be looking for potential harm is from her other parent. I'm sorry, honey, I say. I'm sure your dad must be very busy, but he should have stayed with you. It's fine, Annie mumbles. Gavin's here. My heart lurches. Again? Yeah, he called to see if I was okay, and I told him Dad had left. I didn't ask him to come, but he just came. Oh, I say. You want to talk to him? I'm about to say yes, but I realize we'll be there in an hour. Just tell him I said hi and thank you. We'll be there soon. Annie is silent for a moment. Who's we? You got a new boyfriend now, too, or something? I laugh, despite myself. No, I say. I glance at Alan, who's watching Pembroke roll by outside his window. But I do have a surprise for you. An hour later, we're in Hyannis hurrying through the sliding front doors of Cape Cod Hospital. The nurse at the front desk directs us to the third floor, and I see Annie sitting in the waiting room, her head hung low. Beside her, Gavin is flipping through a magazine. They both look up at the same time. Mom! Annie exclaims, apparently forgetting for a moment that she's recently become too cool to greet me with enthusiasm. 
She jumps up from her chair and hugs me. Gavin gives me a little wave and a crooked half smile. I mouth, thank you, over Annie's head. Annie finally pulls back and notices Alan for the first time. He's standing beside me, frozen to the spot, staring at her. Hi, Annie says. She reaches out her hand. I'm Annie. Who are you? Alan shakes her hand slowly, then opens and closes his mouth without saying anything. I put a hand on his back, smile at my daughter, and say gently, Annie, this is Mamie's brother. He's your great-great-uncle. Annie looks up at me with wide eyes. Mamie's brother? She looks back at Alan. You're really Mamie's brother? Alan nods, and this time he finds words. You look so familiar, my dear, he says. Annie looks at me and then back at Alan. Do I, like, look like Mamie looked when she was my age? Alan shakes his head slowly. Perhaps a little, but that is not who you resemble. Is it someone named Leona? Annie asks eagerly. Because Mamie keeps calling me that. Alan furrows his brow and shakes his head. I do not think I know a Leona. Annie frowns, and I look up to realize Gavin has crossed the room and is standing a few steps behind my daughter. For a split second, I have a powerful urge to throw my arms around him, but I blink and take a step back instead. Gavin, I say, this is Alan, my grandmother's brother. Alan, this is Gavin. I pause, and as an afterthought, I add, my friend. Gavin's eyes are wide. He reaches out and shakes Alan's hand. I can't believe you and Hope found each other, Gavin says. Alan glances at me and then back at Gavin. I understand that she had some help and encouragement from you, young man. Gavin shrugs and looks away. No, sir, she did it on her own. I just told her a few things I knew about Holocaust research. Do not take away the importance of what you did, Alan says. You helped reunite our family. He blinks a few times and asks Gavin, can we see her now? My sister. Gavin hesitates. Technically, visiting hours are over, but I know a few of the nurses here. Let me see what I can do. I watch as Gavin approaches a pretty blonde nurse who looks like she's in her early twenties. She laughs and twirls her hair while she talks to him. I'm surprised to realize that watching them together makes me feel a little jealous. I blink a few times, turn away, and put a hand on Alan's arm. Are you okay? I ask. You must be exhausted. He nods. I just need to see Rose. Annie launches into a rapid-fire series of questions. When did you last see Mamie? How come you thought she died? How did you escape those Nazis? What happened to your parents? which Alan answers patiently. As Annie bends her head toward his and continues to babble excitedly, I smile. After a moment, Gavin returns and puts a hand on my arm, and as he does, a strange jolt of something shoots through me. I pull away quickly like I've been burned. Gavin frowns and clears his throat. I talk to Krista, the nurse. She says she can sneak us back, but only for a few minutes. They're pretty strict about visiting hours here. I nod. Thank you, I say. Oddly, I can't bring myself to thank Krista as she leads the four of us down a narrow hallway, her blonde ponytail bobbing perkily behind her as her narrow hips swish back and forth exaggeratedly. I could swear she's walking that way for Gavin's benefit, but he doesn't seem to notice. He has a hand on Alan's shoulder and is guiding the older man gently toward a doorway at the end of the hall. 
Five minutes, Krista whispers as we stop in front of the last door on the right, or I'll get in trouble. Thank you so much, Gavin says. I owe ya. You can take me out to dinner sometime? Krista says. The end of the statement rises like a question, and as she bats her eyes at him, she reminds me of a cartoon character. I don't wait to hear his reply. I tell myself it's not important. I follow Annie and Alan into the room, and I gasp at the sight of the still figure lying in the hospital bed, seemingly swallowed by a mound of sheets. Mamie looks tiny, pale, and shrunken, and beside me, I can feel Alan flinch. I want to tell him that the last time I saw her, she didn't look like this. In fact, I hardly recognize her without her signature burgundy lipstick and coal eyeliner. But I'm as dumbstruck as he is. We both approach, Annie trailing behind us. She looks real bad, doesn't she? Annie murmurs. I turn and put my arm around her, and she doesn't pull away. I put my right hand on top of Mamie's left hand, which feels cold. She doesn't move. They apparently found her slumped over her desk when she didn't come down for dinner, Gavin says softly. I turn and see him standing in the doorway. They called 911 right away, he adds. I nod, too choked up to speak. Beside me, I can feel Annie trembling a little, and I look down to see her blinking back tears. I pull her closer, and she wraps both arms around me for a hug. We watch as Alan approaches the bed and kneels down so that his face is even with Mamie's. He murmurs something to her, and then he reaches out and strokes her face gently. Tears are glistening in his eyes. I thought I would never see her again, he whispers. It has been nearly seventy years. Is she going to be okay? Annie asks Alan. She's staring at him as if his answer determines everything. Alan hesitates and nods. Annie, I do not know, but I can't believe that God would reunite us only to take her away without a goodbye. I have to believe there's a reason in all of this. Annie nods vigorously. Me too. Before we can say anything more, the perky nurse reappears at the doorway. Time's up, she says. My supervisor is on her way. Gavin and I exchange looks. Okay, Gavin says. Thanks, Krista. We'll get out of here. He nods at me, and I slowly lead Annie away from Mamie. I glance back over my shoulder as I near the door, and I see Alan with his head bent over Mamie's again. He kisses her on the forehead, and when he turns, there are tears rolling down his face. I am sorry, he says. This is difficult. I know, I say. I reach for his hand, and together... Annie, Alan, and I walk out of the room, leaving Mamie behind in the darkness. Gavin and I part at the doorway to the hospital. He has to work at seven the next morning, and I have to open the bakery. Life has to go on. Annie takes my keys from me, and she and Alan go wait in the car. I don't know how to thank you. I tell Gavin, looking down at my feet. I didn't do anything, he says. I look up in time to see him shrug. He smiles at me. I'm really glad you found Alan. I found him because of you, I say softly. And Annie was okay while I was gone because of you. He shrugs again. Nah, I just did what anyone would do, he pauses and adds. Maybe this is out of line, but that ex-husband of yours is a real piece of work. I swallow hard. Why do you say that? He shakes his head. 
He barely seemed concerned about Annie, you know? She was so upset about your grandmother. She really needed someone. And you were there for her, I say. I don't even know what to say. Yeah, well, say you'll spot me a cup of coffee on my way to the porch repair job I'm doing at Joe Sullivan's place tomorrow, he says, and we'll be even. I laugh at this. Yeah, sure, a cup of coffee is definitely equal to taking care of my daughter and helping reunite my family. Gavin looks at me for a long time, so intently that my heart starts thudding. I did those things because I want to help, he says. Why? I ask, realizing before I can stop myself that I sound rude and ungrateful. He stares at me again and shrugs. Stop selling yourself short, Hope, he says. And with that, he's gone. I watch him get into his old Wrangler and wave to Annie as he pulls out of the parking lot. Mom, we have to find Jacob Levy, Annie announces the next morning when she and Alan show up at the bakery together, arms linked. Concerned that he was overexerting himself, I suggested that Alan sleep in, but he and Annie have been inseparable since meeting at the hospital the night before, so I should have suspected that she'd bring him to the bakery with her. Alan told me all about him, she adds proudly. Annie, honey, I say, glancing at Alan, who is rolling up his sleeves and glancing around the kitchen. We don't even know if Jacob is still alive. But what if he is, Mom? Annie asks, her voice taking on a desperate edge. What if he's out there somewhere and he's been looking for Mamie all these years? What if he could come here and that would make her wake up? Sweetheart, that's unlikely. Annie glowers at me. Come on, Mom. Don't you believe in love? I sigh. I believe in chocolate, I say nodding to the pain au chocolat waiting to go into the oven. And I believe that if I don't pick up the pace here, we're not going to be ready to open at six. Whatever, Annie grumbles. She puts on a pair of pot holders and slides the chocolate croissants into the oven. She sets the timer and then turns around to roll her eyes at Alan. See, I told you she's mean in the morning. Alan chuckles. I don't think your mother is being unkind, my dear, he says. I think she's trying to be realistic and also perhaps to change the subject. Why are you changing the subject, Mom? Annie demands, putting her hands on her hips. Because I don't want you to get your hopes up, I tell her. There's a huge chance Jacob Levy isn't even alive, and even if he is, there's no guarantee we'll find him. There's also no guarantee that he has waited for my grandmother all these years. I don't want to tell Annie that even if we do somehow miraculously locate him, he'll probably be married to wife number four or something. He most likely moved on from Mamie 70 years ago. That's what men do. Besides, it appears my grandmother wasted no time in moving on from him. Alan is looking closely at me, and I avert my gaze, because I have the uneasy feeling he can read exactly what I'm thinking. Can I help you with anything, Hope? He asks after a pause. I used to work in my grandparents' bakery when I was a boy. I smile. Annie can show you how to prep the batter for the blueberry muffins, I say. But don't feel like you have to help. I'm perfectly fine on my own. I didn't say that you are not, Alan says. I raise an eyebrow at him, but he has already turned around to let Annie help him tie on an apron. So, like, if Mamie was so in love with Jacob, how come she married my great-grandpa? Annie asks Alan once he turns back around. He grabs a bag of sugar and the flat of plump blueberries that Annie has pulled off the refrigerator. 
She couldn't have loved him too, right? Annie adds. Not if Jacob was her one true love. I roll my eyes, but truth be told, I wish I still believed in the concept of one true love too. Alan seems to be considering the question as he pulls out a big bowl and a wooden spoon and begins mixing sugar and flour. I watch as he measures in salt and baking powder. Annie hands him four eggs, and he sets to work cracking them in. There are all different kinds of love in this world, Annie, he says finally. He glances at me and then back at my daughter. I have no doubt that your great grandmother loved your great grandfather too. Annie stares at him. What do you mean? If Mamie was in love with Jacob, how could she also, like, be in love with my great grandpa? Alan shrugs and adds some milk and sour cream to the bowl. He mixes vigorously with the wooden spoon, and then Annie helps him fold in the blueberries. Some kinds of love are more powerful than others, Alan finally replies. It doesn't mean they aren't all real. Some loves are the kind we try to make fit, but are never quite right. He glances at me, and I look away. Others are the loves between good people who admire each other's souls and grow to love each other over time. He continues. Is that what you think Mamie and my great-grandpa had? Annie asks. Alan begins carefully lining muffin tins. Perhaps, he says. I do not know. There is also, Annie, the love that all of us have the chance to have, but that few of us are wise enough to see or brave enough to seize. That's the kind of love that can change a life. Is that how Jacob and Mamie loved each other? Annie asks. I believe it is, Alan says. But what do you mean you have to be wise enough to see it? Annie asks. Alan glances at me again, and I pretend to be busy filling a tray of miniature star pies. My fingers shake a little as I form the lattice crusts into star shapes. I mean that love is all around us, Alan says. But the older we get, the more confusing it becomes. The more times we've been hurt, the harder it is to see love right in front of us, or to accept love into our hearts and truly believe in it. And if you cannot accept love, or cannot bring yourself to believe in it, you can never really feel it. Annie looks confused. So you mean Mamie and Jacob fell in love because they were young? No, I believe your great-grandmother and Jacob fell in love because they were meant for each other, Alan replies, and because they did not run from it. They were not scared of it. They did not let their own fears get in the way. Many people in this world never fall in love that way because their hearts are already closed, and they do not even know it. I slide a tray of star pies into the smaller oven on the left and wince as I carelessly smash my hand against the oven door. I curse under my breath and set the timer. Mom? Annie asks. Did you love Dad that way? Sure I did, I say quickly, without looking at her. I don't want to tell her that if she hadn't been conceived, I never would have married her father. It wasn't a love for him that made me create a family. It was a love for the life growing inside me. But what had Mamie been thinking when she met my grandfather? She'd believed, apparently, that she'd already lost Jacob, and somewhere along the way, she lost the child she was carrying. Her life must have felt tremendously empty. Had loneliness driven her into the arms of my grandfather? How had she been able to lie beside him at night, knowing that she already had, and lost, the love of her life? 
So how come you got a divorce then? Annie asks. If you love dad like that. Sometimes things change, I reply. Not Mamie and Jacob, Annie says confidently. I bet they always loved each other. I bet they still love each other. In that moment, I feel terrible sadness for my grandfather, a kind, warm man who was endlessly devoted to his family. I wonder whether he realized that his wife had apparently given her heart away long before she met him. I look up to see Alan gazing at me thoughtfully. It is never too late to find true love, he says, locking eyes with me. You just have to keep your heart open. Yeah, well, I say, some of us just don't get that lucky. Alan nods slowly. Or sometimes we are that lucky and we are too frightened to see it. I roll my eyes. Oh, yes, there are men coming out of the woodwork wanting to woo me. Annie glances at me and then at Alan. She's right. No one asks her out, except Matt Hines, but he's, like, weird. I can feel myself blushing, and I clear my throat. Okay, Annie, I say brusquely. Let's get moving. I need you to prep the strudel, okay? Whatever, she mutters. Our open goes better than I'd expected that morning. With Alan's help, we're ready for customers by six. Gavin comes in about 6.40, but the shop is busy, so we hardly have a chance to talk as I hand him his coffee, thank him again for his help, and wish him a good day on the job at Joe Sullivan's place. Alan stays with me when Annie heads off to school, and after the morning rush is over, and I've tersely answered questions from a dozen nosy customers about where I'd vanished to for the last three days, we're alone in the bakery. Whew! Alan exclaims. You do a good business, my dear. I shrug. It could be better. Perhaps, Alan says but I think you should be thankful for what you do have. What I do have is a situation of mounting debt and a mortgage that will soon be yanked out from under me, leaving me without a business. But I don't tell him that. No reason to burden Alan with my problems. I'd imagine they pale in comparison to the worries of his lifetime anyhow. It makes me feel as if there is something terribly wrong with me if I get so easily overwhelmed by the little things. The day flies by, and Annie arrives after school with a big stack of papers in her hand. When are we going to see Mamie? she asks as she hugs Alan hello. Just as soon as we close up, I tell her. Why don't you get started on the dishes in the back? We might be able to close a little early today. Annie frowns. Can you do the dishes? I have some phone calls I gotta make. I stop pulling slices of baklava from the display case and frown at her. Phone calls? Annie holds out the sheaf of paper she's been clutching and rolls her eyes. To Jacob Levy. Duh. My eyes widen. You found Jacob Levy? Yeah, Annie says. She looks down. Well, okay, so I found a whole lot of people named Jacob Levy, and, like, that doesn't even count the ones who are listed as J. Levy, but I'm going to call them all until we find the right one. I sigh. Annie, honey, I begin. Stop, Mom, she snaps. Don't be negative. You're always negative. I'm going to find him, and you can't stop me. I open and close my mouth helplessly. I hope she's right, but it looks like she has hundreds of numbers in front of her. It's no wonder. I'm sure Jacob Levy is a very common name. So, can I use the phone in the back? I pause and nod. Yeah, as long as they're all U.S. numbers. Annie grins and skips into the kitchen. Alan smiles at me and rises to follow her. 
I miss being young and hopeful, he says. Don't you? He disappears into the kitchen behind my daughter, and I'm left standing there, feeling like Ebenezer Scrooge. When had I stopped being young and hopeful? I hadn't been trying to rain on Annie's parade. I simply want to help her manage her expectations. Expecting good things leads to getting hurt, I found. I sigh and go back to packaging the bakery items in airtight cases for freezing overnight. The baklava I made late this morning will last another couple of days. The muffins and cookies will freeze, and I should be able to recycle at least one of the strudels tomorrow morning. Our homemade donuts stay fresh for only a day, which is why I usually make only one variety each morning. Today's sugar cinnamon donuts are nearly gone, and the remaining three will likely wind up in my daily pickup basket for the women's shelter if I don't have another customer in the next few minutes. I can hear Annie in the next room chattering away into the phone, probably asking person after person whether they know a Jacob Levy who came from France after World War II. In between calls, I can hear Alan murmuring to her, and I wonder what he's saying. Is he telling her stories of Jacob to keep her inspired? Or is he being responsible and reminding her that this might be an impossible task and that she shouldn't get her hopes up? I finish emptying the bakery cases and begin carrying pastries back to the industrial freezer. I set to work washing baking sheets, muffin tins, and miniature pie molds in the back as Annie talks more loudly to be heard over the running water. Hi, my name is Annie Smith. I hear her chirp into the phone. I'm looking for a Jacob Levy who'd be like 87 now. He's French. Is there a Jacob Levy there like that? Oh, okay. Thanks anyhow. Yeah, bye. She hangs up and Alan murmurs something to her. She giggles, picks up the phone, and repeats the exact same words on the next call. By the time I'm ready to leave the bakery and to head to the hospital, after serving one last-minute customer, Christina Sivrick from the local theater group, who begged for two and a half dozen cookies she could bring in for a class party for her six-year-old Ben tomorrow. Annie has made three dozen calls. You ready? I ask, drying my hands off on a towel and grabbing my keys off the hook by the kitchen door. Can I make one more call, Mom? Annie asks. I look at my watch and nod. One more, but then we have to get to the hospital while visiting hours are still going on, okay? I lean against the counter and listen as Annie repeats her spiel once more. Her face looks pained as she hangs up. Another dead end, she murmurs. Annie, you're only on the third page, Alan reminds her. We have many more Jacob Levy's to try tomorrow— And then look at all the J. Levy's on your list. I guess, Annie says. She sighs and hops off the counter, leaving the list sitting beside the phone. Annie, don't worry, I say, trying to share in her optimism. Maybe you'll find him. From the withering look she gives me, I realize she's beginning to lose hope. Whatever, she says. Let's go see Mamie. Alan and I exchange concerned looks and follow her out the door. Chapter 18 For the next several days, nothing changes. Mamie doesn't stir. Gavin comes in every morning for a cup of coffee and a pastry and asks about my grandmother's condition. Alan tags along with Annie in the morning, helps me out during the day, and huddles with her in the afternoon while she embarks on a series of fruitless phone calls. 
After we close for the day, the three of us trek the 30 minutes to the hospital in Hyannis to spend 90 minutes at Mamie's bedside. The one saving grace of the whole routine is that, thankfully, the tourist season is over, so there's relatively little traffic on Route 6 as we cross to the southwest side of the Cape and back. In the hospital room, Alan holds Mamie's hand and murmurs to her in French, while Annie and I sit in chairs facing her bed. Annie gets up sometimes and scoots in beside Alan, stroking Mamie's hair while he speaks quietly. I can't bring myself to participate. I feel strangely empty. The last person I can rely on is slipping away, and there's nothing I can do to stop it. On Sunday, I close early at noon, and Alan requests a ride to the hospital. Do you want to go, too? I ask Annie. She shrugs. Maybe later, but I want to call more Levies from my list today. Can I stay home while you take Uncle Alan? I hesitate. All right, but don't answer the door for anyone. God, Mom, I'm not a kid anymore, Annie says, reaching for the phone. In the car, on the way down to Hyannis, Alan tells me about a restaurant he and Mamie used to like in Paris before the war. He was just a little boy then, and Mamie wasn't even a teenager yet. The owner would always come over to the table after the meal and make special crepes for the kids, with chocolate and brown sugar and bananas. Mamie and Alan would giggle and point as the owner set the crepes flaming in front of them and then pretended he couldn't put them out. Those were beautiful days, Alan says. It was before one's religious preferences mattered, before everything changed. He pauses and adds, The night they took my family away, I ran by that restaurant. And the owner, he was outside, watching all the people being marched down the street towards their death. And you know what? He was smiling. Sometimes that smile still haunts my nightmares. He stares out the window for the rest of the ride. At the hospital... I sit with Alan for a little while at Mamie's bedside as he whispers to her. Do you think she can hear you? I ask before we leave. He smiles. I do not know, he says. But doing something feels better than doing nothing. And I am telling her stories of our family, stories I have not let myself think of in seventy years. If anything will bring her back, I believe this will. I want her to know that the past is not lost, not forgotten, even if she came here and tried to erase it. When I got home an hour later, after dropping Alan at the library at his request, Annie is sitting in the middle of the living room floor with her legs crossed, holding the portable phone to her ear and saying, "Uh Uh-huh, 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 fine. For a moment, my eyes light up. Has she found Jacob Levy? After all, the words on her end aren't that typical, sorry, I've called the wrong Levy script. But then she turns and I can see the look on her face. Yeah, fine, I hear her say. Whatever. She presses the end button on the phone and slams it down on the ground. Honey? I ask tentatively. I've stopped in the doorway between the kitchen and living room, and am staring at her in concern. Was that one of the Levies? No, she says. Was it one of your friends? No, she says, and this time her voice is tighter. It was Dad. Okay, I say. Is there anything you want to talk about? She's silent for a long time as she looks down at the carpet, which I realize I haven't vacuumed in eons. 
Housekeeping is not one of my fortes, but when she looks up at me, she looks so angry that I take a step back without meaning to. Why did you get us into this, anyways? Annie demands. She scrambles to her feet, her fists clenched beside her long, skinny legs that have yet to develop from those of a child into those of a young woman. I blink at her in surprise. Get us into what? I ask, before it occurs to me that as her mom, I should be telling her that it's unacceptable to talk to me this way. But she's already on a roll. Everything! She screams. Honey, what are you talking about? I ask carefully. We're not going to find him, Jacob Levy. It's impossible, and you don't even care. My heart sinks a little. I failed her once again by not preparing her better for the likelihood that this is a wild goose chase, that Jacob has already died, or that he's disappeared because he doesn't want to be found. I know Annie wants to believe in true love that lasts forever, probably as an antidote to the front row seat she had to the crumbling of my marriage. But I'd hope that I wouldn't have to burst her bubble yet and tell her the truth. When I was twelve, I believed in true love too. It wasn't until I was older that I realized it was all a sham. I swallowed hard. Of course I care, Annie. I begin, but it's possible that Jacob isn't. She cuts me off before I can get the words out of my mouth. It's not just that. She exclaims. She waves her long, skinny arms around some more, and hardly seems to notice when her pink watch band snags her hair and gets stuck for a minute. She simply rips it free and winces momentarily before going on. It's everything. You ruin everything. I take a deep breath. Annie, if this is about me going to Paris for a few days. I've already told you how much I appreciate you being responsible when I was gone. She rolls her eyes and stomps her left foot on the ground. You don't even know what I'm talking about, she says, shooting me a withering look. Fine, I guess I'm an idiot, I say. I can finally feel my temper rising. There's a fine line between feeling sorry for my daughter and feeling annoyed by her behavior, and I can feel myself floating over that line right now. What is it that I've done wrong this time? It's everything! She screams. Her face is turning red, and for a split second, I have a weird, fleeting flashback to holding her in my arms when she was a colicky infant. Trying to calm her in the middle of the night, so that Rob, who always had an important case that he had to rest up for, could sleep. Why did I let him do that to me? I don't think I slept more than two hours at a stretch for the first three months, while he always seemed to get at least six hours of sleep. I shake my head and zero back in on my daughter. Everything, I ask carefully. Everything, she repeats immediately. You didn't care enough about Daddy to make your marriage work. You didn't love him like Mamie and Jacob loved each other. And now my life is ruined because of you. I feel like she's punched me in the stomach, and for a moment I can't catch my breath. I stare at her. What are you talking about? I ask once I can find my voice. Now you're blaming the divorce on me. Of course I am, she shrieks. She puts her hands on her hips and stomps her foot again. Everyone knows it's your fault. I'm unprepared once again for how hard her words hit me. What? If you had just loved Daddy, he wouldn't be living on the other side of town right now, and he wouldn't have a dumb girlfriend who hates me. Annie says, and suddenly I understand. This isn't about me and Rob. 
This is about the way Rob's new girlfriend is making Annie feel. And despite the fact that Annie is wounding me to the core right now, I'm more hurt for her than I am for myself. What do you mean his girlfriend hates you? I ask quietly. What do you care? Annie mumbles, suddenly deflating. Her back arches inward, and she crosses her arms over her chest as she slumps her shoulders. She looks at the ground. I care because I love you, I say after a moment. And your father loves you. And whoever this woman is, if she's acting like she doesn't like you, she's obviously completely nuts. Whatever, Annie mutters. Dad doesn't think she's nuts. Dad thinks sunshine's perfect. I take a deep breath. That sounds just like Rob. He's like a little kid. He gets entranced for a while by shiny new things. Cars, houses, clothes, boats, and, once upon a time, me. But I know the truth. I know that his infatuations are always temporary. But Annie is the one thing in his life that's supposed to be permanent. I'm sure your dad doesn't think this woman is perfect, I say. He loves you, Annie. If she's doing something that bothers you, tell your dad about it. He'll make it right. I don't expect much of Rob these days, but at least I expect that. But Annie just stares at the ground. I did tell him, she says softly. The anger has gone out of her voice now, and her limbs look limp and lifeless. She hangs her head and doesn't meet my eye. What did he say? I ask. He said I need to learn to respect my elders better, Annie says. She takes a deep breath, and that I need to learn to get along better with sunshine. My blood boils and I clench my fists. Annie's not perfect, and I wouldn't put it past her to be giving her father's new girlfriend a hard time. But there's no excuse for Rob taking his girlfriend's side over his daughter's, especially when Annie is probably confused by him moving on so quickly. What exactly does Sunshine do to make you think she doesn't like you? I ask carefully. Annie guffaws, making her sound much older and tougher than she is. What doesn't she do? She asks. She sniffs and looks away. When she speaks again, she just sounds sad. She doesn't ever talk to me. She talks to Dad like I'm invisible or something. Sometimes she laughs at me. She told me my outfit the other day was stupid. She told you your outfit was stupid? I repeat, incredulous. She actually said it was stupid? Annie nods. Yeah, and when she was gone the other day, I tried to talk to Dad about it. I thought he understood. I thought, like, he got it. But that night, when I got home after the bakery, I went into the bathroom, and right there on the counter, in my bathroom, was a silver necklace he'd bought for Sunshine and a note he'd written her that said, I'm sorry Annie made you feel bad with the thing she said. I'll take care of it. I don't want you hurting. I stare at her. He told her about the conversation you had with him? I ask. Annie nods. And then he bought her a present, she says, spitting the last word out like it tastes bad. A present to make her feel better. And then what does she go and do? She leaves the present in my bathroom, like it's some kind of a mistake. But I know what she's doing. She was, like, trying to show me that Dad would always choose her over me. I'm sure that's not true, I murmur. But of course it is. Sunshine sounds like a manipulative shrew. And that's fine if she wants to manipulate my ex-husband. I'm done looking out for him. And to be honest, he deserves to be the one manipulated and used for once. 
but I draw the line at a woman who goes out of her way to hurt a twelve-year-old girl, and when that twelve-year-old girl is mine, I see red. What did your dad say? I ask Annie. Did you tell him about finding the necklace? She nods slowly. She looks down. He said I shouldn't be looking through Sunshine's things. She says. I tried to tell him she left it sitting out in my bathroom, but he didn't believe me. He thought I was like going through her purse or something. I see. I say tightly. I take a deep breath. Okay. Well, first of all, honey, your father has obviously lost his mind. There's no reason in the world to put anyone ahead of your child, and particularly not a bitch named Sunshine. Annie looks shocked. You just called her a bitch. I just called her a bitch. I confirm because she obviously is one, and I will have a talk with your father about this. I know this is hard for you to understand, but this isn't about you. This is about your father being insecure and foolish. Six months from now, I guarantee you, Sunshine isn't going to be in the picture anymore. Your dad's interests are fleeting. Trust me. But in the meantime, there's no excuse for him treating you this way, or letting some bimbo treat you this way. And I'm gonna take care of it. Okay. Annie stares at me as if she's not sure whether to believe me or not. Okay, she says finally. You're really gonna talk to him? Yes, I say. But what's with blaming everything on me, Annie? That's gotta stop. I know you're upset, but I'm not your punching bag. I know, she mutters. And the divorce wasn't my fault, I say. Your dad and I just fell out of love. It was pretty equal, okay? Actually, it didn't feel equal at all. It felt like I'd been used as a doormat for a decade, and I'd finally realized it and decided to stand up for myself. And it turned out that the person walking all over me hadn't particularly liked it when his doormat developed some self-respect. But Annie doesn't need to know all that. I want her to keep loving her father, even if I don't anymore. That's not what Dad says. Annie mutters, looking down. Dad and Sunshine. I shake my head in disbelief. And what is it that Dad and Sunshine say? Just that you changed, she says, and that you weren't the same person anymore. And that when you changed, you stopped loving Dad. Of course, her father's right in a way. I did change, but that still doesn't mean the divorce is my fault. But I don't say any of this to Annie. Instead, I just say, "Yeah, well, believing a couple of idiots is pretty idiotic, don't you think?" She laughs. Yeah. Fine, I say. I'll talk to your dad. I'm sorry that he and his girlfriend are hurting you, and I'm sorry you're upset about Mamie right now. But Annie, none of those things gives you the right to say hateful things to me. Sorry, she mumbles. I know, I say. I take a deep breath. I hate being the bad guy, especially when she's getting it from all sides. But as her mom, I also can't let that kind of behavior stand. Kiddo, I'm afraid you're grounded for the next two days. No phone either. You're grounding me? She's incredulous. You know better than to talk to me like that. I say, or to take things out on me. The next time you're upset about something, just come talk to me, Annie. I've always been here for you. I know. She pauses and looks at me in anguish. Wait, does this mean I can't call any more Levies? Not for the next two days, I say. You can start again Tuesday afternoon. Her jaw drops. You are so mean, she says. 
So I've heard, I say. She glares at me. I hate you, she tells me. I sigh. Yeah, and you're a real peach, too, I reply. Go to your room. I'm going to go have a talk with your dad. As I pull up to the house I used to live in, the first thing I notice is that the pink salt spray roses in the front garden, the ones that I carefully and lovingly tended for eight years, are gone. All of them. They were here just weeks ago when I was here last. The second thing I notice is that there's a woman in the garden wearing a pink bikini top and denim cut-off shorts, despite the fact that it can't be more than 55 degrees out. She's at least a decade younger than I am, and her long blonde hair is gathered into a high ponytail that looks like it should be giving her a massive headache. I hope it's giving her a headache. I can only assume that she's Sunshine, recent torturer of my daughter. I suddenly want, more than anything in the world, to gun the engine and flatten her against the soil. Thankfully, I am not actually a murderess, so I refrain. But at the very least, I would sure like to pull her perky ponytail until she screams. I put the car in park and take the keys out of the ignition. She stands up and looks at me as I step out of the car. Who are you? She asks. Wow, an A plus for manners, I think. I'm Annie's mother, I reply crisply. You must be, what is it, rain cloud? Sunshine, she corrects. Ah, of course. I say. Is Robin? She tosses her ponytail over her right shoulder and then her left. Yeah, she says finally. He's like inside. Well, she talks like a twelve-year-old. No wonder she feels as if she has to compete with my daughter. They're obviously at the same maturity level. I sigh and head for the door. Aren't you even going to say thank you? She calls after me. I turn and smile at her. No, no, I'm not. I ring the doorbell, and Rob comes to the door a moment later, wearing only a pair of swim trunks. What is this, naked day? Do they not realize the temperatures are dipping into the low 40s tonight? To his credit, he looks somewhat flustered when he realizes it's me. Oh. Hey, Hope, he says. He takes a few steps back and grabs a t-shirt from the basket of laundry that sits beside the laundry room off the front hall. He pulls it on quickly. I wasn't expecting you. How's, uh, your grandmother? His concern, feigned or otherwise, surprises me momentarily. She's fine, I say quickly. Then I shake my head. No, she's not. I don't know why I just said that. She's still in a coma. I'm sorry to hear that, Rob says. Thanks, I say. We stand there for a moment, staring at each other, before Rob remembers his manners. Sorry, you want to come in? I nod, and he steps aside to let me pass. Walking into my old house feels like entering a Twilight Zone version of my former life. Everything's the same, but different. Same view of the bay out the back picture windows, but different curtains hanging from the windows. Same curving staircase up to the second floor, but another woman's purse sitting on the landing. I shake my head and follow him into the kitchen. Want some iced tea or a soda or something? He offers. No, thanks. I shake my head. I'm not staying. I need to go see Mamie. I just need to talk to you about something first. Rob sighs and scratches his head. Look, is this about the makeup again? I think you're overreacting, but I've been trying to be strict about it, okay? 
She came home the other day with lipstick on, and I made her wipe it off and give me the tube. I appreciate that, I say, but that's not what this is about. Then what? he asks, spreading his arms wide. We stand there for a moment and stare at each other, neither of us making a move to sit down or relax. Sunshine, I say flatly. He blinks a few times, and I know, just from that simple reaction, that he realizes what I'm about to say, and he knows I'm right. It's funny how spending a dozen years with a person lets you learn all their tells. He laughs uneasily. Oh, come on, it's over between me and you. He says, you can't be jealous that I moved on. I just stare at him. Rob, seriously, that's what you think I'm here about? He smirks at me for a moment, but when I don't drop my gaze, the smarmy expression falls from his face and he shrugs. I don't know. What do you hear about? Look, I say, I don't care who you date, but when it impacts Annie negatively, that's when I get involved. And you're dating a woman who apparently feels like she has to compete with Annie for your affections. They're not competing for my affections, Rob says, but from the tiny upturn of his mouth at the corners, I wonder for a moment whether, in fact, he's completely aware of what's going on and is getting some sort of sick, egotistical rush out of it. I wish for the zillionth time that I'd realized in my early 20s that having a baby with a selfish man meant that my child would always have to deal with that selfishness too. I'd been too naive to realize then that you can't change a man, and my daughter is paying for that mistake. I close my eyes for a moment, trying to summon some patience. Annie told me about the silver necklace, I say, which she found sitting out on the counter in her bathroom, where Sunshine obviously left it, along with your note, to rub it in Annie's face that you're choosing her. I'm not choosing anyone, Rob protests, but he looks embarrassed. Yeah, I say, and that's the problem. You're Annie's father. And that counts for so much more than whatever you are to the girl you've been dating for 35 seconds. You should be choosing Annie. Always. In every situation. And when Annie's wrong, yes, you have to let her know. But not in a way that makes her feel like you're picking someone else over her. You're her father, Rob. And if you don't start acting like it, you're going to crush her. I'm not trying to hurt her he says, and from the slight whine in his voice, I know he means it, for whatever that's worth. You also have to be aware of how the people you let into your life treat her, I continue. If you're dating someone who's going out of her way to hurt your daughter, don't you think there's maybe something wrong with that on a few different levels? Rob looks down and shakes his head. There's no way for you to know the whole situation. He scratches the back of his neck and turns to look out the picture window for a long time. I follow his gaze to a gaggle of white sailboats bobbing on the perfectly blue horizon, and I wonder whether he's thinking, as I am, about the days early in our marriage, when he and I used to take the boat out on the water near Boston without a care in the world. Then again, it occurs to me that I was pregnant at the time, and very apt to get seasick, and Rob would just look away as I threw up over the side of the boat. He always got what he wanted, his pliable, willing wife alongside him, creating a picture-perfect couple, and I always pasted a smile on and made it work. Had that been the nature of our whole marriage? 
Could it be summed up that easily in the image of me vomiting off the side of a sailboat while Rob pretended not to notice? We turn back to each other at the same moment, and I wonder whether, on some level, he's aware of what I'm thinking. He surprises me by bowing his head and saying, I'm sorry, you're right. I'm so startled that I can't even find the words to respond. I'm not sure he's conceded to anything in the entire time I've known him. Okay, I say finally. I'll take care of it, he says. I'm sorry I hurt her. Okay, I say, and I really am grateful. Not to him, because he's the one who screwed up and inflicted harm on my daughter in the first place. But I'm grateful for the fact that Annie won't have to suffer anymore, and that she still has a father who cares at least a little bit, even if he has to be nudged in the right direction in order to do the right thing. I'm also grateful, more so than I'd previously realized, to be out of this life with my ex-husband. My mistake wasn't in letting the marriage end. It was in fooling myself into believing that marrying him was a good idea in the first place. I think suddenly of the stories Alan has told me about Mamie and Jacob, and I realize, with a crushing clarity, that I've never had anything even close to that. Not with Rob, not with anyone. I'm not sure I even believed in it before, so it never felt like I was missing anything. Alan's stories are making me sad, not just for Mamie, but for myself. I smile at Rob, and as I do, I realize I'm grateful for something else, too. I'm grateful that he let me go. I'm grateful that he felt it necessary to have an affair with a 22-year-old. I'm grateful that he took it upon himself to end our marriage, because that means that there's a tiny chance, however small, that it's not too late for me after all. Now I just have to find a way to believe in the kind of love Alan's talking about. Thank you, I say to Rob, and without another word, I turn and head for the door. Sunshine is standing in the front garden, her hands on her hips, looking pissed as I walk out the front door. I wonder whether she's been standing there the entire time, trying to string together words to say to me. If so, I must remember to congratulate Rob on his pick of an intellectual superstar. You know, you can't be rude to me at my own house, Sunshine says, again tossing her long ponytail back and forth in a way that makes her look like a stubborn horse with a twitchy tail. I'll bear that in mind if I ever come to your house, I tell her brightly. But since this is not your house, but rather the house I lived in for the last decade, I'd suggest you keep your comments to yourself. Well, it's not like you live here anymore, she says, and then she wiggles her hips oddly and smirks at me, like she's just said something deeply devastating. In fact, she's just reinforced my newfound feeling of tremendous freedom, and I smile. You're right, I reply. I absolutely don't. Thank God. I cross the garden, stepping across the ground where my beloved roses used to be, until I'm standing face to face with her. One more thing, sunshine, I say calmly. If you do anything to hurt my daughter, and I mean anything, I will spend the rest of my life making sure you regret it. You're crazy, she mutters, taking a step back. Is that right? I ask cheerfully. Well, push me the wrong way, and I guess you'll find out. As I walk away, I can hear her muttering behind me. I climb into my car, start the engine, and back onto the main road. 
I head west toward Hyannis, for I plan to spend the rest of the day with Mamie, beginning to understand the lessons in love that I didn't realize I was missing until right about now. Chapter 19 North Star Blueberry Muffins Muffins Ingredients Streusel Topping Listen for this recipe below. Half cup of butter. One cup granulated sugar. Two large eggs. Two cups flour. Two teaspoons baking powder. Half teaspoon salt. A quarter cup milk. A quarter cup sour cream. One teaspoon vanilla extract. Two cups blueberries. Directions. 1. Preheat oven to 375 degrees. Line 12 muffin cups with paper liners. 2. Prepare streusel as directed. Set aside. 3. In a large bowl, using a hand mixer, cream together the butter and sugar. Add eggs, beating well. 4. In a separate bowl, combine flour, baking powder, and salt. Gradually add the dry ingredients to the butter-sugar mixture, alternating with the milk, sour cream, and vanilla. Mix until just fully combined. 5. Gently fold in the blueberries. 6. For oversized muffins, fill each muffin cup nearly to the top. Sprinkle generously with streusel topping. 7. Bake for 25 to 30 minutes, or until a knife inserted in the center of a muffin comes out clean. Cool for 10 minutes in pan, then move to wire rack to cool completely. Streusel Topping Ingredients Half cup granulated sugar A quarter cup flour A quarter cup very cold butter, chopped into small cubes Two teaspoons cinnamon Directions Combine all ingredients in a food processor and process with quick pulses until mixture has consistency of thick crumbs. Sprinkle over unbaked muffins as directed previously. Rose For years, in the darkness of the night in this idyllic Cape Cod town so far from where she'd come, the mental pictures always came back to Rose, unbidden, unwanted, images she had never seen in person, but that were burned into her memory nonetheless. Sometimes, imagination was a stronger painter than reality. Crying children being torn from their dead-eyed mothers. Filthy huddles of people being hosed down in piles while they screamed. The terror on parents' faces at the very moment they realized there was no going back. Children in long lines being herded systematically to their deaths. And always, in those images that played like an endless picture show across her mind, the people had the faces of her family, her friends, the people she loved. And Jacob. Jacob, who had loved her. Jacob, who had saved her. Jacob, whom she'd foolishly, horribly, sent back to die. And now, in the dark netherworld of her coma, the images of those she loved were floating before her like a picture show. She had imagined so many times what might have happened to them that she could see it now just as if she had witnessed it with her own eyes. As she drifted through this dark, underwater world between life and death, she could see Danielle and David being ripped from her mother their little faces streaked with tears, their eyes wide with confusion, 
their screams vivid in her ears. She wondered how they had died. Right there in the Veldiv, just blocks from the Eiffel Tower, in whose shadow they had lived their whole short lives, or later in the crowded, airless train cars on the way to camps like Drancy or bon le rolande or Pitivier. Or did they make it all the way to Auschwitz, only to be led in a neat, orderly line into a gas chamber, where they surely would have gasped in terror for their final breaths? Did they cry out? Did they understand what was happening to them? Mama and Papa, had they been separated in the Veldiv, or not until they were taken away from France? How had Papa born being ripped from the family he had always so fiercely protected? Had he fought back? Had he been struck by the guards, beaten for his obstinacy? Or had he gone willingly, already resigned to the futility of it all? Had Mama been left alone, with the children huddled around her, knowing the terrible truth that she could no longer protect them? How would it feel to realize you were no longer in control of your fate, no longer able to protect the children you would gladly die to save? Aline, it broke Rose's heart every time she thought of her older sister. What if she had tried harder to reason with her? Could she have saved her if only she'd managed to convince her that the world had lost all logic and had gone mad? Had Aline regretted, in her final moments, not believing Rose? Or had she held out hope until the end that perhaps they were only being sent away to work and not to die? Somehow, Rose always imagined her slipping away in her sleep, peaceful, alone, although she knew from the ghosts that her end had likely been much different. Each time she thought of how Aline had reportedly been beaten to death simply from being too ill to work, Rose had to run to the bathroom to throw up, and for days afterward she couldn't hold down a meal. Claude just thirteen, he had tried so hard to be grown up, to pretend to understand the things that adults understood. But he was a child the last time Rose saw him. Had he become the adult he'd always wanted to be in the few days inside the Veldiv? Had he been forced to understand things he shouldn't have known for years? Did he try to protect the younger ones, or his sister, or his mother? Or had he remained a child, terrified of what was happening? Had he made it onto a transport to Auschwitz? Had he survived there a while? Or had he been drawn out of line upon his arrival, judged to be too young or too small to work, and sent immediately to the gas chamber? What had he said with his last breath? What had been his last waking thought? Alan, the one Rose loved the best, and the one who understood everything, although he was only eleven. Her heart ached most of all for him, because without the cloak of denial that the others had managed to wrap themselves in, there was no way to dull the pain. He would have felt every moment of it, because he understood it all, understood what was happening, believed Jacob's urgent warnings. Had he been frightened? Or had he grown up in those moments and decided to meet his fate with brave resilience? He was tougher than Rose was, tougher than all of them. Had he used that bravery to rise above the terror? Rose felt sure that he hadn't lived long. He was much smaller than Claude, very small for his age, and no guard in his right mind would have selected such a little boy for work duty. When Rose closed her eyes at night, she often saw Alan's little face, 
his eyes somber, his rosy cheeks sallowed, his beautiful blonde hair shaved, as he awaited the fate he knew was coming in the midst of a thousand other children in the cold darkness of a gas chamber somewhere in Poland. And then there was Jacob. It had been nearly seventy years since she'd last seen him, and still his face was as clear in Rose's mind as if they'd parted just yesterday. She often imagined him as she'd seen him the first time she met him, in the Jardin du Luxembourg in the winter. His dancing green eyes, his thick brown hair, the way they had looked at each other and known in the very first instant what they'd found. She could imagine, in her darkest moments, his face, resolute and brave, as he endured the torture of the Veldiv, or as he was thrown aboard a transport to a transit camp, or as he entered Auschwitz. But unlike the others, she couldn't visualize him dying. It was strange, she thought, and she wondered whether it was her mind's way of protecting her, even though she did not want to be protected. She wanted to feel the pain of his death because she deserved it. But those weren't the only moments of her life that Rose returned to as she drifted farther and farther away from the world. She thought also of the moments that had come since then, the few happy times over the years when her heart had filled up with love and joy, the way it once had when she was a girl. And here in the depths of her coma, as she floated through darkness, she thought back to a cold morning in May 1975, one of her favorite memories. That morning, Rose had woken to find Ted gone to work already. Usually, she was up long before the dawn, but her nightmares had sucked her in that night, as they sometimes did, and held her captive until nearly six in the morning. When she slept in like this, Ted let her rest and called Josephine to open the bakery in her mother's stead. He didn't understand that she wasn't resting but reeling in the terror that she could never find a way out of. And because she loved her husband, she didn't tell him this. He thought that in marrying her and in giving her a good life, he had helped the past to disappear as she wanted it to. She could not bear to tell him that in the 33 years since she'd last seen those she loved most, the memories, both real and imagined, hadn't faded at all. Rose had stared at herself in the mirror that morning. She was still beautiful at 50, although she hadn't seen herself that way since the last time Jacob had looked at her. In his eyes, she knew she was something special. Without him, she had wilted like a flower without sunlight. Fifty years, she thought, looking at her reflection. It was her birthday that day, but no one knew that. The visa she'd come to America with, the identity that didn't belong to her, said that she'd been born two months later in July. July 16th, in fact, an irony she would never forget, for that was the day her family had been taken away. She knew that on July 16th, Ted and Josephine would have a cake for her and a nice dinner, and they would sing Happy Birthday, and she would smile and play her part well. But today, today was just for her. It was the day Rose Picard had been born, but Rose Picard had died in 1942. Rose did not like birthdays. How could she? Each one took her farther from the past, farther from the life she led before the world ended. And for the last few years, she had been consumed with sadness at the realization that she was growing older than any of her family ever had. 
Papa had been forty-five when he was taken away. Even if he had lived another two years at Auschwitz, which she knew was unlikely, he hadn't made it past forty-seven. Mama had been just forty-one in nineteen forty-two, the last time Rose had seen her. Rose's mother had seemed so old to her then, but now forty-one seemed youthful. She never thought of her mother being ripped away in the prime of her youth, but she had been. Rose knew that now. And now Rose herself was fifty. She had lived longer than her parents and spent almost twice as long in the United States as she had in France. Seventeen years in her native land, thirty-three in her adopted home. But she had stopped living long ago. The rest had been like a dream, and she had walked through it in a trance, simply going through the motions. She dressed that morning and walked to the bakery, noting that spring had arrived early. The trees were green, and the flowers around the cape were just beginning to bloom. The sky was a clear, pale blue, the kind of sky that led to beautiful days. And Rose knew that soon the tourists would be descending, and the bakery would be doing a strong business. These were the things that were supposed to make her happy. She stopped outside the bakery for a moment and looked through the pane at her daughter, who was busy sliding a tray of miniature star pies into the display case. Her daughter's hair was thick and dark, like her father's, and her belly was round and full, as Rose's had once been so long ago. In a month. Josephine would be a mother too. She would come to understand that one's child was the most important thing in the world, that one must protect that child at all costs. Rose had never been able to bring herself to tell her daughter what had happened. Josephine knew only that her mother had left Paris after her parents died. Married Ted and eventually settled here in Cape Cod. A thousand times Rose had wanted to tell her the truth, but then she'd pause and look around at the life she had here: her bakery, her beautiful home, and most of all, her devoted husband, who'd been a wonderful father to Josephine. And every time she'd stop before she ruined everything. She felt as if she were living in a beautiful painting, and that she was the only one who knew it was merely a paper-thin world of brushstrokes and dreams. And so she'd told Josephine fairy tales throughout her childhood, tales of kingdoms and princes and queens that were meant to keep the past alive, even if Rose was the only one who knew it. She imagined she'd tell Josephine's child the stories too, and this would bring Rose comfort, for it was her only way of living in her past without destroying the present. Let them believe that the fairy tales were the fiction, that everything else was real. It was better that way. Rose was just about to enter the bakery when suddenly she saw her daughter double over. Clutching her midsection, her beautiful face, so like her father's, suddenly twisted in pain. Rose immediately burst through the front door. "Darling, what is it?" she asked, flying across the room, crossing behind the counter, and putting her hands on her daughter's shoulders. Josephine moaned, "Mom, it's the baby. The baby's coming." Rose's eyes widened in panic, but it is too soon. Josephine's due date wasn't for another month and three days. Josephine doubled over in pain again. I don't think the baby knows that it's coming now, Mom. Rose felt a familiar sick panic rising inside her. What if something happened to the baby? I will call your father, Rose said. He will come. 
Rose knew she needed to get her daughter to the hospital, but she had never learned to drive. There was no need. She lived just a few blocks from the bakery, and she rarely needed to go anywhere else. Tell him to hurry, Josephine said. Rose nodded, picked up the phone, and dialed Ted. She told him quickly, carefully, what was happening, and he promised he'd leave the school and be there within ten minutes. Tell her I love her and can't wait to meet my grandchild, Ted said before hanging up. Rose did not convey the message, although she wasn't sure why. While they waited, Rose pulled one of the bakery chairs over for Josephine to sit in, and she flipped the clothes sign around on the front door. She saw Kay Sullivan and Barbara Kuntz pause outside and give her a strange look, but she merely gestured to Josephine, who was breathing hard, her face pink and gleaming, and they understood. They did not offer to help, though. They merely averted their eyes and hurried away. Cherie, it is going to be all right, Rose said, pulling a chair up beside her daughter and putting a hand on her knee. Your father will be here soon. She wished she could do more, bring her daughter more comfort, but there had been a gulf between them for years, entirely of Rose's own making. She had known how to reach across the coldness of her own heart to reach her daughter. Josephine nodded, breathing hard. I'm scared, Mom, she said. Rose was scared, too, but she could not admit this. It will all be fine, my dear, she said. You are going to have a happy, healthy baby. Everything will be fine. And then, Rose said something she knew she would regret, but it had to be said. My dear Josephine, she said, you must tell the baby's father. Josephine's head shot up, and she looked at her mother with blazing eyes. It's none of your business, Mom. Rose took a deep breath, imagined the life this baby would have without a father, and couldn't bear it. My dear, your child must have a father, like you did. Think how important your father has been to you. Her daughter glared at her. Absolutely not, Mom. He's not like Dad. He doesn't want to be part of this baby's life. Rose's heart hurt. She put her hand on her daughter's belly. You never told him you were pregnant? she said softly. Perhaps he would feel differently if he knew. You don't know what you're talking about, Josephine said. She paused and doubled over, another contraction racking her slender frame. She straightened up, her face red and pinched. You don't even know who he is. He walked away from me. Rose's eyes filled with unexpected tears, and she had to look away. This was her fault, she knew. Despite all the things she had tried so hard to impart to her daughter, the lessons she had tried to remember from her own mother, she had really only succeeded in imparting coldness, hadn't she? Her heart had simply ceased to exist on that dark, empty day in 1949 when Ted returned to tell her that Jacob had died. Josephine had been just a little girl then, too young to know she had lost her mother that day. And now, Rose realized, she had failed in the most important thing of all. She had raised a daughter who was as closed and cold as she was. You need someone to watch over for you, to love you, to love the baby, Rose whispered, like your father loved me and you. Josephine looked at her mother sharply. Mom, it's not the 1940s anymore. I'm perfectly fine on my own. I don't need anyone. There was another contraction then, and suddenly, 
Ted was rapping on the front door, his shirt rumpled and his tie twisted to the side. Rose stood and crossed the room to let him in. He gave his wife a quick peck and grinned at her. We're going to be grandparents, he said. Then he crossed the room to Josephine, knelt beside her, and whispered, I'm so proud of you, honey. Let's get you to the hospital. Just hang on a little longer. Josephine's labor was quick, and although the baby was born a month early, the doctor came out to report that she was healthy, although a bit underweight, and that she'd be ready to meet her grandparents shortly. Rose and Ted watched the minutes tick by in the waiting room, and as Ted paced, Rose closed her eyes and prayed. She prayed that this child born today, on this, her own fiftieth birthday, wouldn't be as cold as she herself was, or as cold as she had made her own daughter. She prayed that the mistakes she'd made with Josephine would not be passed on to the new baby, who had a blank slate, a new chance at life. She prayed that she'd be able to show the baby she loved her, something she'd never been able to do with her own daughter. It was another hour before a nurse came to lead them in. Josephine lay in bed, exhausted but smiling, holding her newborn daughter in her arms. Rose's heart melted as she looked at the tiny girl who was sleeping peacefully, one of her tiny hands clenched in a fist beside her cheek. Do you want to hold her, Mom? Josephine asked. Tears in her eyes, Rose nodded. She came to stand beside her daughter, who handed the tiny, sleeping infant over. Rose took the baby in her arms, remembering at once how natural it felt to hold someone so little who was a piece of you, a piece of everything you loved. She felt the impulse to protect this baby surge through her, just as strongly as it had surged through her the first time she held her own baby. Rose looked down at her granddaughter, seeing both the past and the future. When the child opened her eyes, Rose gasped. For a moment, she could have sworn she saw something wise and ancient in the newborn's eyes. And then it was gone, and Rose knew she had only imagined it. She rocked the baby gently and knew she was already in love with her. She prayed she was strong enough to do things right this time. I hope, Rose murmured, her voice trailing off as she stared at the little girl. She didn't know how to complete the sentence because she didn't know what to hope for. There were a million things she wanted for this child— a million things she never had herself. She hoped everything for her. Honey, have you decided on a name yet? Ted asked. Rose looked up to see her daughter staring at her strangely. A slow smile spread across Josephine's face. Yes, Josephine said. I'm going to call her Hope. Chapter 20 By Wednesday evening, Annie has called more than a hundred numbers from her list of Levies, and she still hasn't come up with even a trace of Mamie's Jacob Levy. I'm feeling more and more like we may be chasing a ghost. I take a dozen of the West Coast names from Annie's list and call them after she's gone to bed— but I don't have any more luck than she's had. Everyone I reach says they've never heard of a Jacob Levy who left France in the 1940s or 1950s. Even an online search of Ellis Island's passenger records turns up nothing. 
Annie comes into the bakery a few minutes before six the next morning, looking solemn, as I'm folding dried cranberries, chunks of white chocolate, and slivers of macadamia nuts into a batch of sugary cookie dough. We have to do more. She announces, flinging her backpack onto the floor, where it lands with a thud that makes me wonder fleetingly about the damage she must be doing to her back by carrying around several heavy textbooks each day. About Jacob Levy, I guess. Before she can respond, I add, "Can you start putting the defrosted pastries out, please? I'm running a little behind." She nods and goes to the sink to wash her hands. Yeah, about Jacob, she says. She shakes her hands off, dries them on the blue cupcake towel beside the sink, and turns around. We gotta try to figure out how to find him better. I sigh. Annie, you know there's a good chance that's going to be impossible. She rolls her eyes. You're always so negative. I'm just being realistic. I watch as she begins sliding crescent moons carefully out of their airtight container. She unwraps each of them from their wax paper and sets them on a display tray. I think we have to investigate more if we're going to find him. I arch an eyebrow at her. Investigate? I ask carefully. She nods, missing the note of skepticism in my voice. Yeah, it's not working to just call people. We have to like try to search some documents or something, other than the Ellis Island site, because he could have arrived anywhere. What documents? Annie glares at me. I don't know. You're the adult here. I can't do everything. She marches into the front of the bakery with her tray full of crescent moons, and comes back a moment later to begin putting defrosted slices of baklava onto slivers of wax paper. I watch her for a moment. I just don't want you to wind up disappointed, I say to Annie after she's returned to the kitchen. She glares at me. That's just your way of avoiding stuff, she says. You can't just not do stuff because you might get hurt. She glances at her watch. It's six. I'll go unlock the front door. I nod, watching her again as she goes. I wonder whether she's right, and if she is, how does she know so much more than I do about life? I hear her talking to someone a moment later, and I head out to begin another long day of smiling at customers, pretending that there's nothing in the world I'd rather be doing than wrapping up pastries for them. I round the corner from the kitchen and am surprised to see Gavin at the counter, looking over the pastries that are already in the case. He's dressed more formally than usual. In khakis and a pale blue button-down shirt, Annie is already busy putting slices of baklava into a box for him. Hey, I say, you're dressed up today. The moment the words have left my mouth, I feel silly. But he just smiles at me and says, "I took the day off. I'm headed up to the nursing home on the North Shore." I'm just getting some pastries to bring to the folks there. They like me better when I arrive with food. I laugh. I bet they like you with or without food. Annie sighs heavily, as if to remind us that she's still there. We both glance at her, and she hands Gavin the bakery box, which she has tied neatly with white ribbon while we were talking. So, Annie. Gavin says, turning his attention to her. "How's it going with your search for Jacob Levy?" "Not good," Annie mutters. "No one's ever heard of him." "You been calling the names on your list?" "Like hundreds of names," Annie says. "Hmm," says Gavin. "I wonder if there's another way to look for him." Annie brightens. "Like what?" Gavin shrugs. I don't know. Do you know his birth date? 
Maybe there's a way to search for him online if you have a date of birth. Annie nods excitedly. Yeah, maybe. Good idea. I expect her to thank him, but instead I hear her blurt out, So you're, like, Jewish? Annie, I exclaim, don't be impolite. I'm not, she says. I'm just asking. I glance at Gavin, and he winks at me, which makes me blush a little. Yes, Annie, I'm Jewish. How come? I don't really have any Jewish friends, she says. And now that I know I'm, like, Jewish, I was just curious about, you know, Jewishness. It's called Judaism, not Jewishness, I tell her. Besides, you're not Jewish, Annie. You're Catholic. I know, she says, but I can be both. Mamie's both. She turns to Gavin again. So, like, do you go to Jewish church every week? Gavin smiles. It's called Temple, and I don't go every week, even though I probably should. Some Fridays I'm working, and some Fridays I'm just too busy. That's not very good, is it? Annie shrugs. I don't know. We, like, never go to church or anything either. Well, I was planning to go to temple tomorrow, he continues. You're welcome to come with me, Annie, if you're curious, if it's okay with your mom. Annie looks at me excitedly. Can I go, Mom? I hesitate and glance at Gavin. Are you sure? I ask him. Absolutely, he says. I always go by myself. It'd be nice to have the company. I actually go to a synagogue in Hyannis. If you're going to visit your grandmother tomorrow, I can swing by and pick up Annie at the hospital at the end of visiting hours. Annie is grinning at me, and I shrug. It's fine by me, I say, as long as you're sure you don't mind. Not at all, Gavin says. I'll come by tomorrow evening, okay? Cool, Annie says. Thanks. It'll be cool to be like two religions at the same time. I stare at her for a minute. What did you say? She looks embarrassed. I just mean it's like another side of me, you know? She pauses and rolls her eyes when I don't say anything. God, Mom, I know I'm Catholic. Don't freak out. No. I say, shaking my head. That's not what I meant. I mean, you just gave me another idea for how we might find Jacob. How? Annie asks. She and Gavin are looking at me curiously. Interfaith organizations, I say slowly. If Jacob trusted a Christian friend to bring the love of his life to a Muslim mosque during the war— He's obviously someone who respects other religions, right? Gavin is nodding, but Annie looks confused. So what? she asks. So what if he came to the States and carried on that tradition? I say. What if he's part of an interfaith organization somewhere? What do you mean? Annie asks. Gavin answers for me. I think your mother is saying that maybe Jacob joined one of those organizations where people work together for understanding between the religions, he says, kind of like the way people from different religions work together in Paris to help save your great-grandma. Annie looks unconvinced. I don't know, she says. Sounds kind of dumb, but I guess it's worth a try. I'll call some interfaith organizations today, I tell Annie. And I'll try calling some synagogues, Gavin says. You guys try to find out Jacob's birth date, okay? Annie and I nod. Gavin thanks Annie politely for the pastries, smiles at me, and then turns to go. Give me a call if you find out anything, okay? Gavin says as he heads for the door. See you tomorrow. Bye, Annie chirps, waving at him. Bye, I echo. Drive safely, I add. He smiles once more, 
turns and leaves the bakery. He's so nice, Annie says once he's gone. Yeah, I agree. I clear my throat and go back to setting up for the day. He is. Annie is spending the night at Rob's, and since it's been a slow day, I text her and tell her that she doesn't need to bother coming in after school. I can clean up myself this afternoon. She calls me from her dad's house after she gets off the bus and tells me excitedly that he's left a note for her saying it'll just be the two of them that night and asking whether he can take her out to a special dinner. That's great, honey. I say, I'm glad. It sounds like Rob is making an effort to make her feel important. Maybe my words the other day meant something after all. When you go to the hospital, can you tell Mamie I said hi and that I'll be there tomorrow? Annie asks, in case she can hear you. Of course, sweetie, I tell her. I pick up Alan at home after I close, and we chat the whole way to the hospital. I'm realizing how very much I like having him around. He fits nicely into our life. Some days he helps out around the bakery, other days he spends at Mamie's bedside, and on days like today, he stays home and surprises me by doing things around the house. I returned a few days ago to find all the framed artwork in my attic hung up on the walls. Today, I returned to find my pantry and freezer, which both had been virtually empty, cleared out and restocked with new groceries. It is the least I can do, Alan said when I'd confronted him in disbelief. It is nothing. I took a taxi to the supermarket. At the hospital, at Mamie's bedside, Alan holds my hand as we both sit with Mamie. He murmurs to her for a while in French, and as promised, I deliver Annie's message, although I don't believe that Mamie can hear me through the fog of her coma. I know that Alan and Annie both believe that she's still in there, but I'm not so sure. I keep this feeling to myself. I find myself thinking about Gavin while Alan whispers to Mamie, and I'm not entirely sure why. I think it's just because he's been so helpful, and I'm feeling more alone than ever. Alan eventually settles back in his chair, apparently done with whatever story he was telling. Mamie continues to sleep, her narrow chest slowly moving up and down. She looks so peaceful, Alan says, as if she is somewhere happier than here. I nod, blinking back the sudden tears in my eyes. She does look at peace, but this just reinforces my idea that she's already gone, which makes me want to cry. Alan, I say after a moment, I don't suppose you know Jacob's state of birth, do you? Alan smiles and shakes his head, and for a moment, I think he's indicating that he doesn't. But then he says, As a matter of fact, I do. Rose and I met him for the first time the evening before his sixteenth birthday. I lean forward eagerly. When? Christmas Eve, 1940. Alan closes his eyes and smiles. Rose and I were walking through the Jardin du Luxembourg. She had brought me with her to visit a friend in the Latin Quarter, and we were in a hurry to get home before curfew. The Germans insisted on everyone in Paris being home with their blackout curtains drawn. But Rose always loved the garden, and when we were passing nearby on our way across the sixth arrondissement, so she suggested we walk across. Alan continues, We went, as we always did, to see her favorite statue in the park. 
The Statue of Liberty. The Statue of Liberty? I repeat. He smiles. The original model used by Auguste Bertoldi, the artiste. Another stands in the middle of the Seine, not far from the Eiffel Tower. Your statue, the one in the harbor of New York, was given to the United States by France, you know. I remember that from school, I say. I just didn't know there were similar statues in France. Alan nods. The statue in the Luxembourg Garden was Rose's favorite when we were young, and on that evening, when we arrived at the statue, it had just begun to snow. The flakes were so tiny and light, and it was like we were in a snow globe. Everything was very still and peaceful, even though we were at war. In that moment, the world felt magical. His voice trails off, and he looks at Mamie. He reaches out to touch her cheek, where so many years of life without him are etched across her face. It was not until we drew close to the statue, he continues after a long pause, that we realized we were not alone. There was a boy with dark hair and a dark coat standing just across. He turned as we were just a few feet away, and Rose stopped instantly as if she lost her breath. But the boy didn't approach us, and we did not approach him, Alan continues. They just stared at each other for a very long time, until finally... I tugged on Rose's hand and said, Why did we stop? Alan pauses for a moment to gather himself. He glances at Mamie and then settles back in his seat. Rose bent down and said to me, We stopped because it is very important for you to understand that the place where the real Statue of Liberty stands is a place where people can be free, Alan says, a dreamy look in his eye. I did not understand what she was saying. She looked me in the eye and said, In the United States, religion does not define anyone. They only look at it as a piece of you, and no one is judged for it. I will go there some day, Alan. I will bring you with me. That was before the days of the worst Jewish restrictions. Rose, she was very knowledgeable, and so I believe she already knew of the Jews being persecuted elsewhere. She saw the problems coming, even if our parents did not. But I, at the age of nine, did not see what religion had to do with anything. Before I had a chance to ask her, the boy approached us. He'd been staring at us all along, and I could see, as Rose straightened up to talk to him, that her cheeks had gone very red. I asked her, Why is your face so red, Rose? Are you getting sick? He laughs at the memory and shakes his head. This only made her turn redder. But the boy, his cheeks were red, too. He looked at Rose for a long time, and then he bent down to my eye level and said, Your friend here is right, monsieur. In the United States, people can be free. I am going there some day, too. I made a face at him and said, She's not my friend. She's my sister. They both had a good laugh over that. Alan continues, smiling faintly. And then they began to talk, and it was as if I was not there anymore. I had never seen my sister like that before. The way she gazed into his eyes, it was as if she wanted to disappear into them. Finally, 
the boy turned to me again and said, Little Monsieur, my name is Jacob Levy, and what is yours? I told him I was Alain Picard, and my sister was Rose Picard, and he looked at her again and murmured, I think that is the most beautiful name I have ever heard. They talked for a long time, Rose and Jacob, until it began to grow dark. Alan says, I was not listening to them very closely, for their conversation bored me. At nine, I wanted to talk about comic books and monsters, but they were talking about politics and freedom and religion and America. Finally, I tugged on Rose's hand again and said, We must go. It's getting dark, and Mama and Papa will be angry. Rose nodded, seeming to come out of a dream. Alan continues, She told Jacob we had to leave. We began to walk away, quickly, towards the west side of the park, but he called after us. He said, Tomorrow is my birthday, you know. I will be sixteen. Rose turned and said, On Christmas Day. He said, Yes, and she paused. She said, Then I will meet you tomorrow, here at the statue, to celebrate. And then together we hurried away, both of us aware that darkness was falling fast, and there would be trouble if we were not home. She went alone to the park the next day, and she returned with stars in her eyes. Alan concludes, From that moment on, they were inseparable. It was love at first sight. I sit back in my seat. That's a beautiful story, I say. Everything about Rose and Jacob was a beautiful story, Alan says, until the end, but perhaps the story is not yet through being told. I look off into the distance. If he's still out there. If he's out there, Alan echoes. I sigh and close my eyes. So, Christmas Day then, I say. He was born on Christmas Day. 1924, I guess, if he was turning 16 in 1940? Correct, Alan agrees. Christmas Day, 1924, I murmur. Before Hitler, before the war, before so many people died for no reason at all. Who could have known, Alan says softly, what was to come. That night, with Annie at her father's, Alan and I sip tea in the kitchen, and after he shuffles off to bed, I sit at the table for a long time, watching the second hand on the wall clock go around and around and around. I'm thinking about how time ticks by without anyone being able to stop it. It makes me feel powerless, small. I think about the seemingly infinite number of seconds that have passed since my grandmother lost Jacob. It's nearly eleven when I pick up the phone to call Gavin, and although I know it's inappropriately late, I'm seized with the sudden panicky feeling that if I don't tell him about Jacob's birth date now, this very second, it might be too late. It's a silly thought, of course. Seventy years have ticked by with nothing happening. But seeing Mamie slip away in the hospital day after day makes me acutely conscious of the relentless progress of the second hand. Gavin answers on the third ring. Did I wake you up? I ask. No, I just finished watching a movie, Gavin says. I feel suddenly foolish. Oh, if you're with someone, I can call back. He laughs. I'm by myself on the couch, unless you count the remote control as someone. 
I'm unprepared for the feeling of relief that courses through me. I clear my throat, but he speaks again first. Hope, is everything okay? Yeah, I pause and blurt out. I found out Jacob Levy's date of birth. That's great, Gavin says. How'd you find out? I find myself telling him the short version of the story Alan told me earlier. What a great story, Gavin says when I'm done. Sounds like they were really meant to be. Yeah, I agree. A moment of silence passes, and I look up again at the clock. Tick-tock, tick-tock. The second hand seems to mock me. Hope, what's wrong? Gavin asks. Nothing, I say. I could start guessing. Gavin says, or you could just tell me. I smile into the phone. He's so sure that he knows me. The fact of the matter is, he does. Do you believe in that? I ask. Believe in what? You know, I mumble. Love at first sight, or, you know, soulmates, or whatever it is that we all keep saying my grandmother and Jacob Levy had. Gavin pauses, and in the silence, I feel like an idiot. Why would I ask him something like that? He probably thinks I'm coming on to him. I open my mouth to take it back, but he speaks first. Yes, he says. Yes? Yes, I believe in that kind of love. Don't you? I close my eyes. There's suddenly a pain in my heart because I realize I don't. No, I say. No, I don't think I do. Hmm, Gavin says. Have you ever felt that way about someone? He pauses. Yes. I want to ask him who, but I realize I don't want to know. I feel a small surge of jealousy, which I quickly push away. Well, that's nice, I say. Yeah, Gavin says softly. Why don't you believe in it? I've never asked myself that before. I consider the question for a moment. Maybe because I'm 36, I say, and I've never felt it. Wouldn't I have felt it by now if it was real? The words hang between us, and I suspect Gavin is trying to figure out how to answer without offending me. Not necessarily, he says carefully. I think you've been hurt. A lot. In my divorce? I ask. But that's just been recently. What about before that? You'd been with your husband since you were, what, 21 or 22? Twenty-three, I murmur. Do you think he was the love of your life? No, I say, but don't tell Annie that. Gavin laughs softly. I would never do that, Hope. I know. Silence hangs between us again for a moment. I think that you probably spent a dozen years with a man who didn't love you like a person deserves to be loved, Gavin says, and who you maybe didn't love the way you're supposed to love someone. You got used to settling. Maybe, I say softly. And I think that every time a person gets hurt, there's another layer that forms around the outside of their heart, you know? like a shield or something. You were hurt a lot, weren't you? I don't say anything for a moment. I am sorry, Gavin says. Was that too personal? No, I say. I think you're right. It was like nothing I did was ever good enough, not just with Rob, but with my mom, too. I stopped speaking. I've never told anyone that before. I'm sorry, Gavin says. It's in the past, I murmur. I'm suddenly uneasy with the conversation, 
uncomfortable that I'm telling Gavin these things and letting him into my head. I'm just saying that I think the more layers there are around your heart, the harder it is to recognize someone you could really fall in love with, he says slowly. His words settle in for a moment, and I feel strangely short of breath. Maybe, I say. Or maybe when you've been hurt a lot, it just opens your eyes to reality, and you stop dreaming of things that don't exist. Gavin is silent. Maybe, he says. But maybe you're wrong. Maybe it does exist. Would you agree that your grandmother's been hurt a lot over the years? Of course. And Jacob Levy, too, probably. Yeah, probably, I say. I think of all they both lost, their families, life as they knew it, each other. What could hurt more than the entire world turning its back on you while all the people you love are hauled away to their deaths? Yeah, I say again. Well, let's see if we can find him, Gavin says. Jacob, and we can ask him, and your grandmother. If she wakes up, I say. When she wakes up, Gavin says. You have to stay optimistic. I look at the clock. How can one stay optimistic when time keeps marching forward? I sigh. Okay, I say. So we'll just ask them if love is real? I hate that I sound like I'm mocking him, but he sounds silly. Why not? Gavin answers. The worst they can say is no. Yeah, all right. I agree. I shake my head, ready to be done with this feudal conversation. So you think we can find him, now that we have a birth date? I think it increases our chances, Gavin says. Maybe he's still out there. Maybe, I agree. Or maybe he died a long time ago, and this is all a wild goose chase. Hey, thank you, I say, and I'm not sure whether I'm thanking him for the conversation we've just had or whether the thank you is only for helping us try to find Jacob. You're welcome, Hope. I'll call a bunch of synagogues tomorrow. Maybe something will turn up. See you tomorrow evening at the hospital. Thank you, I say again. And then he's gone, and I'm holding the receiver, wondering what just happened. Is it possible that I've just gotten old and bitter, and this guy in his late 20s knows more about life and love than I do? I fall asleep that night, wishing fervently, for the first time I can remember, that I'm just a big fool, and that all the things I've grown to believe aren't true after all. Chapter 21 Annie and Alan accompany Gavin to Temple the next night, while I stay with Mamie past the end of visiting hours, after bribing the nurses on the floor with a lemon grape cheesecake and a box full of cookies from the bakery. Mamie, I need you to wake up. I whisper to her as the room grows dimmer. I'm holding her hand and facing the window, which is on the other side of her hospital bed. Twilight has almost faded to full darkness now, and Mamie's beloved stars are out. They seem to sparkle less brightly than they used to, and I wonder whether they're fading, as I am, without Mamie's attention. I miss you. I whisper close to her ear. The machines monitoring her continue to beep away in soothing rhythms, but they're not bringing her back. The doctor has told Alan and me that sometimes it's just a matter of time and that the brain heals itself when it's ready. What she doesn't say, but what I could read in her eyes, was that just as often the person never comes back. 
It's slowly sinking in that I may never look into my grandmother's eyes again. I didn't think I was a person who needed anyone. My mother was always very independent, and my grandfather died when I was ten. Mamie was always busy with the bakery, too busy to tell me her fairy tales anymore, too busy to listen to my stories of school and friends and everything that was going on in my imagination. My mother had never been very interested in those stories anyhow, and gradually I stopped telling them. I don't need anyone, I told myself as I got older. I didn't talk to my mother or my grandmother about grades or boys or college decisions or anything. They both seemed so absorbed in their own worlds, and I felt like an outsider with both of them. So I created my own world. And it wasn't until I had Annie that I learned to let someone else in. And now that she's right around the age when I had to learn to fend for myself, I've realized I'm holding on tighter, in a way. I don't want her drifting out of my universe into one of her own making, like I did. And that, I realize, is what makes me different from my grandmother and my mother. But as Mamie has regressed through time— turning almost into a child as the Alzheimer's steals her lifetime, I have found her drifting back into my universe, too. I realize that I'm not ready for it to just be me and Annie. I need Mamie here a little while longer. Come back, Mamie, I whisper to my grandmother. We're going to try to find Jacob, okay? You just have to come back to us. Four days later, Mamie's condition hasn't changed, and I've just opened the bakery when Matt comes by with a big packet of papers in his hands. My heart sinks. With all the drama surrounding Mamie's stroke and the discovery of the existence of Alan and Jacob, I've nearly forgotten the trouble my business is in. I'm going to get right to the point. Matt says after we exchange uneasy hellos. The investors don't like the numbers. I stare at him. Okay, I say. And I'm going to be honest. You leaving and going to Paris during the time they were considering this investment decision, well, let's just say that was pretty foolish. I sigh. Maybe from a business perspective. What else is there right now? I look down at the tray of star pies I've been holding in my hands since Matt walked in. Everything, I say softly. I smile at the pies for a moment before sliding them into the display case. Matt looks at me like I've lost my mind. Hope, they're pulling out. They've run the numbers, and you're marginal at best. They were on the fence, and I've been doing my best to try to persuade them on your behalf. But realizing you'd close like that, at the drop of a hat? Well, that was the final straw. I nod, my heart thudding. I realize what he's saying to me, that I may have just lost the bakery— and I have a sensation coursing through me that feels a bit like panic, but I'm not nearly as upset as I would have thought, and this worries me a little. Shouldn't I be more upset that my family's business, my entire livelihood, is about to be ripped away from me? Instead, I just have the strange sense that things are going to work out the way they're meant to, whatever that means. Are you listening to me, Hope? Matt asks, and I realize he's been talking while I was thinking. Sorry, what were you saying? I ask. I was saying that there's not much more I can do. Do you know how out of my way I went to even get them here in the first place? And they're not going to invest, Hope. I'm sorry. Matt doesn't say anything as I quietly rearrange pastries in the display case. 
The door dings, and Lisa Wilkes, who works at the stationery shop on the corner, comes in with Melissa Carbonell, who works at the pet shop on Leeds Road. They were both a few years behind Matt and me in high school, and they come in together at least once a week. Matt is silent while Lisa orders a coffee and Melissa orders a green tea, which takes me a few minutes to make because I have to plug in the electric kettle. In the meantime, they argue over whether they'll split a piece of baklava or a piece of cheesecake. In the end, I settle for charging them for a piece of baklava and throwing in a piece of cheesecake for free. That's why you're going out of business, you know. Matt says after they've left. What? You can't just go on giving people free pastries. They were totally playing you. They weren't playing me. I respond indignantly. Sure they were. You're too generous. They knew if they argued in front of you, you'd be nice and give them both pastries, and you did. I sigh. I don't even bother explaining that there's no way I'll go through the remainder of the cheesecake today, anyhow. My grandmother always ran this bakery like it was her kitchen, and the customers were her guests. I say instead, "That's not a good business model," Matt says. I shrug. I never said it was, but I'm proud of that tradition. The door dings again, and I look up to see Alan shuffling in. He's taken to walking here himself in the mornings. I worry about him doing so at his age. The walk is more than a mile, but he seems to be perfectly healthy, and he swears that he walks far more than this each day in Paris. He crosses behind the counter and gives me a gentle kiss on the cheek. Good morning, dear," he says. He seems to notice Matt for the first time. Then, "Hello, young man," he says. He turns to me and says, "I see you have a customer." Matt was just leaving. I tell him. I shoot Matt a look, which I hope transmits the fact that I don't want him talking bakery business in front of Alan. But of course, he's oblivious. I'm Matt Hines," he says, extending a hand to Alan over the bakery case. "And you are?" Alan hesitates before shaking Matt's hand. "I am Alan Picard," he says, "Hope's uncle." Matt looks confused. "Now wait, I've known Hope since we were kids. She doesn't have any uncles." Alan smiles thinly. Yes, young man, she does indeed. In fact, I am her arrière oncle, her great uncle, as you would say. Matt frowns and looks at me. He's my grandmother's brother. I explain from Paris. Matt stares at Alan for a second, then turns back to me. Hope, this isn't making a whole lot of sense. You're telling me you went to Paris on a whim. You're about to lose your business because of it, and you've randomly brought back a relative you never knew you had. I feel my cheeks heating up, and I'm not sure whether it's because he's apparently insulting me, or because he's just announced in front of Alan that I'm about to lose the bakery. I turn slowly and look at Alan. Hopeful that the words were lost in translation, but he's staring at me with a frozen look on his face. Hope, what does he mean? He asks softly. About losing the business, is the bakery in trouble? Don't worry about it, I say. I shoot Matt a look, and at least he has the grace to appear slightly shamed. He clears his throat and turns away, as if to give Alan and me a moment's privacy. Hope we are family, Alan says. Of course, I will worry if something is wrong. Why did you say nothing to me?
I take a deep breath. Because it's my fault, I say. I made some bad financial decisions. My credit rating has totally tanked, and that's tied in to my business credit. But that does not explain why you did not tell me, Alan says. He takes a step forward and puts a warm, gnarled hand on my cheek. I am your uncle. I can feel tears in my eyes now. I'm sorry. I just didn't want to burden you with everything going on with my grandmother. All the more reason to lean on me, he says. He touches my cheek lightly with the palm of his hand and turns back to Matt. Young man, he calls out. Yes? Matt turns, wide-eyed, as if he hasn't been listening to every word. You can go now. My niece and I have some talking to do. But I... Matt begins, but Alan cuts him off again. I don't know who you are or what you have to do with this, Alan says. I am the vice president of the Bank of the Cape, Matt says stiffly. He stands up a little straighter. We hold Hope's loan, and unfortunately, it's necessary that we call it in. It wasn't my decision, sir. It's just business. I swallow the lump in my throat and glance at Alan. His face has gone red. So that's it, then, he says to Matt. Sixty years of tradition. Sixty years of my family baking for this town, and you decide it is all over, just like that. It's not personal, Matt says. He glances at me. I tried to help, actually. Hope will tell you. But the investors I had interested backed out after Hope went to Paris. I'm sorry, but... I guess the legacy has to end. I look down at the ground and close my eyes. Young man, Alan says after a moment, the legacy is not in this bakery itself, but in the family tradition it represents. There is no price tag on that. Seventy years ago, Men who did not understand family or conscience, and who only understood orders and wealth, took our first bakery away. And because of my sister, and her daughter, and her granddaughter, the tradition survived. I don't understand what this has to do with a loan, Matt says. Alan reaches over and squeezes my hand. You and your bank are making a mistake, young man, he says, but Hope will be fine. She is a survivor, just like her grandmother. That is our tradition, and it will survive. My heart feels like it's going to overflow. Alan takes me gently by the hand and turns me toward the kitchen. Come, Hope, he says. Let us bake a star pie to take to Rose. I am sure the young man can find his way out. That afternoon, armed with Jacob Levy's date of birth, I begin calling the interfaith organizations I'd found using Google. I had been holding off because I realize what a long shot this is, and I've reached my limit of disappointment. I'm feeling as if all I hear anymore are no's. Can I save my bakery? No. Do we know that Mamie will ever wake up? No. Is it likely that there's still time to turn my messy life around? No. I start with the Interfaith Alliance. Then I go down my list to the Council for a Parliament of the World's Religions, the National American Interfaith Network, the United Religions Initiative, and the World Congress of Faith. To each person who answers, I briefly explain the story of how Jacob took Mamie to a Christian who helped shelter her with Muslims. 
Then I give them Jacob's name and date of birth and say that I know it's a long shot, but I'm trying to find him and believe there's a chance he may be involved with an interfaith organization here in the States. They all ooh and ah over the story, tell me they'll pass my information to the right people, and will get back to me if they find anything. On Sunday morning at about 8 o'clock, Annie and I are alone in the bakery, rolling out dough in silence, when the phone rings. Annie wipes her hands on her apron and reaches for the receiver. North Star Bakery, Annie speaking, she says. She listens for a minute and hands the phone to me with a funny expression on her face. It's for you, Mom. I dust my hands off and take the phone from her. Hello, North Star Bakery, I say. Is this Hope McKenna Smith? It's a woman's voice, and she has a hint of an accent. Yes, I say. How can I help you? My name is Alita White. She says, I'm calling you from the Abrahamic Association of Boston. We are an interfaith council. Oh, I say. They aren't one of the groups I called over the last few days. The name doesn't ring a bell. Abrahamic? I ask. The Muslim, Jewish, and Christian religions all descend from Abraham, she explains. We focus on bringing together these groups and working from our similarities instead of our differences. Oh, I say again. Right. What can I do for you? Let me explain, she says. Our organization received a call this week from the Interfaith Council of America, and it was referred to me. I was told about your grandmother and how she was assisted in escaping from Paris by a Muslim family. Yes, I say softly. I have looked through all our records, and there is no Jacob Levy among our members with a birth date matching the one you provided, she says. Oh, I say. My heart sinks. Another dead end. Thanks for looking, but you didn't have to call. I know I did not have to, she says, but I have someone here who would like to meet you, and in turn, we would like to help you. It is our obligation. Can you come to visit today? I understand that your grandmother is in ill health and time is of the essence. I realize the notice is short, but I see you are on the Cape, so the journey wouldn't be more than an hour or two. I live in Pembroke. Pembroke, I know, is just off the highway on the South Shore, on the way to Boston. It would take me just under an hour and a half to get there, but I don't understand why I need to go if they haven't found Jacob Levy in their records. I'm afraid today isn't going to work, I say. I run a bakery and we're open until four. So come after you close, the woman says right away. Come for dinner. I pause. I appreciate the invitation, but... She cuts me off. Please, my grandmother would like to meet you. She is in her nineties. She is a Muslim, and she too sheltered Jews during the war. My heartbeat picks up. She's from Paris, too? No, the woman says. We are from Albania. You know, the Albanian Muslims. They saved more than 2,000 of our Jewish brothers and sisters. When I told her the story of your Jacob Levy, she was astonished. She did not know that there were Muslims in Paris who had done the same. Please, she would like you to come tell her your story, and she would like to tell you her story in return. I glance at Annie, who is looking at me hopefully. May I bring my daughter? I ask. Of course, Alida says immediately. She is most welcome, as are you. 
And once we have shared stories, we will help you find this Jacob, okay? My grandmother says she knows how important it is to meet the past here in the present. Hold on, I say. I put my hand over the receiver and briefly explain Alita's request to Annie. We have to go, Mom, she says solemnly. That lady's grandma sounds just like Mamie, except from Albania instead of France, and Muslim instead of Jewish. We should go talk to her. I look at my daughter for a moment and realize she's right. My grandmother is lying in a coma, but Alita's grandmother is still able to talk. We may never get the full story of what happened to my grandmother, but perhaps hearing from another woman from the same time period who was involved in a situation similar to Mamie's will help us to understand. Okay, I tell Alita. We'll be there around six. What's your address? Annie invites Alan to come with us to Pembroke, but he says that he'll stay behind with Mamie instead. We swing by the hospital to sit with Mamie for a few minutes. Then Annie and I are set off again after promising to pick up Alan on our way home. He's managed to charm the night nurses at the hospital into looking the other way when it comes to their visitation policies. They all know his story and that he's been separated from his sister for nearly 70 years. It's a few minutes past six when we pull off the highway in Pembroke. We find Alita's house easily enough, thanks to the direction she gave us. It's a blue, white-shuttered two-story home in a small, well-kept neighborhood just behind a Catholic church. Annie and I exchange looks, get out of the car, and ring the doorbell. The woman who opens the door and introduces herself as Alita is older than I'd expected. She looks like she's in her mid-forties. Her skin is pale, and she has thick black hair that tumbles down her back nearly to her waist. I've never met anyone from Albania, but she looks like what I'd expect someone from Greece or Italy to look like. Welcome to our home, she says, shaking my hand first and then Annie's. Her eyes are deep and brown, and her smile is kind. It is just my grandmother and me here tonight. My husband, Will, is working. Please, come in. I hand her the box of miniature star pies I've brought for dessert, and after she thanks me, we follow her inside, down a hallway lined with black and white photographs of people I assume are her family members. She tells us that in Albania, the main meal of the day is lunch, but that tonight they've made a special dinner. I hope you like fish, she says, turning around slightly. I've prepared an old family recipe that my grandmother used to make in Albania. Sure, I say, and Annie nods. You didn't have to go to so much effort, though. It is our pleasure, she says. You are our guests. We turn the corner into a dimly lit dining room, where at the head of the table sits a woman who looks far older than Mamie. Her face is heavily lined, and her snow-white hair has fallen out in places, leaving her with a strangely patchy head of receding hair. She's wearing a black sweater and a long gray skirt, and she stares at us with bright eyes from behind enormous tortoiseshell glasses that look far too big for her face. She says something in a language I don't recognize. This is my grandmother, Nadir Viseli, Alida tells Annie and me. She speaks only Albanian. She says she is glad you have come and that you are very welcome in our home. Thank you, I reply. Annie and I sit beside each other to the right of the old woman, and Alida returns a moment later with four bowls on a tray. 
She sets one down in front of each of us and takes her own seat on her grandmother's left side. Potato and cabbage soup, Alita says, nodding at the bowls. She picks up her spoon and winks at Annie. Do not worry, it is more delicious than it sounds. I lived in Albania until I was twenty-five, and this was my favorite food when I was your age. Annie smiles and takes a sip of her soup, and I do the same. Alita's right, it's very good. I can't put a finger on the spices in it, but it tastes hearty and fresh. It's real good, Annie says. I love it, I agree. You'll have to give me the recipe. With pleasure, Alita says. Her grandmother says something softly in Albanian, and Alita nods. My grandmother would like to hear the story of how your grandmother was saved, please. Alita translates for us. Her grandmother nods and looks at me hopefully. She says something else to Alita, who again translates for us. My grandmother says she hopes she is not being rude in asking. Not at all, I murmur, although I'm still confused about what we're doing here. But for the next twenty minutes, Annie and I explain what we've learned recently about Mamie's past and how she escaped Paris. As Alida translates our words into Albanian, her grandmother listens, staring at us intently and nodding. Her eyes begin to fill with tears, and at one point she interrupts Alida loudly and says several sentences in Albanian. She says to tell you that your grandmother's story is like a gift to her, Alida says, and that she is happy you have come to our home. She says it is good that young people like you and your daughter are reminded of the concept of oneness. Oneness? Annie asks. Alida turns to my daughter and nods. We are Muslims, Annie. But we believe you are our sister, although you are Christian and come from a Jewish background. I married a Christian man from a Jewish background because I love him. Love can transcend religion. Do you know that? In the world today, there is too much division. But God made us all, did He not? Annie nods and looks at me. I know she's not sure how to respond. Yeah, I guess she finally says. It's why I took a job with the Abrahamic Association, Alida explains, so that I could work to foster understanding between religions. In the years since World War Two, it seems that much of the brotherhood we once shared has vanished. But what does that have to do with us? I ask softly. Alida's grandmother says something, and Alida nods, then turns back to me. Your call for help came to me, she says. In our culture, that means I now have the obligation to assist you. It is a code of honor called besa. Besa, I repeat. Alida nods. It is an Albanian concept that derives from the Quran. It means that if someone comes to you in need, you must not turn them away. It is because of Besa that my grandmother and I have asked you here tonight. It is because of Besa that my grandmother and her friends and neighbors saved many Jews at the risk of their own lives. And it is likely because of Besa that your grandmother was saved too, even if the Muslims in Paris did not call the concept by the same name we do in Albania. And now my grandmother would like to tell you her story. Alida's grandmother smiles at us in silence as Alida rises to clear our soup dishes. Annie offers to help, and a moment later, the two of them return with plates full of fish and vegetables. 
This is trout baked with olive oil and garlic, Alida explains as she and Annie sit down. It is a common dish in Albania. There are also baked leeks and Albanian potato salad. My grandmother and I wanted you to have a taste of our homeland. Thank you, Annie and I say in unison. You lutem, Olita's grandmother says. You are welcome, she adds in English. Olita smiles. She knows a few words of English. She pauses as her grandmother says something else. And now she would like to tell you about the Jews she sheltered in our hometown of Kruj. Alida's grandmother begins to tell us, with Alida translating, that she was a newlywed when the war began, and that her husband was a very well-known, well-liked man in their small town, where everyone knew everyone else. In 1939, the Italians occupied our country, and then in September 1943, the Germans came. Alida translates as her grandmother speaks. Right away, it became clear they were hunting the Jews who lived among Albanians, my grandmother says. Albania, you see, had become a refuge of sorts for Jews, fleeing from Macedonia and Kosovo, and from as far away as Germany and Poland. In 1943, several Jewish families came to our small town of Kruj, seeking refuge, Alida continues, as her grandmother tells her tale in her native language. My grandfather was one of the townspeople who offered to take in refugees. The family who came to stay with them, my grandmother says, were the Berensteins from Mati, Germany. She can still remember them. Alida pauses then, and her grandmother says in slow, careful English, Ezra Berenstein, the father, Braca Berenstein, the mother, two girls, Sandra Berenstein, Ayla Berenstein. Alida nods. Yes, the Berensteins. The girls were very young, just four and six. The family had fled at the start of the war and had been gradually making their way south in hiding. Alida's grandmother begins to speak again, and Alida resumes her translation. My grandmother says that she and her husband were poor, and provisions were very low because of the war, but they welcomed the Berensteins into their home. The whole town knew of it, but when the Germans came, no one betrayed them. Once the Germans came to the house, and Mr. and Mrs. Berenstein hid in the attic, while my grandmother and grandfather pretended Sandra and Ayala were their own children, Muslim children. After that, they dressed all the Berensteins in peasant clothing, and my grandfather went with them and helped them move into the mountains nearby, to a smaller village. After a time, my grandmother followed. They lived there with the Berensteins, helping to protect them, until 1944, when the Berensteins again began to move south, toward Greece. I realize there are tears in my eyes as I listen to the story. I glance at Annie and see that she looks equally moved. What happened to them? I ask. The Berensteins, did they make it out safely? For a very long time, my grandmother did not know, Alida says. She and my grandfather prayed for them every day. After the Germans were defeated in late 1944 in Albania, the country was taken over by communists, and Albanians were not allowed to communicate with the outside world. It was 1952 when my grandparents received a letter from the Berensteins. They were alive, 
all four and living in Israel. They thanked my grandparents for what they had done for extending Besa, and Ezra Berenstein wrote that he had sworn an oath to repay my grandmother and grandfather should they ever need help. My grandparents were not allowed to respond, and they feared the Berensteins would think they had died, or worse, that they would think they had not remembered them. Alita's grandmother says something else, and Alita smiles and replies to her in Albanian. She turns back to Annie and me. I told my grandmother I know the rest of the story, and so I can tell you. She says, I was 25 when communism fell in 1992, and our country was once again open to the world. But communism had destroyed us, you see. We were very poor. There was no future for us in Albania, but there was no money to leave. I lived with my grandmother and my parents. My grandfather had died years before. One day, there was a knock at our door. Was it Ezra Berenstein? Annie interrupts eagerly. No, but you are close, Alita replies with a smile. Mr. Berenstein had died some years before, as had his wife, but the daughters, Sandra and Ayla, had never forgotten their time in my grandparents' home. They were in their fifties by then, and they had been working to get my grandparents declared righteous among the nations, which is a title given to those people who helped save Jews at the peril of their own lives. They now were at our door, nearly fifty years after they came first to Albania for shelter, wishing to repay what my grandmother and grandfather had given to them. My grandmother explained to them that Besa isn't to be repaid, Alida continues, not on this earth anyhow. She told them that it was her duty to help them, her duty to God and to her fellow man, and that she was very glad they had lived and gone on to happy lives. Ayala lived in America by then, and she had married a very wealthy man, a doctor named William. She had converted to Christianity, and they'd had two sons, she told my grandmother. She said she owed my grandmother everything, because without their help, she and her family would never have survived. She told my grandmother that she wanted to help us get out of Albania and to bring us to America. And a year later, after securing visas for us, that is exactly what she did. My parents decided to remain in Albania, but my grandmother and I moved here, to Boston, to begin a new life. Do you still see Ayla and her family? Annie asks. Alita smiles. Every day. You see, I married Ayla's oldest son, Will. And now, our families are one forever. That's incredible, I breathe. I smile at Alita's grandmother, who blinks a few times and smiles back. I think about how many lives she changed when she and her husband made the decision to shelter a Jewish family, despite the fact that they could have lost their lives because of it. Thank you so much for telling us your story. Oh, but the story is not finished, Alita says. She smiles, reaches into her pocket, and withdraws a folded piece of paper, which she hands to me. What is this? I ask as I begin to unfold it. It is Besa, she says. You are looking for Jacob Levy, and your request came to me. My husband, Will, the son of Ayala, who my grandmother saved nearly seventy years ago, is a police officer. I asked him to do this favor, and he found your Jacob Levy, born in Paris, France, on Christmas Day, 
1924. She nods at the piece of paper in my hand. That is his address. As of a year ago, he was living in New York City. Wait, Annie interrupts. She grabs the piece of paper from me and stares at it. You found Jacob Levy? My grandmother's Jacob Levy? Alita smiles. I believe so. His information matches the details your mother provided. She turns to me. Now you must go find him. How can we ever thank you? I ask, my voice trembling. There is no need to, Alida says. Besa is our honor. Just promise us that you won't forget what you learned here today. Never, Annie says right away. She hands the piece of paper back to me, and her eyes are wide as saucers. Thank you, Mrs. White. We'll never, ever forget. I promise. Chapter 22 Cinnamon Almond Cookies Ingredients 2 sticks unsalted butter 1 and a half cups packed brown sugar 2 large eggs 1 teaspoon almond extract 2 and a half cups flour 1 teaspoon baking soda 1 teaspoon salt 1 cup cinnamon sugar 3 fourths cup granulated sugar mixed with a quarter cup cinnamon Directions 1. In a large bowl, beat the butter and brown sugar until smooth. Add the eggs and almond extract and beat until well combined. 2. Sift together the flour, baking soda, and salt and add to the butter mixture, approximately a half cup at a time, beating after each addition until well combined. 3. Divide the dough into five parts and roll into logs. Wrap each in plastic wrap and freeze until firm. 4. Preheat oven to 350 degrees. 5. Spread cinnamon sugar in a shallow dish. Unwrap logs and roll them in the sugar until liberally coated. 6. Slice the logs a quarter inch thick and place slices on greased baking sheets. Bake for 18 to 20 minutes. 7. Cool for 5 minutes on baking sheet, then transfer to racks to cool. Rose Once, very long ago, when Rose was 4 years old, her parents had taken her along with her sister Aline, to Aubergenville, not far from Paris, for a week in the countryside. Her mother was very pregnant that summer of 1929. Claude would be born just six weeks later. But for those glimmering summer moments in the sun, it was just Rose and Aline, four and five years old, the objects of their parents' attention and affection. Aline had been charged with watching her younger sister while her parents sipped white wine on the back deck of the small home they were renting from friends for a week. They were not watching when Aline took Rose around the corner of the house to the little creek that babbled by. Let us go in the water, Aline said, taking her sister by the hand. Rose hesitated. Mama and Papa would be angry, she thought, but Aline insisted, reminding Rose of the stories their mother read them at bedtime about the family of ducks who lived along the banks of the Seine. The ducks go swimming all the time, and it is fine, Aline told her. Do not be such a baby, Rose. And so Rose followed her sister into the water. But the calm surface was deceptive. There was a current running underneath, and as soon as Rose stepped in, she felt it sucking at her toes, pulling her under, taking her away. 
She did not know how to swim. She was suddenly underwater, thrust into another world, where there was no air, almost no sound. She tried to scream, but the water only filled her lungs. It was dark beneath the surface, dark and unfamiliar. She could see light far away, far above her, but she couldn't seem to get to it. Her limbs were heavy and wouldn't move, and in these strange, watery depths, she felt that time was suspended. Until the moment her father pulled her to the surface, called there by her screaming sister just in time, she had been sure she would disappear into the murky, muted world forever. That was how Rose felt now, under the surface of the coma she'd been in for two weeks. She was aware that there was a surface, voices and sounds, distant and muffled, light and motion very far away. Her limbs felt heavy, like they did that day in the creek in Auburgen V, and she knew that her father was long gone. He would not pull her out of this frightening underworld. She was on her own, and she still didn't know how to swim. On that day in Auburgen V, she had wanted to be saved. She had wanted to find the surface, to return to life. But now she wasn't sure whether she wanted that at all. Maybe it was time to let go. Maybe it was time to drift away. Maybe the murky deep held more for her than the bright surface that she could just barely see. Hope was up there, she knew, and Annie. But they would be well. Hope was strong, stronger than she gave herself credit for, and Annie was growing into a fine young woman. Rose could not stay with them forever, protect them forever. Maybe it was finally her time. Maybe he was here, somewhere beneath the depths, somewhere in this hazy world that seemed to exist between life and death. She missed seeing the stars, her stars, and without the sky to shelter her each night, to remind her of the people she'd loved so much, she felt cold and alone. Rose was sure she was dying now, too. She was beginning to hear the ghosts of her past. And that is how she knew her life was nearly over, for she recognized the voice of her brother, Alan, grown up and deep now. It was how she had always imagined he'd sound if he had survived during the war and had the chance to grow into manhood. It is you who saved me, Rose. The distant voice kept repeating over and over in their native tongue, C'est tu qui m'a sauvé, Rose. The voice in Rose's mind screamed, I did not save you. I let you die. I am a coward. But the words would not come to her lips, and even if they had, she knew they would be lost in the depths of this shrouded world. And so she listened as the voice of her dead brother went on. You taught me to believe, he whispered again and again. You have to stop blaming yourself. It was you who saved me, Rose. She wondered whether this was the absolution she had spent her life searching for, although she was sure she did not deserve it. Or was it simply one more result of the dementia that she knew nibbled at her mind? She didn't trust her own eyes, her own ears anymore, for they often didn't match reality or recollection. And when he began to whisper to her, You have to wake up, Rose. Hope and Annie may have found Jacob Levy. She knew that her mind was entirely gone, because that was impossible. Jacob was gone, long gone. Hope would never know him. Rose would never see him again. Were it possible to shed tears in the deep, murky sea, 
Rose would have cried. Chapter 23 On the way home from Alita's house, I can see Annie's eyes shining in the darkness, glinting with reflected light. You have to go to New York tomorrow, Mom, she says. You have to go find him. I nod. The bakery is closed on Mondays anyhow, and even if it weren't, I know I can't wait another moment. We'll leave in the morning, I tell Annie. First thing. Annie turns to look at me. I can't go with you, she says miserably, shaking her head. I have my big social studies test tomorrow. I clear my throat. That's responsible of you. I pause. Have you studied for it? Mom, Annie says. Of course. Duh. Good, I say. Okay, we'll head down to New York on Tuesday then. Can you miss school on Tuesday? Annie shakes her head. No, you gotta go tomorrow, Mom. I glance at her, then refocus on the road. Honey, I don't mind waiting for you. No, she says instantly. You have to find him as soon as possible. What if we're running out of time and we don't even know it? Mamie's stable now, I tell Annie. She'll hang in there. Come on, Mom, Annie says softly after a pause. You don't believe that. You know she could die any time. That's why you've got to find Jacob Levy as soon as you can if he's out there. But Annie, I begin. No, Mom, she says firmly, as if she's the parent and I'm the child. Go to New York tomorrow. Bring Jacob Levy back. Don't let Mamie down. After swinging by the hospital on the way home, staying with Mamie for a bit, and getting Annie into bed, I sit in the kitchen with Alan, sipping decaf coffee and explaining what we learned from Alida and her grandmother. Besa, he says softly, what a beautiful concept, the obligation to help our fellow man. He stirs his coffee slowly and takes a sip. So you will go tomorrow to New York, alone? I nod. Then, feeling foolish, I add quickly, I was thinking about seeing if Gavin would want to come with me, just since he helped us out a lot at the beginning of this search, you know. Alan smiles. It is a wise idea. He pauses, then adds, you know, there is nothing wrong with falling in love with Gavin, Hope. I'm so startled by his bluntness that I choke on the sip of coffee I've just taken. I'm not in love with Gavin, I protest through coughs. Of course you are, Alan says, and he is in love with you. I laugh at that, but my cheeks are hot and my palms suddenly sweaty. That's crazy. Why is it so crazy? Alan asks. I shake my head. Well, for one thing, we have nothing in common. Alan laughs. You have many things in common. I see the way the two of you talk with each other, the way he makes you laugh, the way you can talk about anything. That's just because he's a nice guy, I mumble. Alan folds his hands over mine. He cares about what happens to you, and whether you admit it or not, you care about what happens to him, too. Those still aren't things we have in common, I reply stubbornly. He cares about Annie, Alan adds softly. You cannot tell me you do not have that in common. I pause before nodding. Yeah, I admit. He does care about Annie. That is not something that comes along every day, Alan says. Think about how he helped her when you were in Paris and Rose was brought to the hospital. He was there for her, 
and he was there for you. I nod again. I know. He's a good guy. He is more than that, Alan says. Tell me, why do you not believe in this? I shrug and look down. He's seven years younger than I am, for one thing, I mumble. Alan laughs. Your grandmother married a Christian man, although she is a Jew, and you just came from the home of a woman who is happily married to a Christian Jew, although she is a Muslim. If something as important as religious differences can be surmounted, do you really think seven years makes a difference? I shrug again. Fine, but I also have a child. Alan just looks at me. Of course, but I do not understand why this is an excuse for you. Well, for one thing, he's only twenty-nine. I can't ask him to take on the responsibility of a teenage kid. It seems to me that you have not asked him, Alan says, and yet he is already here, taking on the responsibility. Is that not his decision to make? I hang my head. But my mother always put men first, you know? I always felt like I didn't matter to her as much as they did. Her life revolved around whomever she was dating at the time. I promised myself I would never, ever make my child feel that way. You are not your mother, Alan says after a moment. But what if I turn into her? I ask in a small voice. What if now that I'm divorced, that's exactly what I do? I can't let myself go down that road. Annie has to come first, no matter what. Letting someone else in does not mean leaving Annie out, Alan says carefully. I can feel tears rolling down my cheeks, and am surprised to realize I've started crying. But what if he hurts me? I blurt out. What if I let him into my life and he breaks my heart? What if he hurts Annie? She's been through so much with her dad. I don't think I could bear it if I hurt her, too. Alan pats my hand. It is true. That is a risk you take, he says. But life is about taking risks. How can you leave otherwise? But I'm happy enough now, I tell him. Maybe that's enough. How do you know Gavin won't change all that? I don't, Alan says, but there is only one way to find out. Alan stands and grabs my cell phone from the counter, where it's charging. Call him. Ask him to go with you tomorrow. You don't need to make any decisions right away, but open the door, Hope. Open the door to let him in. I take the phone from him and draw a deep breath. Okay. Annie wakes up with me at three in the morning, and as I sip coffee at the kitchen table and read yesterday's newspaper, she eats Rice Krispies and drinks a glass of orange juice while staring at me. So, Mr. Keyes said yes? She asks. He's going to go with you? Yes. I say. I clear my throat. He'll be here at four. Good, she says. Mr. Keys is really nice, don't you think? I nod and look down at my coffee. Yes, he is, I say carefully. He's good at fixing things. I give her a funny look. Well, obviously, he's a handyman. She laughs. No, I mean, like, he fixes people and stuff. Like, he likes to help people. I smile. Yeah, I guess he does. Annie doesn't say anything for a second. So, like, you know he likes you, right? You can see it, the way he looks at you. I can feel a flush creeping up my neck. I'm not ready to discuss this with Annie. 
Like your dad looks at sunshine? I make a lame attempt at a joke. Annie makes a face. No, not like that. I laugh. I'm about to say something else in protest, but Annie beats me to it. Dad looks at sunshine like he's scared, I think, she says. Scared? She thinks for a minute. Scared of being alone, she says. But Gavin looks at you different. What do you mean? I ask softly. I realize I really want to hear her answer. She shrugs and looks back down at her cereal. I don't know. Like he just wants to be around you. Like he thinks you're great. Like he wants to do stuff to make your life good. I'm silent for a minute. I don't know what to say. Does that bother you? Is what I finally settle on. Annie looks surprised. No, why would it? I shrug. I don't know. It's been hard for you watching your dad move on so quickly. I guess I just want you to know that I'm not going anywhere. You're my number one priority now and always. I look closely at her as I say this. I want her to know I really mean it. She looks embarrassed. I know, she says, but that doesn't mean you can't like go on a date with Mr. Keys. I laugh. Honey, he hasn't asked me on a date. Yet, she says. She pauses. For real, he probably hasn't because you act like you don't like him. But you can't like be alone forever. My thoughts from last night come flooding back in. I'm not alone, I say softly. I have you and Mamie and now Alan. Mom, I'm not going to be here forever, she says solemnly. I'm going to go off to college and stuff in like a few years. Alan's probably going to go back to Paris, right? And Mamie's going to die someday. I draw in a sharp breath. I hadn't known how to broach the subject with Annie. Yes, she will, but I'm hoping we'll get a little more time with her first. I pause. Are you okay with that? With the idea that we'll probably lose her soon? She shrugs. I'll just miss her a lot, you know. Me too. We're silent for a long time. My heart aches for my daughter, who has already had to experience too much loss. I don't want you to be alone, Mom. Annie says after a while. No one should be alone. I nod, blinking back tears that I didn't expect. Just find Jacob, okay? She says softly. You have to find him. I know. I want to find him too. I promise. I'll do my very best. Annie nods solemnly and stands up to pour her milk out in the sink and to put her bowl and juice glass in the dishwasher. I'm gonna go back to bed. I just wanted to get up and say good luck, she says. She walks toward the door of the kitchen and pauses. Mom, she says. Yes, honey. The way Mister Keys looks at you. She trails off and looks down. I think maybe it's kind of how Jacob Levy used to look at Mamie. When Gavin picks me up at four in his Jeep Wrangler, he has a cup of gas station coffee waiting for me. I know you're used to getting up before dawn, he says as he waits for me to buckle my seatbelt. He hands me the coffee cup and says. But I had to stop for coffee because, in my world, I'd still be sleeping right now. Sorry, I mumble. He laughs. Don't be silly. I'm happy to be here, but the caffeine's helping. You don't have to drive, you know. I say we could take my car. Nah, he says. This baby's already gassed up and ready to go. I'll drive. He pauses and adds. Unless you really want to, I just figure it's easier this way. You can navigate. If you're sure you don't mind, I say. 
We're quiet for the next thirty minutes, except to make small talk about the route we'll take down to New York, and the possibility we'll hit traffic just outside Manhattan. Gavin yawns and turns up the radio when Bon Jovi's "Living on a Prayer" comes on. I love the song, he says. He sings along with the chorus so enthusiastically that it makes me giggle. I didn't even know you knew this song. I say when it ends. He shoots me a glance. Who doesn't know "Living on a Prayer"? I feel myself turning red. I just meant you seem too young to know it. I'm twenty-nine, Gavin says, which means I was just as alive as you were when the song came out. You were what three? I ask. I was almost eleven in nineteen eighty-six. Worlds away. I was four. Gavin says. He shoots me a glance. Why are you being weird? I look at my lap. It's just that you're so young, a lot younger than thirty-six. He shrugs. So, so don't you think I'm kind of old? I ask. I resist the urge to add for you. Yeah, you should be getting your AARP membership card in the mail any day now. Gavin says. He seems to realize I'm not laughing. Look, hope. I know how old you are. What does it matter? You don't feel like we're from two different worlds or something. He hesitates. Hope you can't go through life living by all the rules and doing what people expect of you, without thinking for yourself. You know, that's how you wake up at the age of eighty or whatever and realize life has passed you by. I wonder whether this is how Mamie feels. Did she do the thing she was expected to? Did she marry and become a mother only because that was the prescribed plan for women in those days? Had she regretted it? But how do you know? I ask, trying to slow my racing heart. I mean, how do you know which rules you're supposed to live by and which you're not? Gavin glances over at me. I don't think there are really supposed to be rules. I think you're supposed to figure it out as you go, learn from experience, and try to correct your mistakes moving forward. Don't you think? I don't know. I say softly. Maybe he's right, but if he is, that means I've been living my life incorrectly all these years. I've tried to do things by the book at every turn. I married Rob because I was pregnant with his baby. I moved home to the Cape because my mother needed me. I took over the bakery because it was our family business, and I couldn't let it die. I abandoned my own dreams of becoming an attorney because it no longer fit under the heading of what I was supposed to do. Now I'm realizing that by always choosing the safe road. The one that was expected of me, I might have given up more than I ever understood. Had I left behind the person I was supposed to be too? Had I lost my real self somewhere along that road of doing everything right? I wonder whether there's still time to figure things out and start playing by my own rules. Can I salvage the life I meant to have? Maybe it's not too late," I murmur aloud. Gavin glances at me. "It's never too late," he says simply. We're silent as we drive across the arching Sagamore Bridge, which spans the Cape Cod Canal. Dawn is still a couple of hours away, and I feel like we're all alone in the world as we cross to the mainland in the darkness. There's not another car on the road. On the inky surface of the water beneath us, lights from the bridge and from the homes on either shore reflect back up toward the sky, pointing toward the stars, Mamie's stars. I don't know that I'll ever be able to look at the night sky without thinking of my grandmother and all the evenings she has spent waiting for the stars to come out. 
It's not until we're on I-195, heading toward Providence, that Gavin speaks again. What's happening with the bakery? he asks. I look at him sharply. What do you mean? He glances at me and then turns his attention back to the road. Annie told me that she thinks something's going on. She heard you and Matt Hines talking. My heart sinks. I hadn't realized Annie knew anything was amiss. I didn't want her to know. It's nothing, I say, avoiding the subject. Gavin nods and stares straight ahead. I don't want to pry, he says. I know you like to keep stuff to yourself, but I'm just saying I'm here if you want to talk about anything. I know how much the bakery means to you. I gaze out the window as we begin to pass through Fall River, which looks like an industrial ghost town in the morning mist. I'm about to lose it, I say to Gavin after a while. The bakery. That's why Matt keeps coming by. There was a chance that some investors were going to save the place, but I guess I screwed it up by going to Paris. Was that what Matt said? I nod and look out the window again. That's ridiculous, Gavin says. No legitimate investor would give up a promising business opportunity because someone has to leave for a few days due to a family emergency. If Matt told you that, he's an idiot. Or he's trying to guilt trip you. Why would he do that? Gavin shrugs. Maybe he's not such a great guy. Maybe not, I murmur. It seems that the men I've chosen to let into my life over the years all fall into that category. How do you feel about the possibility of losing the bakery? Gavin asks after a while. I think about this. Like I'm a failure, I reply. Hope, if you lose the bakery, it's not because you failed. Gavin says, you work harder than anyone I know. This isn't a failure. It's just the economy. That's beyond your control. I shake my head. The bakery's been in my family for 60 years. My mother and my grandmother kept it afloat through lots of ups and downs. Then it gets passed on to me and I destroy it. You haven't destroyed anything. Gavin says. I shake my head and look down at my lap. I destroy everything. That's crazy and you know it. Gavin clears his throat. So, is this what you've always wanted to do? Run your family bakery? I laugh. No, not at all. I was planning to be an attorney. I was halfway through law school in Boston when I found out I was pregnant with Annie, so I left school, married Rob, and eventually moved back to the Cape. Why'd you drop out of law school? I shrug. It felt like the right thing to do. Gavin nods and seems to consider this for a minute. Would you go back? He asks. Do you still want to be a lawyer? I consider this. I feel like a huge failure for dropping out, I say. But at the same time, I have this weird feeling that maybe I wasn't really supposed to be a lawyer at all. Maybe I was supposed to run the bakery. I can't imagine my life without it now, you know? Especially now that I know what it means to my family. Now that I know it's basically all my grandmother brought with her from her past. You know, I don't think you're going to lose the bakery, Gavin says after a minute. Why do you say that? I ask. Because I think that in life, things tend to come through when you most need them to. I look at him. That's it? Life works out the way it's supposed to? Gavin laughs. Okay, yeah, I sound like a Hallmark card. I'm silent for a moment. Annie thinks you're some kind of Mr. Fix-It of people, I say in a small voice. He laughs again, 
Oh, does she? I glance sideways at him. You know, you don't have to fix me or save me or whatever. He looks at me and shakes his head. I don't think you need me to, Hope, he says. I think you're underestimating your ability to save yourself. His words wash over me, and I stare out the window so that he can't see my sudden, unexpected tears. Maybe this is what I needed all along. Not Matt's money or his investors. Not someone to rescue me. Just someone who believes that I can do it on my own. Thanks, I whisper, so softly that I'm not sure Gavin will hear me. But he does. I feel his hand on my shoulder, and as I turn to face him, he squeezes once, gently, and then puts his hand back on the wheel. My skin tingles where he touched it. That's going to be okay, you know, he says. I know, I say. And for the first time, I really mean it. Chapter 24 We stop at an exit off I-95 in Connecticut so that we can fill up the gas tank, grab some breakfast, and use the bathroom. As I come out of McDonald's, juggling two coffees and two orange juices on a tray, as well as a bag full of various McMuffins, I glance across the street and notice a big printed sign in the dim morning light advertising a Bible study class called Tracing the Old Testament Family Tree. I'm about to look away, but then a familiar name catches my eye, and something suddenly slips into place in my mind. My jaw drops. What are you looking at? Gavin asks. He screws the gas cap back on and joins me beside the car. He takes the McDonald's drinks and bag from me and sets them on top of the car. You look like you've seen a ghost. Look at that sign, I say. Tracing the Old Testament family tree, he reads aloud, from Abraham to Jacob to Joseph and beyond. He pauses. Okay. So? Joseph was the son of Jacob in the Bible, right? I ask. Gavin nods. Yeah, actually in the Torah, too. And in the Quran, I think. I think all that stuff tracing back to Abraham in the Old Testament is the same in all three religions. The three Abrahamic religions, I murmur, thinking of Alida's words. Islam... Judaism, and Christianity. Right, Gavin says. He glances at the sign again, then down at me. So what's up, Hope? How come you look so spooked? My mom's name was Josephine, I say softly. Can that be just a coincidence, that she was named after the son of Jacob? Realization dawns on Gavin's face. In the stories, Joseph became the one to carry on his parents' legacy. He had to be protected for that reason. He pauses. You're saying you think your mom might have been Jacob's daughter after all? I swallow hard and stare at the sign. Then I shake my head. You know what? No, that's crazy. It's just a name. Besides, the years don't add up. My mom was born in 44, long after my grandmother last saw Jacob Levy. There's no way. I glance up at Gavin, feeling silly, and I'm surprised to realize his face looks completely serious. But what if you're right? He asks. What if your mother was actually born a year earlier? What if your grandmother and grandfather bribed someone to falsify her birth certificate? That couldn't have been uncommon in those days. It was during the war. Some low-level clerk could have easily changed the paperwork, destroyed the originals. Easy to do before things were computerized. But 
Why would my grandparents do that? So that it looked like your grandfather was the father, Gavin says. He's speaking quickly now, his eyes shining. So that your mom would never think to doubt it. So that your grandmother would never have to explain Jacob to anyone. You say they didn't move to the Cape until your mother was five, but at that age, it would have been nearly impossible to tell if they cheated by a year. Especially if they said she was just tall for her age. What if she was really six? I feel suddenly short of breath. This can't be possible. I whisper. My mom even looked like my grandpa. Straight brown hair, brown eyes, same kinds of expressions. Brown hair and brown eyes are pretty common features. Gavin points out. And we don't know what Jacob looked like, anyhow, right? I guess I murmur. You have to admit, your mom being Jacob's daughter would explain a lot, like what happened to the baby, and why your grandmother moved on so quickly after losing Jacob. But why would she move on so quickly? I ask. I don't understand that part. She must have believed that Jacob was dead already. Maybe your grandfather was a kind man offering her a chance to survive, and a chance to give her daughter a real life. And maybe she took that chance because she believed it was the right thing to do. Do you mean that she never really loved my grandfather? I ask. It hurts my heart to think that—that that he was just the means to an end. No, I bet she loved him," Gavin says. Maybe differently than Jacob, but he gave her and your mom a good life—the kind of life Jacob would have wanted for them. I say. Gavin nods. Yeah. But if that's true, what did my grandpa get? I ask, suddenly overwhelmed with sadness. A wife who never really loved him the way he deserved to be beloved. Maybe he knew all along that's what it would be, Gavin says, and he loved her enough that it didn't matter. Maybe he hoped she'd come around. Maybe it was enough to have her there, to know he was protecting her, to be a father to her child. I look away. I wish I could ask my grandfather what he'd felt. How he'd rationalized it all, if Gavin was right, but he's long gone. I wonder whether the answers and the secrets they kept would forever remain buried. I know they will if Mamie never wakes up. In fact, even if she does awaken, there's no guarantee she'll remember anything. Do you think my mom ever knew? I ask. If this is true. I'm quick to add. I would be willing to bet she didn't. Gavin says softly. It sounds like maybe your grandmother just wanted to leave everything behind forever. As we get back into the car, I realize I'm crying. I'm not sure when I began, but the hole in my heart seems to keep growing bigger and bigger. Until recently, my grandmother had been merely a slightly sad woman who happened to hail from France and run a bakery. Now, as I peel back layer after layer of who she really was, I am realizing that her sorrow must have gone far deeper than I'd ever comprehended, and she had spent her life pretending, wrapped up in secrets and lies. I want now more than ever for her to wake up, so that I can tell her she's not alone and that I understand. I want to hear the story from her own lips, because at this point, so much of it is conjecture. I realize I no longer know where I came from, at all. I've never known my father's side of the family. I don't even know who my father is. And it's turning out that everything I knew of my mother's side was a lie. Are you okay? Gavin asks softly. He hasn't started the car yet, 
He's just sitting there beside me, watching me cry. I don't know who I am anymore, I say after a pause. He nods, seeming to understand this. I do, he says simply. Your hope, that's all that really matters. And despite the awkwardness of the center console between us in the car, when he pulls me into his arms and holds me tight, it's the most natural and comfortable thing in the world. When he finally lets go, mumbling, we should get on the road before it gets too much later, it feels like only a few seconds have passed, although the clock tells me he's been holding me for several minutes. It didn't feel like enough. It's not until we're on the highway and I see a tray of cups fly by the window that I realize we left the food from McDonald's on the roof. The laughter between us breaks the sad tension. Uh, I wasn't hungry anyway, Gavin says, glancing in the rearview mirror, where I imagine the remainder of our uneaten breakfast has distributed itself on the road. Me neither, I agree. He smiles at me. On to New York? On to New York. It's just past ten by the time we finish fighting traffic and pull off FDR Drive onto Houston Street in Manhattan. Gavin's following his GPS now, and I look around as he weaves in and out of streets, narrowly avoiding pedestrians and stopped taxis. I hate driving in New York, he says, but he's smiling. You're really good at it, I say. I did a summer internship here in college and returned a few times since then, but it's been more than a decade since I visited, and everything feels different now. The city looks cleaner than I remember it. According to the GPS, we're almost there, Gavin announces after a few more minutes. Let's just find a place to park. We find a garage and walk to the exit. As Gavin gets the ticket from the attendant, I nervously shift from one foot to the other. We're just a few blocks away from the last known address of Jacob Levy. We could be face to face with him in ten minutes. Gavin hands me a map he's printed out from the internet. It has a star marked toward the south end of Battery Place, and I realize with a start how close Jacob lives to Ground Zero. I wonder whether he'd been here to witness the tragedy of September 11th. I blink a few times and steady myself. I look north toward the hole in the skyline where the World Trade Center used to be, and I feel a pang of sadness. This used to be my favorite area of the city, I tell Gavin as we begin to walk. I worked here for a summer when I was in college for a law firm in Midtown. On the weekends, I used to take the N or the R train down to the World Trade Center, get a Coke in the food court there, and then walk down Broadway to Battery Park. Can you reach me, reach me, reach me, reach me, reach me until your heart's set free? Longing for your voice every night, wishing to be close, just hold me tight. This weekend, let's go out, don't forget. In this tropical paradise we met. Tell me what am I to you, my dear? Don't play with my heart, let's make it clear. Cause I love the feel of your soft lips calling every night. No cancellation steps to pick you up by the lakeside, we'll stroll. Share stories only I should know the moments when I take you home Forget the promises, let's let them roll Time keeps passing, why haven't I returned? Just wanna hear your voice, my love on earth Can you reach me, reach me, oh reach me Reach me, reach me